The Life of Napoleon Bonaparte by William Milligan Sloan Volume I New York The Century CO 1916 Preface to the Library Edish This Life of Napoleon was first published in 1896 as a book, for thighs 1895-96 it ran as a serial in the pages of the Century magazine. Judging from the sales, it has been read by many tens if not hundreds of thousands of readers, and it has been extensively noticed in the critical journals of both worlds. Throughout these 14 years the demand has been very large and steady, considering the size and cost of the volumes. Both publishers and author have determined therefore that a library edition was desired by the public, and in that confidence the book has been partly rewritten and entirely remade. In the main it is the same book as that which has passed through so many editions. But in some respects it has been amplified. The portion relating to the period of youth has been somewhat expanded, the personalities of those nearest to Napoleon have been in some case more broadly sketched, new chapters have been added to the treatment of the Continental System, the Louisiana Purchase, and the St. Helena book. In all the text has been lengthened about one tenth. Under the compulsion of physical dimensions, the author has minimized the number of authorities and footnotes. There is really very little controversial matter regarding Napoleon, which is not a matter of opinion. The evidence has been so carefully sifted that substantial agreement as to fact has been reached. Accordingly, there have been introduced at the opening of chapters or divisions short lists of good references for those who desire to extend their reading, experts know their own way. It is an interesting fact which throws great light on the slight value of footnotes that while I have had extensive correspondence with my fellow workers, there has come to me in all these years but a single request for the source of two statements and undemand for the evidence upon which certain opinions were based. The former editions were duplicate books, a text by me and a commentary of exquisite illustrations by other hands. The divergence was very confusing to serious minds, in this edition there can be no similar perplexity since the illustrations have been confined to portraits. In putting these volumes through the press, in the preparation of the reference lists for volumes 3 and 4, and in the rearrangement of the bibliography I have had the assistance of Dr. G. A. Hub and my obligation is hereby acknowledged. William M. Sloan. New York, underscore September 1, 1910 underscore. Dot preface In the closing years of the 18th century European society began its effort to get rid of benevolent despotism, so called, and to secure its liberties under forms of constitutional government. The struggle began in France and spread over the more important lands of continental Europe, its influence was strongly felt in England, and even in the United States. Passing through the phases of constitutional reform, of anarchy, and of military despotism, the movement seemed for a time to have failed, and to outward appearance subsilitism was stronger after Waterloo than it had been half a century earlier. But the force of the revolution was only checked, not spent and to the awakening of general intelligence, the strengthening of national feeling, and the upbuilding of a sense of common brotherhood among men, produced by the revolutionary struggles of this epoch, Europe has whatever liberty and free government its peoples now enjoy. At the close of this period national power was no longer in the hands of the aristocracy, nor in those of kings, it had passed into the third social stratum, variously designated as the middle class the burgesse bourgeoisie, and the third estate, a body of men as little willing to share it with the masses as the kings had been. Nevertheless, that transition once begun could not be stopped, and the advance of manhood suffrage has ever since been proportionate to the capacity of the laboring classes to receive and use it, until now, at last, weight may be the nominal form of government in any civilized land. Its stability depends entirely upon the support of the people as a whole. That which is the basis of all government, the power of the purse has passed into their hands. This momentous change was, of course, a turbulent one, the most turbulent in the history of civilization, as it has proved to be the most comprehensive. Consequently, its epoch is most interesting, being dramatic in the highest degree, having brought into prominence men and characters who rank among the great of all time.
and having exhibited to succeeding generations the most important lessons in the most vivid light. By common consent the eminent man of the time was Napoleon Bonaparte, the revolution queller, the burgher sovereign, the imperial democrat, the supreme captain, the civil reformer, the victim of circumstances which his soaring ambition used but which his unrivaled prowess could not control. Gigantic in his proportions, and satanic in his fate, his was the most tragic figure on the stage of modern history. While the men of his own and the following generation were still alive, it was almost impossible that the truth should be known concerning his actions or his motives, and to fix his place in general history was even less feasible. What he wrote and said about himself was of course animated by a determination to appear in the best light semicolon what others wrote and said has been biased by either devotion or hatred. Until within a very recent period it seemed that no man could discuss him or his time without manifesting such strong personal feeling as to vitiate his judgment and conclusions. This was partly due to the lack of perspective but in the main to ignorance of the facts essential to sober treatment of the theme. In this respect the last quarter of a century has seen a gradual but radical change, for a band of dispassionate scientific scholars have during that time been occupied in the preparation of material for his life without reference to the advocacy of one theory or another concerning his character. European archives, long carefully guarded, have been thrown open. Their diplomatic correspondence of the most important periods has been published, family papers have been examined, and numbers of valuable memoirs have been printed. It has therefore been possible to check an account by another, to cancel misrepresentations, to eliminate passion in short, to establish something like correct outline and accurate detail, at least in regard to what the man actually did. Dot those hidden secrets of any human mind which we call motives must have remained to other minds largely a matter of opinion, but a very fair indication of them can be found when once the actual conduct of Thekta has been determined. Dot this investigation has mainly been the work of specialists, and its results have been published in monographs and technical journals, most of these workers, moreover were continental scholars writing each in his own language. Its results, as a whole, have therefore not been accessible to the general reader in either America or England. It seems highly desirable that they should be made so, and this has been the effort of the writer. At the same time he claims to be an independent investigator in some of the most important portions of the field he covers. His researches have extended over many years and it has been his privilege to use original materials which, as far as heck knows, have not been used by others. At the close of the book will be found a short account of the papers of Bonaparte's boyhood and youth which the author has read, and of the portions of the French and English archives which were generously put at his disposal, together with a short though reasonably complete bibliography of the published books and papers which really have scientific value. The number of volumes concerned with Napoleon and his epoch is enormous, outside of those mentioned very few have any value except as curiosities of literature. Contents chapter page I introduction. 1 2. The Bonapartes in Corsica. 23. Napoleon's birth and childhood. 35 4. Napoleon's school days. 48 v. In Paris and Valence. 60 v. Private study and garrison life. 73 7. Further attempts at authorship. 83 8. The Revolution in France. 109. Bonaparte and Revolution in Corsica. 111 x. First lessons in revolution. 123 11. Traits of character. 135 12. The Revolution in the Rhone Valley. 148 13. Bonaparte the Corsican Jacobin. 160 14. Bonaparte the French Jacobin. 180 15. A Jacobin Higuera. 199 16. The Supper of Care. 212 17. Toulon. 222 18. A Jacobin General. 236 19. Vicissitudes in war and diplomacy. 
24720 The end of apprenticeship 26021 The antechamber to success 27222 Bonaparte the general of the convention 28723 The day of the Paris sections 30224 A marriage of inclination and interest 31325. Europe and the Directory. 32426. Bonaparte on the Great Stage. 33927. The Conquest of Piedmont and the Milanese. 35228. An insubordinate conqueror and diplomatist. 36329. Basno and Darkola. 37830. Bonaparte's Imperious Spirit. 39331. Rivoli and the Capitulation of Mantua. 40632. Humiliation of the Papacy and of Venice. 41933. The Preliminaries of Peace Leoban. 43034. The Fall of Venice. 444 List of Illustrations Napoleon Bonaparte in 1785, aged 16. Underscore frontispiece underscore Marie Letitia Ramolino Bonaparte Madame Mia Mother of Napoleon I. 50 Charles Bonaparte, Father of the Emperor Napoleon, 1785. 96 Bonaparte, General in Chief of the Army of Italy. 176 Josephine. 226 Marie Josephine Rose Tashka de la Pagerie, called Josephine, Empress of the French. 276 Bonaparte. 326 Map of Northern Italy, illustrating the campaigns of 1796 and 1797. 354 Josephine, Empress of the French. 374 map illustrating the campaign preceding the Treaty of Campo Formio, 1797. 414 sequid novisti rectius istis, candidus imperti, seen on. His utere mechum underscore Horace underscore life of Napoleon Bonaparte chapter I. Introduction. The revolutionary epoch in Europe, its dominant personage, the state system of Europe, the power of Great Britain feebleness of democracy, the expectant attitude of the continent, survival of antiquated institutions, the American Revolution, philosophical sophistries, Rousseau, his fallacies, Corsica as a center of interest, its geography, its rulers, the people, Sampiero, revolutions, Spanish alliance, King Theodore, French intervention, supremacy of Genoa, Paoli, his success as a liberator, his plan for alliance with France, the policy of Choi Isul, Paoli's reputation, Napoleon's account of Corsica and of Paoli, Rousseau and Corsica. Napoleon Bonaparte was the representative man of the epoch which pushed in the 19th century. Though an aristocrat by descent, he was in life, in training, and in quality neither that nor a plebeian semicolon he was the typical plain man of his time, exhibiting the common sense alpha generation which thought in terms made current by the philosopher of the 18th century. His period was the most tumultuous and yet most fruitful in the world's history. But the progress made in it was not altogether direct, rather was it like the advance of a traveller world through the spiral tunnels of the street Gothard. Flying from the inclemency of the north, he is carried by Thep under a strain due southward into the opening. After a time of darkness he emerges into the open air. But at first sight the goal is no nearer, the direction is perhaps reversed, the skies are more forbidding, the chill is more intense. Only after successive ventures of the same kind is the climax reached, the summit passed, and the vision of sunny plains open to view. Such experiences are more common to the race than to the individual, the muse of history must note and record them with equanimity, with a buoyancy and hopefulness born of larger knowledge. The movement of civilization in Europe during the latter portion of the 18th century was onward and upward but it was at times not only devious, slow and laborious, 
but fruitless in immediate results. We must study the age and the people of any great man if we sincerely desire the truth regarding his strength and weakness, his inborn tendencies and purposes, his failures and successes, the temporary incidents and the lasting, constructive, meritorious achievements of his career. This is certainly far more true of Napoleon than of any other heroic personage, an affectionate tour has sometimes lifted him to heaven, a spiteful hate has often hurled him down to hell. Every nation, every party, faction, and cabal among his own and other peoples, has judged him from its own standpoint of self-interest and self-justification. Whatever chance there may be of reading Thesocrates of his life lies rather in a just consideration of the man in relation to his times, about which much is known, than in an attempt at the psychological dissection of an enigmatical nature, about which little is known, in spite of the fullness of our information. The abundant facts of his career are not facts at all unless considered in the light not only of a great national life, but of a continental movement which embraced in its day all civilization, not excepting that of Great Britain and America. The states of Europe are sisters, children of the Holy Roman Empire. In the formation of strong nationalities with differences in language, religion, and institutions, the relationship was almost forgotten, and in the intensity of later rivalry is not always even now remembered. It is, however, so close that at any epoch there is traceable a common movement which occupies them all. By the end of the 14th century they had secured their modern form in territorial and race unity with a government by monarchy more or less absolute. The 15th century saw with the strengthening of the monarchy the renaissance of the finites, the great inventions, the awakening of enterprise in discovery, the mental quickening which began to call all authority to account. The 16th was the age of the Reformation, an event too often belittled by ecclesiastics who discern only its schismatic character, and not sufficiently emphasized by historians as the most pregnant political fact of any age with respect to the rise and growth of free institutions. The 17th century saw in England the triumph of political ideas adapted to the new state of society which had arisen but subversive of the tyrannical system which had done its work, a work great and good in the creation of peoples and the production of social order out of chaos. For a time it seemed as if the island state were to become an overshadowing influence in all the rest of Europe. By the middle of the century her example had fired the whole continent with notions of political reform. The long campaign which she and her allies waged with varying fortune against Louis XIV, commanding the conservative forces of the Latin blood, and the Roman religion ended unfavorably to the latter. At the close of the Seven Years' War there was not an Englishman in Europe or America or in the colonies at the Antipodes whose pulse did not beat high as he saw his motherland triumphant in every quarter of the globe. But these very successes, intensifying the bitterness of defeat and everything connected with it, prevented among numerous other causes the triumph of constitutional government anywhere in continental Europe. Switzerland was remote and inaccessible, her beacon of democracy burned bright, but its rays scarcely shone beyond the mountain valleys. The Dutch Republic, innovated by commercial success and under a constitution which by its intricate system of checks was a satire on organized liberty had become a warning rather than a model to other nations. The other members of the great European state family presented a curious spectacle. On every hand there was a cheerful trust in the future. The present was as bad as possible, but belonged to the passing and not to the coming hour. Truth was abroad, felt their philosophers, and must prevail. Feudal privilege, oppression, vice and venality in government, the misery of the poor all would slowly fade away. The human mind was never keener than in the 18th century semicolon reasonableness, hope, and thoroughness characterized its activity. Natural science, metaphysics and historical studies made giant strides, while political theories of a dazzling splendor never equaled for nor since were rife on every side. Such was their power in a buoyant society, awaiting the millennium that they supplanted entirely the results of observation and experience in the sphere of government. But neither Lever nor Fulcrum was strong enough as yet to stir thin at massive traditional forms. 
monarchs still flattered themes of with notions of paternal government and divine right, the nobility still claimed and exercised baseless privileges which had descended from an age when their ancestors held not merely these but the land on which they rested, the burghers is still hugged, as something which had come from above, their dearly bought charter rights, now revealed as inborn liberties. They were thus hardened into a gross contentment dangerous for themselves, and into an indifference which was a menace to others. The great agricultural populations living in various degrees of serfdom still groaned under the artificial oppressions of a society which had passed away. Nominally the peasant might own certain portions of the soil, but he could not enjoy unmolested the airs which blew over it nor the streams which ran through it nor the wild things which trespassed or dwelt on it, while on every side some exasperating demand for the contribution of labor or goods or money confronted him. In short, the civilized world was in one of those transitional epochs when institutions persist, after the beliefs and conditions which molded them have utterly disappeared. The inertia of such a rock ribbed shell is terrible and while sometimes the erosive power of agitation and discussion suffices to weaken and destroy it, more often the volcanic fires of social convulsion are alone strong enough. The first such shock came from within the English-speaking world itself, but not in Europe. The American colonies, appreciating and applying to their own conditions the principles of the English Revolution, began, and with French assistance completed the movement which erected in another hemisphere the American Republic. Weak and tottering in its infancy, but growing ever stronger and therefore a milder, its example began at once to suggest the great and peaceful reforms of the English constitution which have since followed. Threatening absolutism in the strong contrasts its citizens presented to the subjects of other lands, it has been ever since the moral support of liberal movements the world around. England herself instead of being weakened, was strengthened by the child grown to independent maturity, and a double example of prosperity under constitutional administration was now held up to the continent of Europe. But it is the greatest proof of human weakness that there is no movement however beneficent, no doctrine however sound, no truth however absolute, but that it can be speciously so extended, so expanded, so emphasized as to lose its identity. Coincident with the political speculation of the 18th century appeared the storm and stress of romanticism and sentimentalism. The extremes of morbid personal emotion were thought serviceable for daily life, while the idle course of applying ideals to experience was utterly abandoned. The latest nihilism differs little from the conception of the perfect regeneration of mankind by discarding the old merely because it was old which triumphed in the latter half of the 18th century among philosophers and wits. To be sure, they had a substitute for weight for was abolished and a supplement for whatever was left incomplete. Even the stable sense of the Americans was infected by the virus of mere theories. In obedience to the spirit of the age they introduced into their written constitution, which was in the main but a statement of their deep-seated political habits, a scheme like that of the Electoral College founded on some high-sounding doctrine, or omitted from it in obedience to a prevalent and temporary extravagance of protest some fundamental truth like that of the Christian character of the government and laws. If there be anywhere a Christian Protestant state it is the United States, if any futile invention were ever incorporated in a written charter it was that of the Electoral College. The addition of a vague theory or the omission of essential national qualities in the document of the Constitution has affected a subsequent history little or not at all. But such was not the case in a society still under feudal oppression. Fictions like the contract theory of government, exploded by the sound sense of Burke, political generalizations like certain paragraphs of the French Declaration of Rights every item of which now and Harry reads like a platitude but was then and there a vivid revolutionary novelty, emotional yearnings for some vague utopia all fell into fruitful soil and produced a rank harvest, mostly of straw and stalks, although there was some sound grain. The thought of the time was a powerful factor in determining the course and the quality of events throughout all Europe. No nation was altogether unmoved. The center of agitation was in France, 
Although the little Calvinistic state of Geneva brought forth the prophet and writer of the times. Rousseau was a man of small learning but great insight. Originating gamost nothing, he set forth the ideas of others with incisive distinctness, often modifying them to their hurt, but giving to their form in which he wrote them an air of seductive practicability and reality which alone threw them into the sphere of action. Examining Europe at large, he found its social and political institutions so hardened and so unresponsive that he declared it incapable of movement without an antecedent general crash and breaking up. No laws, he reasoned, could be made because there were no means by which the general will could express itself, such was the rigidity of absolutism and feudalism. The splendid studies of Montesquieu which revealed to the French the eternal truths underlying the constitutional changes in England, had enlightened and captivated the best minds of his country, but they were too serious, too cold, too dreary to move the quick, bright temperament of the people at large. This was the work of Rousseau. Consummate in his literary power, he laid the axe at the root of the tree in his fierce attack on the prevailing education sought a new basis for government in his peculiar modification of the contract theory, and constructed a substitute system of sentimental morals to supplant the old authoritative new which was believed to underlie all the prevalent iniquities in religion, politics, and society. His entire structure lacked a foundation either in history or in reason. But the popular fancy was fascinated. The whole flimsy furniture in the chambers of the general mind vanished. New emotions, new purposes, new sanctions appeared in its stead. There was a sad lack of ethical definitions, an overzealous iconoclasm as to religion, but there were many high conceptions of regenerating society, of liberty, of brotherhood, of equality. The influence of this movement was literally ubiquitous, it was felt wherever men read or thought or talked, and were connected, however remotely with the great central movement of civilization. No land and no family could to all outward appearance be further aside from the main channel of European history in the 18th century than the island of Corsica and an obscure family by the name of Bonaparte which had dwelt there since the beginning of the 18th century. Yet that isolated land and that unknown family were not merely to be drawn into the movement, they were to illustrate its most characteristic phases. Rousseau though mistakenly, forecast a great destiny for Corsica, declaring in his letters on Poland that it wastes the only European land capable of movement, of law-making, of peaceful renovation. It was small and remote, but it came near to being an actual exemplification of his favorite and fundamental dogma concerning man in a state of nature, of order as arising from conflict, of government as resting on general consent and mutual agreement among the governed. Toward Corsica, therefore, the eyes of all Europe had long been directed. There, more than elsewhere, the setting of the world drama seemed complete in miniature, and, in the closing quarter of the 18th century, the action was rapidly unfolding a plot of universal interest. A lofty mountain ridge divides the island into eastern and western districts. The former is gentler in its slopes, and more fertile. Looking, as it does, Toward Italy, it was during the Middle Ages closely bound in intercourse with that peninsula, richer in its resources than the other part, it was more open to outside influences, and for this reason freer in its institutions. The rugged western division had come more completely under the yoke of feudalism, having close affinity in sympathy, and some relation in blood, with the Greek, Roman, Saracenic, and Teutonic race elements in France and Spain. The communal administration of the eastern slope, however, prevailed eventually in the western as well, and the differences of origin, wealth, and occupation, though at times the occasion of intestine discord, were as nothing compared with the common characteristics which knit the population of the entire island into a national organization, as much a unit as their insular territory. The people of this small commonwealth were in the main of Italian blood. Some slight connection with the motherland they still maintained in the relations of commerce, and by the education of their professional men and Italian schools. 
While a small minority supported themselves as tradesmen or seafarers, the mass of the population was dependent for a livelihood upon agriculture. As a nation they had long ceased to follow the course of general European development. They had been successively the subjects of Greece, Rome, and the Caliphate, of the German Roman emperors, and of the Republic of Pisa. Their late strule was Genoa, which had now degenerated into an untrustworthy oligarchy. United to that state originally by terms which gave Thieland a speaker or advocate in the Genoese Senate, and recognized the most cherished habits of a hardy, natural minded, and primitive a people, they had little by little been left a prey to their own faults in order that their unworthy mistress might plead their disorders as an excuse for her tyranny. Agriculture languished, and the minute subdivision of arable land finally rendered its tillage our most profitless. Dot among a people who are isolated not only as islanders, but also as mountaineers, old institutions are particularly tenacious of life that of the vendetta, or blood revenge, with the clanship it accompanies, never disappeared from Corsica. In the centuries of Genoese rule, the carrying of arms was winked at, quarrels became rife and often family confederations, embracing a considerable part of their country, were arrayed one against the other in lawless violence. The feudal nobility, few in number, were unrecognized, and failed to cultivate the industrial arts in the security of costly strongholds as the class did elsewhere, while the fairest portions of land not held by them were gradually absorbed by the monasteries. A process favored by Genoa as likely to render easier the government of a turbulent people. The human animal, however, throve. Rudely clad in homespun, men and women alike cultivated a simplicity of dress surpassed only by the plain living. There was no wealth except that of fields and flocks, their money consequently was debased and almost worthless. The social distinctions of noble and peasant survived only in tradition and all classes intermingled without any sense of superiority or inferiority. Elegance of manner, polish, grace, were unsought and existed only by natural refinement, which was rare among a people higher on the whole simple to boorishness. Physically they were, however, admirable. All visitors were struck by the repose and self-reliance of their countenances. The women were neither beautiful, stylish, nor neat yet they were considered modest and attractive. Themen were more striking in appearance and character. Of medium stature and powerful mold, with black hair, fine teeth, and piercing eyes semicolon with well-formed, agile, and sinewy limbs, sober, brave, trustworthy, and endowed with many other primitive virtues as well, the Corsican was everywhere sought as a soldier and could be found in all theomies of the southern continental states. In their periodic struggles against Genoese encroachments and tyranny, the Corsicans had produced a line of national heroes. San Piero, one of these, had in the 16th century incorporated Corsica for a brief hour with the dominions of the French crown, and was regarded as the typical Corsican. Dark, warlike, and revengeful, he had displayed a keen intellect and a fine judgment. Simple in his dress and habits, untainted by the luxury then prevalent in the courts of Florence and Paris, at both of which he resided for considerable periods, he could kill his wife without a shudder when she put herself and child into the hands of his enemies to betray him. Hospitable and generous, boot untamed and terrible, brusque, dictatorial, and without consideration or compassion, the offspring of his times and his people, he stands the embodiment of primeval energy, physical and mental. The submission of a people like this to a superior force was sullen, and in the long century which followed, the energies generally displayed in a well ordered life seemed among them to be not quenched but directed into the channels of their passions and their bodily powers, which were ready on occasion to break forth in devastating violence. In 1729 began a succession of revolutionary outbursts and at last in 1730 the communal assemblies united in a national convention, choosing two chiefs, Colonna Seckeldy and Giaffari, Toliad in the attempt to rouse the nation to action and throw off the unendurable yoke. English philanthropists furnished the munitions of war. The Genoese were beaten in successive battles, 
even after they brought into the field 8,000 German mercenaries purchased from the Emperor Charles VI. The Corsican adventurers in foreign lands, pleading for their liberties with artless eloquence at every court, filled Europe with enthusiasm for their cause and streamed back to fight for their homes. A temporary peace on terms which granted Ali asked was finally arranged through the Emperor's intervention. But the two elected chiefs, and a third patriot, Raffaele, having been taken prisoners by the Genoese, were ungenerously kept in confinement, and released only at the command of Charles. Under the some leaders, now further exasperated by their ill usage, began and continued another agitation, this time for separation and complete emancipation. Jaffari's chosen adjutant was a youth of good family and excellent parts, Hyacinth Paoli. In the then existing complications of European politics the only available helper was the King of Spain, and to him the Corsicans now applied, but his undertakings compelled him to refuse. Left without allies or anything support, the pious Corsicans naively threw themselves on the protection of the Virgin and determined more firmly than ever to secure independence. In this crisis appeared at the head of a considerable following, some hundreds in number, the notorious and curious German adventurer, Theodore von Neuhoff, who, declaring that he represented the sympathy of the great powers for Corsica, made ready to proclaim himself asking. As any shelter is welcome in a storm, the people accepted him, and he was crowned on April 15, 1736. But although he spoke truthfully when he claimed to represent the sympathy of the powers, he did not represent their strength, and was defeated again and again in encounters with the forces of Genoa. The oligarchy had now secured an alliance with France, which feared lest the island might fall into more hostile and stronger hands and before the close of the year the short-lived monarchy ended in the disappearance of Theodore I of Corsica from his kingdom and soon after, in spite of his heroic exertions, from history. The truth was that some of the nationalist leaders had not forgotten the old patriotic leaning towards France which had existed since the days of San Piero, and were themselves in communication with the French court and Cardinal Fleury. A French army landed in February, 1738, and was defeated. An overwhelming force was then dispatched and the insurrection subsided. In the end France, though strongly tempted to hold what she had conquered, kept her promise to Genoa and disarmed the Corsicans, on the other hand, however, she consulted her own interest and attempted to soothe the islanders by guaranteeing to them national rights. Such, however, was the prevalent bitterness that many patriots fled into exile, some, like Hyacinth Paoli, choosing the pay of Naples for themselves and followers, others accepting the offer of France and forming according to time honored custom a Corsican regiment of mercenaries which took service in the armies of the king. Among the latter were two of some eminence, but a few Ogo and Solicetti. The half measures of Fleury left Corsica, as he intended, ready to fall into his hands when opportunity should be ripe. Even the patriotic leaders were now no longer in harmony. Those in Italy were of the old disinterested line and suspicious of their western neighbor, the others were charged with being the more ambitious for themselves and careless of their country's liberty. Both classes, however, claimed to be true patriots. During the war of the Austrian succession it seemed for a moment as if Corsica were to be freed by the attempt of Maria Theresa to overthrow Genoa, then an ally of the Bourbon powers. The National Party rose again under Gaffery, the regiments of Piedmont came to their help, and the English fleet delivered Street Florent and Bastia into their hands. But the Peace of Aix la Chapelle, 1748, left things substantially as they were before the war, and in 1752 a new arrangement unsatisfactory to both parties was made with Genoa. It was virtually dictated by Spain and France. England having been alienated by the quarrels and petty jealousies of the Corsican leaders, and lasted only as long as the French occupation continued. Under the leadership of the same Nantla Scaffery who in 1740 had been chosen along with Maitre Tibiech commander, the Genoese were once more driven from the highland into the coast towns. At the height of his success the bold Gaila fell a victim to family rivalries and personal spite. 
truth influence of his despairing foes a successful conspiracy was formed and in the autumn of 1753 he was foully murdered. But the greatest of these national heroes was also the last Pascal Paoli. Fitted for his task by birth, by capacity, by superior training, this youth was in 1755 made captain general of the island, a virtual dictator in his 29th year. His success was ace remarkable as his measures were wise. Elections were regulated so that strong organization was introduced into the loose democratic institutions which had hitherto prevented sufficient unity of action in troubled times. An army was created from the straggling bands of volunteers, and brigandage was suppressed. Wise laws were enacted and enforced among them one which made the blood avenger a murderer, instead of a hero as he had been. Moreover, the foundations of our university were laid in the town of Corti, which was the hearthstone of the liberals because it was the natural capital of the West Slope, connected by difficult and defensible paths with every cape and by and intervale of the rocky and broken coast. The Genoese were gradually driven from the interior, and finally they occupied but three harbour towns. Through skillful diplomacy, Paoli created a temporary breach between his suppressors and the Vatican which, though soon healed, nevertheless enabled him to recover important domains for the state, and prevented the Roman hierarchy from using its enormous influence over the superstitious people utterly to crush the movement for their emancipation. His extreme and enlightened liberalism is admirably shown by his invitation to the Jews, with their industry and steady habits, to settle in Corsica, and to live there in the fullest enjoyment of civil rights according to the traditions of their faith and the precepts of their law. Liberty, he said, knows no greed. Let us leave such distinctions to the Inquisition. Commerce, under these influences, began to thrive. New harbors were made and fortified, while the equipment of a few gunboats for their defense marked the small beginnings of a fleet. The haughty men of Corsica, changing their very nature for a season, began to labor with their hands by the side of their wives and hired assistants, to agriculture, industry, and the arts was given an impulse which promised to be lasting. The rule of Paoli was not entirely without disturbance. From time to time there occurred rebellious outbreaks of petty factions like that headed by Maitre, a disappointed rival. But on the whole they were of little importance. Down to 1765 the advances of the nationalists rest steady, their battles being won against enormous odds by the force of the warlike nature, which sought honor above all things, and could, in the words of a medieval chronicle, endure without a murmur watchings and pains, hunger and cold, in its pursuit which could even face death without a pang. Finally it became necessary, as the result of unparalleled success in domestic affairs, that a foreign policy will be formulated. Paoli's idea was an offensive and defensive alliance with France on terms recognizing the independence of Corsica, securing an exclusive commercial reciprocity between them, and promising military service with an annual tribute from the island. This idea of France as a protector without administrative power was held by the majority of patriots. But Choi Isul, the Minister of Foreign Affairs under Louis XV, wouldn't attain no such visionary plan. It was clear to everyone that Thieland could no longer be held by its old masters. He had found a facile instrument for the measures necessary to his contemplates Zurevit in the son of a Corsican refugee, that later notorious Butterfuoco, who, carrying water on both shoulders, had ingratiated himself with his father's old friends while at the same time he had for years been successful as a French official. Corsica was to be seized by France as a sop to the national pride, a slight compensation for the loss of Canada, and he was willing to be the agent. On August 6, 1764, was signed a provisional agreement between Genoa and France by which the former was to cede for four years all her rights of sovereignty, and the few places she still held in the island in return for the latter's intervention to thwart Paoli's plan for securing virtual independence. At the end of the period France was to pay Genoa the millions owed to her. By this time the renown of Paoli had filled all Europe. 
as a statesman had skillfully used the European entanglements both of the Bourbon-Habsburg alliance made in 1756, and of the alliance consequent to the Seven Years' War, for whatever possible advantage he might be secured to his people and their cause. As a general he had found profit even in defeat, and had organized his little forces to the highest possible efficiency, displaying prudence, fortitude, and capacity. His personal character was blameless, and could be flawlessly set up as a model. He was a convincing orator and a wise legislator. Full of sympathy for his backward compatriots, he knew the weaknesses, and could avoid the consequences, while he recognized at the same time their virtues, and made the fullest use of them. Above all, he had the wide horizon of a philosopher, understanding fully the proportions and relations to each other of epochs and peoples not striving to uplift Corsica merely in her own interest, but seeking to find in her regeneration a leverage to raise the world to higher things. So gracious, so influential, so far-seeing, so all-embracing was his nature, that Voltaire called him the lawgiver and the glory of his people, while Frederick the Great dedicated to him a dagger with the inscription, Libertas, Patria. The shadows in his character were that he was imperious and arbitrary semicolon so overmastering that he trained the Corsicans to seek guidance and protection, thus preventing them from acquiring either personal independence or self-reliance. Awaiting at every step an impulse from Thredord leader, growing timid in the moment when decision was imperative, they did not prove equal to their task. Without his people Paoli was still a philosopher, Without him they became in succeeding years a byword, and fell supinely into the arms of a less noble subjection. In this regard the comparison between him and Washington, so often instituted, utterly breaks down. Corsica, wrote in 1790 a youth destined to lend even greater interest than Paoli to that name Corsica has been a prey to the ambition of her neighbors, the victim of their politics and of her own willfulness. We have seen her take up arms, shake the atrocious power of Genoa, recover her independence, live happily for an instant semicolon but then, pursued by an irresistible fatality, fall again and tone tolerable disgrace. For twenty-four centuries these are the sun as it recur again and again, the same changes, the same misfortune, but also the same courage, the same resolution the same boldness. If she trembled for an instant before the feudal hydra, it was on long enough to recognize and destroy it. If, led by a natural feeling, she kissed, like a slave, the chains of Rome, she was not long in breaking them. If, finally, she bowed her head before the Ligurian aristocracy, if irresistible forces kept her twenty years in the despotic grasp of Versailles, forty years of mad warfare astonished Europe and confounded her enemies. The same pen wrote of Paoli that by following traditional lines he had not only shown in the constitution he framed for Corsica a historic intuition, but also had found in his unparalleled activity, in his swarm, persuasive eloquence, in his adroit and far-seeing genius, a means to guarantee it against the attacks of wicked foes. Such was the country in whose fortunes the Age of Enlightenment was so interested. Montesquieu had used its history to illustrate the loss and recovery of privilege and rights, Rousseau had thought the little Isla would one day fill all Europe with amazement. When the latter was driven into exile for his utterances, and before his flight to England, Paoli offered him a refuge. But a few ago, who represented the opinion that Corsica for its own good must be incorporated with France, and not merely come under her protection, had a few months previously also invited the Genevan prophet to visit the island, and outline a constitution for its people. But the snare was spread in vain. In the letter which with polished phrase declined the task, on the ground of its writer's ill health, stood the words, I believe eth that under their present leader the Corsicans have nothing to fear from Genoa. I believe, moreover, that they have nothing to fear from the troops which France is said to be transporting to their shores. What confirms me in this feeling is that, in spite of the movement, so good a patriot as you seem to be continues in the service of their country which sends them. Paoli was of the same opinion, and remained so until his rude awakening in 1768. 
Chapter 2. The Bonapartes in Corsica. The French occupy Corsica, Paoli deceived, treaty between France and Genoa, English intervention vain, Paoli in England, British problems, introduction of the French administrative system, Paoli's policy, the coming man, origin of the Bonapartes, the Corsican branch, their nobility, Carla Maria di Bonaparte, Maria Letizia Ramolino, their marriage and naturalization as French subjects, their fortunes, their children. Side note, 1764-72. The preliminary occupation of Corsica by the French was ostensibly formal. The process was continued, however, until the formality became a reality, until the fortifications of the seaport towns ceded by Genoa were filled with troops. Then, for the first time, the text of the convention between the two powers was communicated to Paoli. Choi Isil explained through his agent that by its first section the king guaranteed the safety and liberty of the Corsican nation. But, no doubt, he forgot to explain the double dealing in the second section. Thereby, in the Italian form, the Corsicans were in return to take all right and proper measures dictated by their sense of justice and natural moderation to secure the glory and interest of the Republic of Genoa, while in the French form they were to yield to the Genoese all they thought necessary to the glory and interests of their public. Who were they? The Corsicans or the Genoese? Paolis I was fixed on the acknowledgement of Corsican independence, he was hoodwinked completely as to the treachery in this second section, the meaning of which, according to diplomatic usage, was settled by the interpretation which the language employed for one form put upon that in which the other was written. Combining the two translations, Italian and French, of the second section, and interpreting one by the author, the Genoese were still the arbiters of Corsican conduct and their promise of liberty contained in the first section was worthless. Four years passed, apparently they were uneventful, but in reality Choi Isil made good use of his time. Through Butterfioco he was in regular communication with that minority among the Corsicans which desired incorporation. By the skillful manipulation of private feuds, and the unstinted use of money, this minority was before long turned into a majority. Toward the close of 1767 Choi Isil began to show his hand by demanding absolute possession for France of at least two strong towns. Paoli replied that the demand was unexpected, and required consideration by the people. The answer was that the King of France could not be expected to mingle in Corsican affairs without some advantage for himself. To gain time, Paoli chose Butterfioco Ashis plenipotentiary, dispatched him to Versailles, and thus fell into the very trap so carefully set for him by his opponent. He consented as a compromise that Corsica should join the Bourbon Habsburg League. More he could not grant for love of his wild, free Corsicans, and had cherished the secret conviction that, Genoa being no longer able to assert her sovereignty, France would never allow another power to intervene, and so, for the sake of peace, might accept this solution. But the great French minister was a master of diplomacy and would note I eld. In his designs upon Corsica, he had little to fear from European opposition. He knew how hampered England was by the strength of parliamentary opposition, and the unrest of her American colonies. The Sardinian monarchy was still weak, and quailed under the jealous ice of her strong enemies. Austria could not act without breaking the league so essential to her welfare, while the Bourbon courts of Spain and Naples would regard the family aggrandizement with complacency. Moreover, something must be done to save the prestige of France. Her American colonial empire was lost, Catherine's brilliant policy, and the subsequent victories of Russia in the Orient, were threatening what remained of French influence in that quarter. Here was a propitious moment to emulate once more the English, to seize a station in the Indian high road as valuable as Gibraltar or Portman, and to raise high hopes of again recovering, if not the colonial supremacy among nations, at least that equality which the Seven Years' War had destroyed. Without loss of time, therefore, the negotiations rendered, and Butterfioco was dismissed. On May 15, 1768, 
the price at her be paid having been fixed, a definitive treaty with Genoa was signed whereby she yielded the exercise of sovereignty to France, and Corsica passed finally from her hands. Paoli appealed to the great powers against this arbitrary transfer, but in vain. The campaign of subjugation opened at once, but a few ago, with a few worth the Corsicans, taking service against his kinsfolk. The soldiers of the Royal Corsican Regiment, which was in the French service, and which had been formed under his father's influence, flatly refused to fight their brethren. The French troops already in the island were at once reinforced. But during the first year of the final conflict the advantage was all with the Patriots, indeed, there was one substantial victory on October 7, 1768, that of Borgo, which caused dismay at Versailles. Once more Paoli hoped for intervention, especially that of England, whose liberal feeling would coincide with his interest in keeping Corsica from France. Money and arms were sent from Great Britain, but that was all. This conduct of the British ministry was afterward recalled by France as a precedent for rendering aid to the Americans in their uprising against England. The following spring, an army of no less than 20,000 men was dispatched from France to make short and thorough work of their conquest. The previous year of bloody and embittered conflict had gone for to disorganize the Patriot army. It was only with the utmost difficulty that the little bands of mountain villagers could be tempted away from the ever more necessary defense of their homes and firesides. Yet in spite of disintegration before such overwhelming odds, and though in want both of ordinary munitions and of the very necessities of life, the forces of Paoli continued a fierce and heroic resistance. It was only after months of devastating, heart-rending, helpless warfare, that their leader, utterly rooted in the affect known as the Battle of Ponte Nuovo, finally gave up the desperate cause. Exhausted, and without resources, he would have been an easy prey to the French, but they were too wise to take him prisoner. On June 13, 1769, by their connivance he escaped, with 340 of his most devoted supporters, on two English vessels, to the mainland. His goal was England. The journey was a long, triumphant procession from Leghorn through Germany and Holland semicolon the honours showered on him by the liberals in the towns through which passed were such as are generally paid to victory, not to defeat. Kindly received and entertained, he lived for the next thirty years in London, the recipient from the government of £1,200 a year as a pension. The year 1770 saw the King of France apparently in peaceful possession of that Corsican sovereignty which he claimed to have bought from Genoa. His administration was soon and easily inaugurated, and thus nowhere any interference from foreign powers. Philanthropic England had provided for Paoli, but would do no more, for she was buzz yet home with the transformation of her parties. The old Whig party was disintegrating, the new Toryism was steadily asserting itself in the passage of contemptuous measures for oppressing the American colonies. She was, moreover, soon to be so absorbed in her great struggle on both sides of the globe that interest in Corsica and the Mediterranean must remain for a long time in abeyance. But the establishment of a French administration in the king's new acquisition did not proceed smoothly. The party favorable to incorporation with France had grown, and, in the rush to side with success, it now probably far outnumbered that of the old patriots. At outset this majority faithfully supported the conquerors in an attempt, honorable to both, to retain as much of Paoli's system as possible. But the appointment of an intendant and a military commander acting as royal governor with a veto over legislation was essential. This of necessity destroyed the old democracy. For, in any case, the existence of such officials and the social functions of such as must create a quasi-aristocracy, and its power would rest not on popular habit and goodwill, but on the French soldiery. The situation was frankly recognized, therefore, in a complete reorganization of those descended from the old nobility, and from these a council of twelve was selected to support and countenance the governor. The clergy and the third estate were likewise formally organized and wooed their orders, so that with clergy, nobles, and commons, 
Corsica become a French underscore pays de apostrophe a tat underscore, another provincial anachronism in the chaos of royal administration. The class bitterness of the mainland could easily be and was transplanted to the island. The ultimate success of the process left nothing to be desired. Moreover, the most important offices were given into French hands, while the seat of government was moved from Corti, the highland capital, to the lowland towns of Basti and Ajaxio. The primeval feud of highlanders and lowlanders was thus rekindled, and in the subsequent agitations the patriots won over by France either lost influence with their followers, or ceased to support the government. Old animosities were everywhere revived and strengthened, until finally the flames burst forth in open rebellion. They were, of course, suppressed, but the work was done with a savage thoroughness the memory of which long survived to prevent their formation in the island of a natural sentiment friendly to the French. Those who professed such a feeling were held in no great esteem. It was perhaps an error that Paoli did not recognize the indissoluble ebbs of race and speech as powerfully drawing Corsica to Italy, disregard the leanings of the democratic mountaineers toward France sympathize with the fondness of the towns for the motherland, and souse his influence as to confirm the natural alliance between Thinsular Italians and those of the peninsula. When we regard a Sardinia, however, time seems to have justified him. There is little to choose between the sister islands as regards the backward condition of both semicolon but the French department of Corsica is, at least, no less advanced than the Italian province of Sardinia. The final amalgamation of Paoli's country with France, which was in a measure the result of his leaning toward a French protectorate, accomplished one end, however, which has rendered it impossible to separate her from the course of great events, from the number of the mighty agents in history. Curiously longing in his exile for a second Sampiero to have wielded physical power while he himself should have become a Lycagus. Paoli's wish was to be halfway fulfilled in that a warrior great and San Piero was about to be born in Corsica, one who should, by the very union so long resisted, come, as the master of France, to wield a power strong enough to shatter both tyrannies and dynasties, thus clearing the ground for a law giving closely related to Paoli's own just and wise conceptions of legislation. The coming man was to be a typical Corsican, moreover. Born in Thegany of his fatherland, he was to combine all the important qualities of his folk in himself. Like them, he was to be short, with wonderful eyes and beautiful teeth, temperate, quietly, even meanly, clad semicolon generous, grateful for any favor, however small, masterful, courageous, impassive, shrewd, resolute, fluent of speech, profoundly religious, even superstitious, hot tempered inscrutable, mendacious, revengeful sometimes and oft-times forgiving, disdainful of woman and her charms, above all, boastful, conceited, and with a passion for glory. His pride and his imagination were to be barbaric in their air immensity. His clannishness was to be that of the most primitive civilization. In all these points he was to be Corsican, other characteristics he was to acquire from the land of his adoption through an education French both in affairs and in books, but he was after all Corsican from the womb to the grave, that in the first degree, and only secondarily French, while his cosmopolitan disguise was to be scarcely more than a mask to be raised or lowered at pleasure. This sign was to come from the stock which at first bore the name of Bonaparte, or, as the heraldic etymology later spelled it, Bonaparte. There were branches of the same stock, or, at least, of the same name, in other parts of Italy. Three towns at least claimed to be the Seattle for family with this patronymic, and one of them, Treviso, possessed papers to prove the claim. Although other members of his family based absurd pretensions of princely origin on these insufficient proofs, Napoleon himself was little impressed by them. He was disposed to declare that his ancestry began in his own person, either at Toulon or from the 18th of Brumaire. Whatever the origin of the Corsican Bonapartes, it was neither royal from the twin brother of Louis XIV, thought to be the Iron Mask, nor imperial from the Julian Gens, nor Greek, nor Saracen, nor, in short, 
anything which later invented and lying genealogies declared it to be. But it was almost certainly Italian, and probably patrician, for in 1780 a Tuscan gentleman of the name devised a scanty estate to his distant Corsican kinsman. The earliest home of the family was Florence, later they removed for political reasons to Sarzana, in Tuscany, where for generations men of that name exercised the profession of advocate. The line was extinguished in 1799 by the death of Philip Bonaparte, a canon and a man of means, who, although he had recognized his kin in Corsica to the extent of interchanging hospitalities, nevertheless devised Heiss estate to a relative named Bonacusi. The Corsican branch were persons of some local consequence in their latest seats, partly because of their Italian connections, partly in the substantial possessions of land and partly through the official positions which they held in the city of Ajaxio. Their sympathies as lowlanders and townspeople were with the country of their origin and with Genoa. During the last years of the 16th century that republic authorized a Jerome, then head of the family, to prefix their distinguishing particle D to his name, but the Italian custom was averse to its use, which was not revived until later, and then only for a short time. Nine generations are recorded as having lived on Corsican soil within two centuries and a quarter. They were evidently men of consideration, for they intermarried with the best families off the island, Ornano, Costa, Bozzi, and Colonna are names occurring in the family records. Nearly two centuries passed before the Grand Duke of Tuscany issued formal patents in 1757, attesting the Bonaparte nobility. It was Joseph the grandsire of Napoleon, who received them. Soon afterward he announced that the coat armor of the family was under scola coron decumpt, lecus and fendu par derbas et detols, avec les letters b. p. key signifiant bonaparte, le fond d'armes raw ujitas, labels et les etols blur, les embrements et les coron jorni exclamation mark underscore translated as literally as such doubtful language and construction can be, this signifies, accounts coronet, the escutcheon with two bends, sinister and two stars, bearing the letters p, p which signify Bonaparte, the field of the arms red, the bents and stars blue, the letters and coronet yellow. In heraldic parlance this would be, gules, two bends sinister between two s to isles as you're charged with b. p. for Bonaparte, or, surmounted by a count's coronet of the last. In 1759 the same sovereign granted further the title of patrician. Charles, the son of Joseph, received a similar grant from the Archbishop of Pisa in 1769. These facts have a substantial historical value since by reason of them the family was Gillian justly recognized as noble in 1771 by the French authorities, and as a consequence, eight years later, the most illustrious son of the stem became, as a recognized aristocrat, the ward of a France which was still monarchical. Reading between the lines of such a narrative, it appears as if the short-lived family of Corsican lawyers had some difficulty in preserving an influence proportionate to their descent, and therefore sought to draw all the strength they could from a bygone grandeur, easily forgotten by their neighbors in their moderate circumstances at a later day. Still later, when all sedivant aristocrats were suspects in France, and when the taint of nobility sliced to destroy those on whom it rested, Napoleon denied his quality, the usual inquest as to veracity was not made and he went free. This escape he owed partly to the station he had reached, partly to the fact that his family claims had been based on birth so obscure at the time as to subject the claimants to good-natured raillery. No task had lain nearer to Paoli's heart than to unite in one nation the two factions into which he found his people divided. Accordingly, when Carlo Maria di Bonaparte, the single stem on which the consequential lowland family depended for continuance, appeared at court to pursue his studies, the stranger was received with flattering kindness, and probably, as one account has it, was appointed to a post of emolument and honor as Paoli's private secretary. The new patrician, according to a custom common among Corsicans of his class, determined to take his degree at Pisa, and in November, 
1769, he was made Doctor of Laws by that university. Many pleasant and probably true anecdotes have been told to illustrate the good fellowship of the young advocate among his comrades while a student. There are likewise narratives of his persuasive eloquence and of his influence as a patriot, but these sound mythical. In short, an organized effort of sycophantic admirers, who would, if possible, illuminate the whole family in order to heighten Napoleon's renown, has invented fables and distorted facts to such a degree that the entire truth as to Charles' character is hard to discern. Certain undisputed facts, however, throw a strong light upon Napoleon's father. His people were proud and poor semicolon he endured the hardships of poverty with equanimity. Strengthening what little influence he could muster, he at first appears ambitious, and is himself described in his doctor's diploma as a patrician of Florence, San Miniato, and Ajaxio. His character is little known except by the statements of his own family. They declared that he was a spendthrift. He spent two years' income, about twelve hundred dollars, in celebrating with friends the taking of his degree. He would have sold not only the heavily mortgaged estates inherited by himself, but also those of his wife, except for the fierce remonstrances of his heirs. He could write clever verse, he was a devotee of Bell's Lettre, and a skeptic in the fashion of the time. Self indulgent, he was likewise bitterly opposed to all family discipline. His figure was slight and lithe, his expression alert and intelligent, his eyes grey blue and his hair large. He was ambitious, indefatigable as a place hunter, suave, elegant, and irrepressible. On the other hand, with no apparent regard for his personal advancement by marriage, he followed his own inclination, and in 1764, at the age of 18, gallantly wedded a beautiful child of 15, Maria Letizia Ranmolino. Her descent, though excellent and, remotely, even noble, was inferior to that of her husband but her fortune was equal, if not superior, to his. Her father was a Genoese official of importance, her mother, daughter of a petty noble by a peasant wife, became a widow in 1755 and two years later was married again to Francis Fesch, a Swiss, captain in the Genoese navy. Of this union, Joseph, later Cardinal Fesch, was the child. Although well born, the mother of Napoleon had no education and was of peasant nature to the last day of her long life hardy, unsentimental, frugal, avaricious, and sometimes unscrupulous. Yet for all that, the hospitality of her little home in Ajaxia was lavish and famous. Among the many guests who were regularly entertained there was Marbuf, commander in Corsica of the first army of occupation. There was long afterward a malicious tradition that the French general was Napoleon's father. The morals of Letizia de Bonaparte, like those of her conspicuous children, have he been bitterly assailed, but her good name, at least, has always been vindicated. The evident motive of the story sufficiently refutes such an aspersion as it contains. Of the bride's extraordinary beauty through has never been a doubt. She was a woman of heroic mould like Juno in Her Majesty, unmoved in prosperity, undaunted in adversity. It was probably to his mother, whom he strongly resembled in childhood, that famous son owed his tremendous and unparalleled physical endurance. After their marriage the youthful pair resided in Corti, waiting until events should permit their return to Ajaxio. Naturally of an indolent temperament, the husband, though he had at first been drawn into the daring enterprises of Paoli, and had displayed a momentary enthusiasm, was now, as he had been for more than a year, weary of them. At the head of a body of men of his own rank, he finally withdrew to Monte Rotondo, and on May 23, 1769, a few weeks before Paoli's flight, the band made formal submission to Vaux, commander of this second army of occupation, explaining through Bonaparte that the national leader had misled them by promises of aid which never came, and that, recognizing the impossibility of further resistance, they were anxious to accept the new government, to return to their homes, and to resume the peaceful conduct of their affairs.
this at least is the generally accepted account of his desertion of Paoli's cause there is some evidence that having followed Clement, a brother of Pascal, into a remoter district, he had the found no support for the enterprise, and had thence under great hardships of flood and field made his way with wife and child to the French headquarters. The result was the same in either case. It was the precipitate naturalization of the father as a French subject which made his Gritson a Frenchman. Less than three months afterward, on August 15, the fourth child, Napoleon de Bonaparte, was born in Ajaccio, the seat of French influence. The resources of the Bonapartes, as they still wrote themselves, small, although their family and expectations were large. Charles himself was the owner of a considerable estate in houses and lands, but everything was heavily mortgaged and his income was small. He had further inherited a troublesome law plea, the prosecution of which was expensive. By an entail in trust of a great-great-grandfather, important lands were entailed in the male line of the Odon family. In default of regular descent, the estate was vested in the female line, and should, when Charles's maternal uncle died childless, have reverted to his mother. But the uncle had made a will bequeathing his property to the Jesuits, who swiftly took possession and had maintained their ownership by occupation and by legal quibbles. Joseph, the father of Charles, had wasted many years and most of his fortune in weary litigation. Nothing daunted, Charles settled down to pursue the same phantom, virtually depending for a livelihood on the patrimony of his wife. Letitia Bonaparte, being an only child, had fallen heir to her father's property on the second marriage of her mother. The stepfather was an excellent Swiss, a Protestant from Basel, thoroughly educated, and interested in education, and for years a mercenary in the Genoese service. On his retirement he became a Roman Catholic in order to secure woman of his choice. He was the father of Letitia's half-brother, Joseph. The retired officer, Thorf Gindley disposed to the family he had entered, had little but his pension and savings, he could contribute nothing but good sound common sense and his homely ideas of education. The real head of the family was the uncle of Charles, Lucien Bonaparte, Archdeacon of the Cathedral. It was he who had supported and guided his nephew, and had sent him to the college founded by Paoli at Corti. In his youth Charles was wasteful and extravagant, but his wife was thrifty to Mayanus. With the restraint of her economy and the stimulus of his uncle, respected as head of the family, the father of Napoleon arrived at a position of some importance. He practiced his profession with some diligence, became an assessor of the highest insular court, and in 1772 was made a member, later a deputy, of the Council of Corsica Nobles. The sturdy mother was most prolific. Her eldest child, born in 1765, was a son who died in infancy, in 1767 was born a daughter, Maria Anna destined to the same fate, in 1768 a son, known later as Joseph, but baptized as Nabulian, in 1769 the great son, Napoleon. Nine other children were the fruit of the same wedlock, and six of the three sons, Lucien, Louis, and Jerome, and three daughters, Eliza, Pauline, and Caroline survived to share their brother's greatness. Charles himself, like his short-lived ancestors, comma of whom five had died within a century, comma scarcely reached middle age, dying in his thirty-ninth year. Letitia, like the stout Corsican that she was, lived to the ripe age of eighty-six in the full enjoyment of her faculties, known to the world as Madame Mia, a sobriquet devised by her great son to distinguish her as the mother of the Napoleons. Chapter three. Napoleon's birth and childhood. One. Footnote 1. The indispensable authority for the youth of Napoleon is the collection of his own papers edited, not always judiciously, by Frederick Masson and published by him in cooperation with G. Biagi under the title Napoleon in Coup. The originals are now in the Laurentian Library at Florence. They were entrusted by the Emperor to Cardinal Fesch as a safe depository, probably in the hope that they would eventually be destroyed. What the cardinal actually did with them remains obscure. 
Sometime early in the 19th century they came into possession of a certain library, one of the French government library inspectors, an unscrupulous collector and dealer. From them he excerpted enough matter for an article which, before his disgrace, was published in an early number of the Revue des Deux Mondes, but in the publication there was no statement of authority and the article was forgotten, important as it was. The originals were not found or known until in the sale catalogue of Lord Ashburnham's library appeared a lot entitled merely Napoleon Papers. This fact was brought to the author's attention by a friend, and when after a smart competition between agents of the French and Italian governments the manuscripts were deposited at Florence, he sought permission immediately to examine and study them. This was promptly granted, they proved to be the lost fesh papers, and for the first time it was possible to obtain a clear account of Napoleon's early years. The standard authorities hitherto had been the works of Nazica, Koston, and Jung, while they still have a certain value, it is slight in view of the reliable deductions to be drawn from the original boy papers of Napoleon Bonaparte. Later on and after the publication of the corresponding portion of this life, they were edited, printed, and published. In the main there is no room for difference with the transcript of M. Masson, but in some places where the writing is uncommonly bad the author's own transcript presents the facts as stated in these pages. Within a few years M. Chuki has summed up admirably all our authentic knowledge of the subject in a book entitled, La Junus de Napoleon. His own researches have brought to light some further valuable material. I have not hesitated in this revision to make the freest use of the latest authorities, but it is a gratification that no substantial changes, except by way of slight additions, have been found necessary, birth of Nabulian or Joseph, date of Napoleon's birth, coincidence with the festival of the Assumption, the name of Napoleon, Corsican conditions as influencing Napoleon's character, his early education, childish traits influenced by traditions concerning Paoli, family prospects, influence of Marbeuf, upheavals in France, Napoleon appointed to a scholarship, his efforts to learn French at Autun, development of his character, his father delegate of the Corsican nobility at Versailles. Side note, 1768-79. The trials of poverty made the Bonapartes so clever and adroit that suspicions of shiftiness in small matters were developed later on, and these led to an over-close scrutiny of their acts. The opinion has not yet disappeared among reputable authorities that Nabulian and Napoleon were one and the same, born on January 7, 1768, Joseph being really the younger, born on the date assigned to his distinguished brother. The earliest documentary evidence consists of two papers, one in the archives of the French War Department, one in those of Ajaxio. The former is dated 1782, and testifies to the bet of Nabulian on January 7, 1768, and to his baptism on January 8. The latter is the copy, not the original, of a government contract which declares the birth, on January 7, of Joseph Nabulian. Neither is decisive, but the addition of Joseph, with the use of the two French forms for the name in the second, with the clear intent of emphasizing his quality as a Frenchman, destroys much of its value, and leaves the weight of authority with the former. The reasonableness of the suspicion seems to be heightened by the fact that the certificate of Napoleon's marriage gives the date of his birth as February 8, 1768. Moreover, in the marriage contract of Joseph, witnesses testify to his having been born at Ajaxio, not at Corti. But there are facts of greater weight on the other side. In the first place, the documentary evidence is itself of equal value, for the archives of the French War Department also contain an extract from the own original baptismal certificate, which is dated July 21, 1771, the day of the baptism and gives the date of Napoleon's birth as August 15, 1769. Charles's application for the appointment of his two eldest boys to Brian has also been found, and it contains, according to regulation, still another copy from the original certificate, which is dated June 23, 1776, 
and also gives what must be accepted as the correct date. This explodes history that Napoleon's age was falsified by his father in order to obtain admittance for him to the military school. The application was made in 1776 for both boys, so as to secure admission for each before the end of his tenth year. It was the delay of the authorities in granting the request which, after the lapse of three years or more, made Joseph ineligible. The father could have had no motive in 1776 to perpetrate a fraud, and after that date it was impossible, for the papers were not in his hands. Moreover, the Minister of War wrote in 1778 that the name of the elder Bonaparte boy had already been withdrawn. That charge was made during Napoleon's lifetime. His brother Joseph positively denied it, and asserted the fact as it is no substantially proved to be. Bourienne, who had known his emperor as a child of nine, was of like opinion, Napoleon himself, in an autograph paper still existing, and written in the handwriting of Hisiauth, thrice gives the date of his birth as August 15, 1769. If the substitution occurred, it must have been in early infancy. Besides, we know why Napoleon at marriage sought to appear older than was. and Joseph's contract was written when the misstatement in it was valuable as making him appear thoroughly French. Among other absurd efforts to besmirch Napoleon's character is the oft-repeated insinuation that he fixed his birthday on the greatest high festival of the Roman Church, that of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, in order to assure its perpetual celebration. In sober fact the researches of indefatigable antiquaries have brought to light not only the documentary evidence referred to, but likewise the circumstance that Napoleon, in one paper spelled Lapillion, was a not uncommon Corsican name borne by several distinguished men, and that an early generation of the Bonaparte family the boys had been named Joseph, Napoleon, and Lucian as they followed one another into the world. In the 18th century spelling was scarcely more fixed than in the 16th nor in the walk of life to which the Bonapartes belonged was the fixity of names as rigid then as it later became. There were three Maria Annas in the family first and last, one of whom was afterward called Elisa. As to the form of the name Napoleon, there is a curious thought to an important confusion. We have already seen the forms Nabulian, Nabulian, Napoleon, Napoleon. Contemporary documents give also the form Napoleon, and his marriage certificate uses Napoleon. On the Vendome column stands Napoleo. Imp, which might be read either Napoleon the Imperatory or Napoleo Imperatory. In either case we have indications of a new form, Napoleon or Napoleus. The latter, which was more probably intended, would seem to be an attempt to recall Neapolis, a recognized saint's name. The absence of the name Napoleon from the calendar of the Latin Church was considered a serious reproach to its bearer by those who hated him, and their incessant taunts stung him. In youth his constant retort was that there were many saints and only 365 days in the year. In after years he had the matter remedied, and the French Catholics for a time celebrated a street Napoleon's day with proper ceremonies among which was the singing of a hymn composed to celebrate the power and virtues of the holy man for whom it was named. The irreverent ghoul boys of Orton and Brian give the nicknames Tranos underscore Palones underscore to both the brothers. The pronunciation, therefore, was probably as uncertain as the form, Napalones being probably a distortion of Napalone. The chameleon-like character of the name corresponds exactly to the chameleon-like character of the times, the man, and the lands of his birth and of his adoption. The Corsican noble and French royalist was Napoleon de Bonaparte, the Corsican republican and patriot was Napoleon Bonaparte, the French republican, Napoleon Bonaparte, the victorious general, Bonaparte, the emperor, Napoleon. There was likewise a change in this person's handwriting analogous to the change in his nationality and opinions. It was probably to conceal our most defective acknowledge of French that the adoptive Frenchman, as Republican, Consul, and Emperor, abandoned the fairly legible hand of his youth, and recurred to the atrocious one of his childhood.
continuing always to use it after his definite choice of a country. Stormy indeed were his nation and his birth time. He himself said, I was born while my country was dying. 30,000 French, vomited on our shores, drowning the throne of liberty in waves of blood. Such was the horrid sight which first met my view. The cries of the dying, the groans of the oppressed, tears of despair, surrounded my cradle at my birth. These were the words he used in 1789, while still a Corsican in feeling, when addressing Paoli. They strain chronology for the sake of historical effect, but they truthfully picture the circumstances under which he was conceived. Among many others of a similar character through a salate myth which recalls in detail that when the pains of parturition seized his mother she was at mass, and that she reached her chamber just in time to deposit, on a carpet or a piece of embroidery representing the young Achilles, the prodigy bursting so impetuously into the world. By the man himself his nature was always represented as the product of his hour, and this he considered a sufficient excuse for any line of conduct he chose to follow. When in banishment at Longwood, and on his deathbed, he recalled the circumstances of his childhood in conversations with the attendant physician, a Corsican like himself. Nothing awed me, I feared no one. I struck one, I scratched another, I was a terror to everybody. It was an e brother Joseph with whom I had most to do, he was beaten, bitten, scolded, and I had put the blame on him almost before he knew what he was about, was telling tales about him almost before he could collect his wits. I had to be quick, my mamelita's ear would have restrained my warlike temper, she would not have put up with my defiant petulance. Her tenderness was severe, meeting out punishment and reward with equal justice merit and demerit, she took both into account. Of his earliest education he said at the same time, like everything else in Corsica, it was pitiful. Lucian Bonaparte, his great uncle, was a canon, a man of substance with an income of five thousand livres a year, and of some education sufficient, at least, to permit his further ecclesiastical advancement. Uncle Fesh, whose father had received the good education of a Protestant Swiss boy, and had in turn imparted his knowledge to his own son, was the friend and older playmate of the turbulent little Bonaparte. The child learned a few notions of Bible history, and, doubtless, also the Catechism, from the canon, by his eleven-year-old uncle he was taught his alphabet. In his sixth year he was sent to a dame's school. The boys teased him because his stockings were always down over his shoes, and for his devotion to the girls, one named Giacomanetto especially. He met their taunts with blows, using sticks, bricks, or any handy weapon. According to his own story, he was fearless in the face of superior numbers, however large. His mother, according to his brother Joseph, declared that he was a perfect imp of a child. She herself described him as fond of playing at war with the drum, wooden sword, and files of toy soldiers. The pious nuns who taught him recognized a certain gift for figures in styling him their little mathematician. Later when in attendance at the Jesuit school he regularly encountered on his way thither a soldier with whom he exchanged his own piece of white bread for a morsel of the other's coarse commissary loaf. The excuse he gave, according to his mother, was that he must learn to like such food if he were to be a soldier. In time his passion for the simpler mathematics he studied increased to such a degree that she assigned him a rough shed in the rear of their home as a refuge from their disturbing noise of the family. For exercise he walked the streets at nightfall with tumbled hair and disordered clothes. Of French he knew not a word, he had lessons at school in his mother tongue, which he learned to read under the instruction of the Abbe Reco. The worthy teacher arrayed his boys in two bodies, the diligent under the victorious standard of Rome, the idle as vanquished Carthaginians. Napoleon of right belonged to the latter, but he was transferred, not because of merit, by the sheer force of his imperious temper. This scanty information is all the trustworthy knowledge we possess concerning the little Napoleon up to his tenth year. With slight additions from other sources it is substantially the great Napoleon's own account of himself by the mouthpiece partly of his mother in his prosperous days, partly of Antomarchi in that last period of self-examination when, to him, 
as to other men, consistency seems the highest virtue. He was, doubtless, striving to compound with his conscience by emphasizing the adage that the child is father to Theman that he was born what he had always been. In 1775, Corsica had been for six years in the possession of France, and on the surface all was fair. There was, however, a little remnant of faithful patriots left in the island, with whom Paoli and his Spanish friends were still in communication. The royal cabinet, seeking to remove every possible danger of disturbance, even so slight a one as lay in the disaffection of the few scattered nationalists, and in the unconcealed distrust which these felt for their conforming fellow citizens, began a little later to make advances, in order, if possible, to win at least Paoli's neutrality, if not his acquiescence. All in vain. The exile was not to be moved. From time to time, therefore, there was throughout Corsica a noticeable flow in the tide of patriotism. There are indications that the child Napoleon was conscious of this influence, listening probably with intense interest to the sympathetic tales about Paoli and his struggles for liberty which were still told among the people. As to Charles de Bonaparte, some things he had hoped for for Roman annexation were secured. His nobility and official rank were safe, he was in a fair way to reach even higher distinction. But what reign is without wealth? The domestic means were constantly growing smaller, while expenditures increased with the accumulating dignitous and ever growing family. He had made his humble submission to the French, his reception had been warm and graceful. The authorities knew of his pretensions to the estates of his ancestors. The Jesuits had been disgraced and banished, but the much litigated Odon property had not been restored to him, on the contrary. The buildings had been converted into schoolhouses, and the revenues turned into various channels. Years had passed, and it was evident that his suit was hopeless. How could substantial advantage be secured from the king? His friends, General Marbuf in particular, were of the opinion that could profit to a certain extent at least by securing for his children an education at the expense of the state. While it is likely that from the first Joseph was destined for the priesthood, yet Thos' provision for ecclesiastical training under royal patronage as well as for secular, and a transfer from the latter to the former ways easier than the reverse. Both were to be placed at the College of Autun for a preliminary course, whatever their eventual destination might be. The necessary steps were soon taken and in 1776 the formal supplication for the two eldest boys was forwarded to Paris. Immediately the proof of four noble descents was demanded. The movement of letters was slow, that of officials even slower, and the delays in securing copies and authentications of the various documents were long and vexatious. Meantime Choi Isiel had been disgraced, and on May 10, 1774, the old king had died. Louis XVI now reigned. The inertia which marked the brilliant decadence of the Bourbon monarchy was finally overcome. The new social forces were partly emancipated. Facts were examined, and the significance considered. Bankruptcy was no longer a threatening phantom, but a menacing reality of the most serious nature. Retrenchment and reform were the order of the day. Necker was trying his promising schemes. There was, among them, one for a body consisting of delegates from each of the three estates comma nobles, ecclesiastics, and burgesses comma to assist in deciding the troublesome question, the regulation of imposts. The Swiss financier hoped to destroy in this way the sullen, defiant influence of the royal intendants. In Corsica the governor and the intendant both thought themselves too shrewd to be trapped and secure the appointment for Omiach of the Corsican estates of men who were believed by them to be the humble servants. The needy suitor, Charles de Bonaparte, was to be the delegate at Versailles of the nobility. They thought they knew this man in particular, but he was to prove as malleable in France as had been in Corsica. Though nearly penniless, the noble deputy, with the vanity of the bon courtier, was flattered, and accepted the mission, setting out on December 15th, 1778, by way of Italy with his two sons Joseph and Napoleon. With them were Joseph Fesch, appointed to the seminary at Aix, and Vesa, Letitia's cousin, 
who was to be subdeacon at Autun. Joseph and Napoleon both asserted in later life that during their sojourn in Florence, the Grand Duke gave his friend, their father, a letter to his royal sister, Marie Antoinette. As the Grand Duke was at that time in Vienna, the whole account they give of the journey is probably, though perhaps not intentionally, untrue. It was not to the Queen's intercession but to Marbeuf's powerful influence that the final partial success of Charles de Bonaparte's supplication was due. This is clearly proven by the evidence of the archives. To the General's nephew, Bishop of Autun, Joseph, now too old to be received in a royal military school, and later Lucian, were both sent, their former to be educated as a priest. It was probably Marbeuf's influence also combined with a desire to conciliate Corsica, which caused the Herald's office finally to accept the documents attesting the Bonaparte's nobility. It appears that the journey from Corsica through Florence and Marseille had already wrought a marvellous change in the boy. Napoleon's teacher at Autun, the Abbe Chardin, described his pupil as shaving brought with him a sober, thoughtful character. He played with no one, and took his walks alone. In all respects he excelled his brother Joseph. The boys of Autun, says the same authority, on any occasion brought the sweeping charge of cowardice against the inhabitants of Corsica, in order to exasperate him. If they, the French, had been but four to one, was the calm, phlegmatic answer of the ten-year-old boy, they would never have taken Corsica, but when they were ten to one. But you had a fine General Paoli, interrupted the narrator. Yes, sir, was the reply, uttered with an air of discontent, and in the very embodiment of ambition, I should much like to emulate him. The description of the untamed fawn as Hethan appeared is not flattering, his complexion sallow, his hair stiff, his figure slight, his expression lustreless, his manner insignificant. Moreover, his behavior was sullen, and at first, of course, he spoke broken French with an Italian accent. Open mouthed and with sparkling eyes, however, he listened attentively to the first rehearsal of his task, repetition he heartily disliked, and when buked for inattention he coldly replied, Sir, I know that already. On April 21, 1779, Napoleon, according to the evidence of his personal memorandum, left Autun, having been admitted to Brienne, and it was to Marbeuf that in later life he correctly attributed his appointment. After spending three weeks with a school friend, the little fellow entered upon his duties about the middle of May. On New Year's Day, 1779, the Bonapartes had arrived at Autun, and for nearly four months the young Napoleon had been trained in the use of French. He learned to speak fluently, though not correctly, and wrote short themes in a way to satisfy his teacher. Prodigy as he was latter declared to have been, his real progress was slow, the difficulties of that elegant and polished tongue having scarcely been reached, so that it was with a most imperfect knowledge of their language, and a sadly defective pronunciation, that he made his appearance among his future schoolmates. Having, we may suppose, been assigned to the first vacancy that occurred in any of the royal colleges, his first destination had been tin the roughest and most remote of that twelve. But as fortune would have it, a change was somehow made to Brian. That establishment was rude enough. The instructors were many priests, and the life was as severe as it could be made with such a clientage under half-educated and inexperienced monks. In spite of all efforts to the contrary, however, the place had an air of legends, there was a certain schoolboy display proportionate to the means and to the good or bad breeding of the young nobles, also a very keen discrimination among themselves as to rank, social quality, and relative importance. Those familiar with the ruthlessness of boys in th treatment of one another can easily conceive what was the reception of the newcomer, whose nobility was unknown and unrecognized in France and whose means were of the scantiest. Dot. During his son's preparatory studies the father had been busy at Versailles with further supplications among them one for a supplement from the royal purse to his scanty pay as delegate, and another for the speedy settlement of his now notorious claim. The former of that were was granted not merely to M. de Bonaparte, 
but to his two colleagues, in view of the excellent behavior otherwise subserviency of the Corsican delegation at Versailles. When, in addition, the certificate of Napoleon's appointment finally arrived, and the father set out to place his son at school, with a barely proper outfit, he had no difficulty in securing sufficient money to meet his immediate and pressing necessities. Chapter 4. Napoleon's School Days 2. Footnote 2. The authorities for the period are Masson, Napoleon in Coup. Duke La Junus de Napoleon. Jung. Bonaparte et son temps. Bochlink, Napoleon Bonaparte, Saint Jugend und Sen Imporkemen. Las Cases, Memorial de Saint Helene. Antomarchy, Memoirs. Coaston, Premiers Anis de Napoleon, Nazica, Memoirs zur Lenfance et la Junus de Napoleon, Military Schools in France, Napoleon's Initiation into the Life of Brian, Regulations of the School, The Course of Study, Napoleon's powerful friends, his reading and other avocations, his comrades, his studies, his precocity, his conduct and scholarship, the change in his life plan, his influence in his family, his choice of the artillery service. Side note, 1779-84. It was an old charge that the sons of poor gentlemen destined to be artillery officers were bred like princes. The institution at Brienne, with eleven other similar academies, had been but recently founded as a protest against the luxury which had reigned in the military school at Paris and La Flèque. Both these had been closed for a time because Ithi could not be reformed. The latter was, however, one of the twelve from the first, and that at Paris was afterward reopened as a finishing school. The monasteries of various religious orders were recosen as seats of the new colleges and their owners were put in charge with instructions to secure simplicity of life and manners, their formation of character, and other desirable benefits, each one in its own way in the school or schools entrusted to it. The result so far had been a failure, there were simply not twelve first-rate instructors in each branch to be found in France for the new positions, the instruction was therefore limited and poor so that in the intellectual stagnation the right standards of conduct declined, while the old notions of hollow courtliness and conventional behavior flourished as never before. In order to enter his boy at Brienne, Charles de Bonaparte presented a certificate signed by the intendant and two neighbors, that he could not educate his sons without help from the king, and was a poor man, having no income except his salary as assessor. This paper was countersigned by Marbiuf as commanding general, and to him the request was formally granted. This being thrugular procedure, it is evident that all the young nobles of that world schools enjoying the royal bounty were poor and should have had little or no pocket money. Perhaps for this very reason, though the school provided for every expense including pocket money, polished manners and funds obtained surreptitiously from powerful friends signed different to rules were the things most needed to secure kind treatment for an entering boy. These were exactly what the young gentleman scholar from Corsica did not possess. The ignorant and unworldly minim fathers could neither foreseen nor, if they had foreseen, alleviate the miseries incident to his arrival under such conditions. Tortun Napoleon had at least enjoyed the sympathetic society of his mild and emotional brother, whose easy-going nature could smooth many a rough place. He was now entirely without companionship, resenting from the outset both the ill-natured attacks and the playful person illusions through which boys so often begin, and with time knit have more firmly, their inexplicable friendships. To the taunts about Corsica which began immediately he answered coldly, I hope one day to be in a position to give Corsica her liberty. Entering on a certain occasion a room in which unknown to him the hung a portrait of the hated Choi Isule, he started back as he caught sight of it and burst into bitter revilings, for this he was compelled to undergo chastisement. Brian was a nursery for the qualities first developed at Autun. The building was a gloomy and massive structure of the early 18th century, which stood on a commanding site at the entrance of the town, flanked by a later addition somewhat more commodious. The dormitory consisted of two long rows of cells opening on a double corridor, about a hundred and forty in all, 
Each of these chambers was six feet square, and contained a folding bed, a pitcher and a basin. The pupil was locked in at bedtime, his only means of communication being able to arouse the guard who slept in the hall. Larger rooms were provided for his toilet, and he studied where he recited, in still Lana for sweet. There was a common refectory in which four simple meals a day were served, for breakfast and luncheon, bread and water, with fruit either fresh or stewed, for dinner, soup with the soup meat, a side dish and dessert, for supper, a joined with salad or dessert. With last two was served a mild mixture of wine and water, known in school slang as abundance. The outfit of clothing comprised underwear for two changes a week, a uniform consisting of a blue cloth coat, faced and trimmed with red, a waistcoat of the same with white rivers, and serge breeches either blue or black. The overcoat was of the same material as the uniform, with the same trimming but with white lining. The studies comprised Latin, mathematics, the French language and literature, English, German, geography, drawing, fencing, music, vocal as well as instrumental, and dancing. Illustration, in the Museum of Versailles. Marie Letitia Ramolino Bonaparte Madame Ear Mother of Napoleon I. Perhaps the severe regimen of living could have been mitigated and brightened by a course of study nominally and ostensibly so rich and full, but in the list of masters, lay and clerical, there is not a name of eminence. Neither Napoleon nor his contemporary pupils recalled in later years any portion of their work as stimulating, nor any instructor as having excelled in ability. The boys seem to have disliked heartily both their studies and their masters. Young Bonaparte had likewise a distaste for society and was thrown upon his own unaided resources to satisfy his eager mind. Undisciplined in spirit, he was impatient of self-discipline and worked spasmodically in such subjects as he liked, disdaining the severe training of his mind, even by himself. He did learn to spell the foreign tongue of his adopted country, but his handwriting, never good, was bad or worse, according to circumstances dark, solitary, and untamed. The new scholar assumed the indifference of wounded vanity, despised dull pastimes, and found delight either in books or in scornful exasperation of his comrades when compelled to associate with them. There were quarrels and bitter fights, in which the Ishmaelite's hand was against every other. Sometimes in a kind of frenzy he inflicted serious wounds on his fellow students. At length even the teach smocked him and deprived him of his position as captain in the school battalion. The climax of the miserable business was reached when to a taunt that his ancestry was nothing, his father a wretched tipstaff, Napoleon replied by challenging his tormentor to fight a duel. For this offence he was put in confinement while the instigator went unpunished. It was by the intervention of Marbiuf that his young friend was at length released. Bruised and wounded in spirit, the boy would gladly have shaken the dust of Brian from his feet, but necessity forbade. Dot either from some direct communication Napoleon had with his protector, or through a dramatic but unauthenticated letter purporting to have he been written by him to his friends in Corsica and still in existence, Marbiuf learned that the chiefest cause of all the bitterness was thin quality between the pocket allowances of the young French noble Achan that of the young Corsican. The kindly general displayed the liberality of a family friend, and gladly increased the boy's gratuity, administering at the same time a smart rebuke to him for his readiness to take offence. He is likewise thought to have introduced Edis Young charged them. Le Meni de Brienne, whose mansion was nearby. 3. This noble woman, it is asserted, became a second mother to the lonely child, though there were no vacations yet long holidays numerous and these were passed with her, her tenderness softened his rude nature, the more so as she knew the value of tips to a schoolboy, and administered them liberally though judiciously. Footnote 3, the sources of these statements are two letters of 5th of April, 1781, and 8th of October, 1783, first printed in the Memoirs Zur la vie de Bonaparte, etc., etc. Parlicum to Charles Dog. This pseudonym covers a still unknown author, 
the documents have been for the most part considered genuine and have been reprinted as such by many authorities. Including Jung. Though this author was an official in the Ministry of War and had its archives at his disposal, he gives one letter without any authority and the other as in the archives de la guerre. Many searchers, including the writer, have sought them there without result. Latterly their authenticity has been denied on the ground of inherent improbability, since pocket money was by rule almost unknown in the royal colleges, and Corsican homesickness is as common as that of the Swiss. But rules prove nothing and the letters seem inherently genuine. Nor was this, if true, the only light among the shadows in the picture of his later Brian school days. Each of the 150 pupils had a small garden spot assigned to him. Bonaparte developed a passion for his own, and, annexing by force the neglected plots of his two neighbors, created for himself a retreat, the solitude of which was ensured by a thick and lofty hedge planted about it. To the citadel, the sanctity of which he protected with a fury at times half insane, he was wont to retire in the fair weather of all seasons, with whatever books he could procure. In the companionship of these he passed happy, pleasant, and fruitful hours. His youthful patriotism had been intensified by the hatred he now felt for French schoolboys, and through them for France. I can never forgive my father, he on sec cried, for the share he had in uniting Corsica to France. Paola became his hero, and the favorite subjects of his reading were the mighty deeds of men and peoples especially in antiquity. Such matter found abundant in Plutarch's lives. Moreover, his punishments and degradation by the school authorities at once created a sentiment in his favor among his companions, which not only counteracted the effect of official penalties, but gave him a sort of compensating leadership in their games. When driven by storms to abandon his garden haunt, and to associate in the public hall with other boys, he often instituted sports in which opposing camps of Greeks and Persians, or of Romans and Carthaginians, fought until Thupro brought down the authorities to end the conflict. On any occasion he proposed the game, common enough elsewhere, but not so familiar then in France, of building snow forts, of storming and defending them, and of fighting with snowballs as weapons. The proposition was accepted and the preparations were made under his direction with scientific zeal. The entrenchments, forts, bastions, and redoubts were the admiration of the neighborhood. For weeks the mimic warfare went on, Bonaparte, always in command, being sometimes the besieger and as often the besieged. Such was the aptitude, such the resources, and such the commanding power which he showed in either role, that the winter was always remembered in the annals of the school. Of all his contemporaries, only two became men of mark, Gdan and Nance Auti. Both were capable soldiers, receiving promotions and titles at Napoleon's hand during the empire. Bourienne, having sunk to the lowest depths under the Republic, found employment as secretary of General Bonaparte. In this position, he continued until the consulate when he lost both fortune and reputation in doubtful money speculations. From old affection he secured pardon and further employment, being sent as minister to Hamburg. There his lust for money wrought his final ruin. The treacherous memoirs which shipped over his name are a compilation edited by him to obtain the means of livelihood in his declining years. Throughout life Napoleon had the kindliest feelings for Brian and all connected with it. In his death struggle on the battlefields of Champagne he showed favor to the tone and left it a large legacy in his will. No schoolmate or master appealed to him in vain, and many of his comrades were in their iron significant lives dependent for existence on his favor. It is a trite remark that diamonds can be polished only by diamond dust. Whatever the rude processes were to which the rude nature of the young Corsican was subjected, the result was remarkable. Latin he disliked, and treated with disdainful neglect. His particular aptitudes were for mathematics, for geography, and above all for history, in which he made fair progress. His knowledge of mathematics was never profound, in geography he displayed a remarkable and excellent memory, 
biography was the department of history which fascinated him. In all directions, however, he was quick in his perceptions, the rapid maturing of his mind by reading and reflection was evident to all his associates, hostile though they were. The most convincing evidence of the fact will be found in a letter written, probably in July, 1784, when he was fifteen years old, to an uncle comma possibly fesh, more likely paravicini comma concerning family matters. For, his brother Joseph had gone to Autun to be educated for the church, his sister, Maria Anna, Elisa had been appointed on the royal foundation at St. Cyril, and Lucien was, if possible, to be placed like Napoleon at Brienne. The two younger children had already accompanied their father on his regular journey to Versailles, and Lucien was now installed either in the school itself or nearby, to be in readiness for any vacancy. All was well with the rest, except that Joseph was uneasy, and wished to become an officer too. Footnote 4, Ducasse, Supplement à la correspondence de Napoleon Earth, Volume X, p. 50. Masson, I, 1784. The tone of Napoleon is extraordinary. Opening with a commonplace a little sketch of Lucien such as any elder brother might draw of Aunja, he proceeds to an analysis of Joseph which is remarkable. Searching and thorough, it explains with fullness of reasoning and illustration how much more advantageous from the worldly point of view both for Joseph and for the family would be a career in the church, the Bishop of Autun would bestow a fat living on him, and he wash himself sure of becoming a bishop. As an underscore abite dictum underscore it contains a curious expression of contempt for infantry as an arm. The origin of which feeling is by no means clear. Joseph wishes to be a soldier very well, but in what branch of the profession? He could not enter the navy, for he knows no mathematics, nor is his doubtful health suited to that career. He would have to study two years more for the navy, and four if he were to be an engineer. However, the ceaseless occupation of this arm of the service would be more than his strength could endure. Similar reasons militate against the artillery. Three mains, therefore, only the infantry. Good. I see. He wants to be all day idle, he wants to march the streets all day, and besides, what is a slim infantry office? A poor thing, three quarters of the time semicolon and that, neither my dear father nor you nor my mother, nor my dear uncle the archdeacon, desires, for he has already shown some slight tendency to folly and extravagance. There is an utter absence of loose talk, or of enthusiasm, and no allusion to principle or sentiment. It is the work of a cold, calculating, and dictatorial nature. There is a poetical quotation in it, very apt, but very badly spelled, and while the expression throughout is fair, it is by no means what might be expected from a person capable of such thought, who had been studying French for three years, and using it exclusively in daily life. In August, 1783, Bonaparte and Bourienne, according to the statement of the latter, shared the first prize in mathematics, and soon afterward, in the same year, a royal inspector, M. de Carelio, arrived at Brian to test the progress of the king's wards. He took a great fancy to the little Bonaparte, and declaring that, though soon acquainted with his family, he found a spark in him which must not be extinguished, wrote an emphatic recommendation of the lad, couched in the following terms, M. de Bonaparte, Napoleon, born August 15, 1769. Height, 4 feet 10 inches 10 lines about five feet three inches, English. Constitution, excellent health, docile disposition, mild, straightforward, thoughtful. Conduct most satisfactory, has always been distinguished for his application in mathematics. He is fairly well acquainted with history and geography. He is weak in all accomplishments drawing, dancing, music, and the like. This boy would make an excellent sailor, deserves to be admitted to the school in Paris. Unfortunately for the prospect, M. de Carelio, who might have been a powerful friend, died almost immediately. By means of further genuflections, supplications, and wearisome persistency, 
Charles de Bonaparte at last obtained favor not only for Lucien, but for Joseph also. Deprived unjustly of his inheritance, deprived also of his comforts and his home in pursuit of the ambition who seems rendered necessary by that wrong, the poor diplomatist was now near the end of his resources and his energy. Except for the short visit of his father at Brienne on his way to Paris, it is our most certain that the young Napoleon saw none of his elders throughout his sojourn in the former place. The event was most important to the boy and opened the pent up flood of his tenderness, it was therefore a bitter disappointment when he learned that, having seen the royal physician, his parent would return to Corsica by autumn, taking Joseph with him, and would not stop at Brienne. Napoleon, by the advice of Marbeuf and more definitely by the support of his friend Inspector, had been designated for the navy, through the favor of the latter he hoped to have been sent to Paris, and thence assigned to Toulon, the naval port in closest connection with Corsica. There were so many influential applications, however, for that favorite branch of the service that the department must rid itself of as many as possible, a youth without a patron would be the first to suffer. The agreement which the father had made at Paris was, therefore, that Napoleon, by way of compensation, might continue at Brienne, while Joseph could either go thither, or to Metz, in order to make up his deficiencies in the mathematical sciences and pass his examinations to enter the royal service along with Napoleon, on condition that the latter would renounce his plans for the navy and choose a career in the army. The letter in which the boy communicates his decision to his father is as remarkable as the one just mentioned and very clearly the sequel to it. The anxious and industrious parent had finally broken down, and in his feeble health had taken Joseph as a support and help on Theodore's homeward journey. With the same succinct, unsparing statement as before, Napoleon confesses his disappointment, and in commanding phrase, with logical analysis, lays down the reasons why Joseph must come to Brian instead of going to Metz. There is, however, a new element in the composition a frank, hearty expression of affection for his family, and a message of kindly remembrance to his friends. But the most striking fact, in view of subsequent developments, is a request for Boswell's history of Corsica, and any other histories or memoirs relating to that kingdom. I will bring them back when I return, if it be six years from now. 5. The immediate sequel make us clear the direction of his mind. He probably did not remember that he was preparing, if possible, to strip France of her latest and high literish acquisition at her own cost, or if he did, he must have felt like the archer pluming his arrow from the off-cast feathers of his victim's wing. It is plain that his humiliations at school, his studies in the story of liberty, his inherited bent, and the present dies appointment, were all cumulative in the result of fixing his attention on his native land as the destined sphere of his activity. Footnote 5, this letter, which is without date, is printed in Coston, as taken from the newspapers, again in a revised form in Nazica, Memoirs zur l'Enfance et la Junus de Napoleon, p. 71, who claimed to have collated it with the original, and again in Jung, Bonaparte et son temps, who gives us his reference, Archives de la Guerre, preserving exactly the form given by Nazica. The Napoleon papers of the War Department were freely, and I believe entirely, put into my hands for examination. This letter was not among them, in fact, my efforts to confirm the references of Jung were sadly ineffectual. Four days after the probable date of writing he passed his examination a second time, before the new inspector, announced his choice of the artillery as his branch of the service, and a month later was ordered to the military academy in Paris. This institution had not merely been restored to its former renown, it now enjoyed a special reputation as the place of reward to which only the foremost candidates for official honors were sent. The choice of artillery seems to have been reached by a simple process of exclusion, the infantry was too unintellectual and indolent, the cavalry too expensive and aristocratic, between the engineers and the artillery there was little to choose in neither did wealth or influence control promotion. The decision seems to have fallen as it did because the artillery was accidentally mentioned first in the fatal letter he had received announcing the familiar straits, 
and the necessary renunciation of the navy. On the certificate which was sent up with Napoleon from Brienne was the note, character masterful, imperious, and headstrong. Chapter 5. In Paris and Valence 6. Footnote 6. Authorities as before for this and the five chapters following, Introduction to Paris, Teachers and Comrades, Death of Charles de Bonaparte, His Merits, The School at Paris, Napoleon's Poverty, His Character at the Close of His School Years, Appointed Lieutenant in the Regiment of Lafayette, Demoralization of the French Army, The Men in the Ranks, Napoleon as a Beau, Return to Study, His Profession and Vocation. Side note, 1784 86. It was on October 30, 1784, that Napoleon left Brienne for Paris. 7. He was in the 16th year of his age, entirely ignorant of what were then called the humanities, but fairly versed in history, geography, and the mathematical sciences. His knowledge, like the bent of his mind, was practical rather than theoretical and Heck knew more about fortification and sieges than about metaphysical abstractions, more about the deeds of history than about his philosophy. The new surroundings into which he was introduced by the Minim father who had accompanied him and his four comrades from Brienne, all somewhat younger than himself, were different indeed from those of the rude convent he had left behind. The splendid palace constructed on the plans of Gabriel early in the 18th century still stands to attest the king's design of lodging his gentlemen cadets in a style worthy of their high birth, and of educating them in manners as well as of instructing them. The domestic arrangements had been on a par with the regal lodgings of the corps. So far had matters gone in the direction of elegance and luxury that as we have said the establishment was closed but it had been reopened within a few months, about the end of 1777. While the worst abuses had been corrected, yet still the food was, in quantity at least, lavish, Thea provided two uniforms complete each year, with underwear sufficient for two changes a week, what was then considered a great luxury, there was a great staff of liveried servants and the Uysers in charge were men of polished manners and of the highest distinction. At the very close of his life Napoleon recalled the arrangements as made for men of wealth. We were fed and served splendidly, treated altogether like officers, enjoying a greater competence than most over families, greater than most of us were destined to enjoy. At sixteen and with his inexperience he was perhaps an incompetent judge. Others, Vorblanc for example, thought there was more show than substance. Footnote 7, this is the date given by himself on the slip of paper headed Epochs de Marvie and contained in the fresh papers, now deposited in the Laurentian library at Florence. Here and there the text is very difficult to decipher, but the line party pour l'école de Paris, le 30 October 1784 inches is perfectly legible. Last cases, in the memorial, volume I, p. 160, represents Napoleon as quoting Carilio in declaring that it was not for his birth or his attainments but for the qualities he discerned in the boy that he sent him with imperfect preparation to Paris. Be that as it may, Bonaparte's defiant scorn and habits of solitary study grew stronger together. It is asserted that his humor found vent in a preposterous and peevish memorial addressed to the Minister of War on the proper training of the pupils in French military schools. He may have written it, but it is almost impossible that it should ever have passed beyond the walls of the school, even, as is claimed, for revision by a former teacher, Burton. Nevertheless he found almost, if not altogether, for the first time a real friend in Theperson of Damasis, a youth noble by birth and nature, who was assigned to him as a pupil teacher, and was moreover a foundation scholar like himself. It is also declared by various authorities that from time to time he enjoyed the agreeable society of the Bishop of Autun, who was now at Versailles, of his sister Eliza at St. Cyr, and, toward the very close, of a family friend who had just settled in Paris, the beautiful M. Perman, mother of the future Duchess of Urbrandt. Although born in Corsica, she belonged to a branch of the noble Greek family of the Comnai. In view of the stringent regulations both of the military school and of St. Cyr, these visits are problematical, 
though not impossible. Rigid as were the regulations of the royal establishments, their enforcement depended, of course, on the character of their directors. The Marquis who presided over the military school was a veteran placeholder, his assistant was a man of no force, and the director of studies was the only conscientious official of the three. He knew his charge thoroughly and was recognized by Napoleon in later years as a man of worth. The course of studies was a continuation of that at Brienne, and there were 21 instructors in the various branches of mathematics, history, geography, and languages. Dulles Gill endorsed one of Bonaparte's exercises in history with the remark, Corsican by nation and character. He will go far if circumstances favor. De Maillon said of his French style that it was granite heated in a volcano. There were admirable masters, seven in number, for riding, fencing, and dancing. In none of these exercises did Bonaparte excel. It was the avowed purpose of the institution to make Heights pupils pious Roman Catholics. The parish priest at Brienne had administered the sacraments to a number of the boys, including Theon Corsican, who appears to have submitted without cavil to the severe religious training of the Paris school, chapel with Mass at half past six in the morning, grace before and after all meals, and chapel again a quarter before nine in the evening, on holidays, catechism for new students, Sundays, catechism and high mass, and vespers with confession every Saturday, communion every two months. Long afterwards the emperor remembered de Jew in, his chaplain, with kindness and overwhelmed him with favors. Of the hundred and thirty-two scholars resident during Bonaparte's time, eighty-three year boarders at four hundred dollars each, none of these attain their distinction, the majority did not even pass their examinations. Thrist were scholars of the king, and were diligent, but even of these only one or two were really able men. It was in the city of M. Perman's residence, at Montpellier, that on 24th of February, 1785, Charles de Bonaparte died. This was apparently a final and mortal blow to the Bonaparte fortunes, for it seemed as if with the father must go all the family expectations. The circumstances were a fit close to the life thus ended. Feeling his shelf somewhat restored, and despairing of further progress in the settlement of his well-worn claim by legal methods, he had determined and still another journey of solicitation to Versailles. With Joseph as a companion he started, but a serious relapse occurred at sea, and sure the painful disease continued to make such ravages that the father and son set out for Montpellier to consult the famous specialists of the medical faculty at that place. It was in vain, and, after some weeks, on February 24 the heartbroken father breathed his last. Having learned to hate the Jesuits, he had become indifferent to all religion, and is said by some to have repelled with his last exertions the kindly services of Fesch, who was now a frocked priest, and had hastened to his brother-in-law's bedside too for the final consolations of the church to a dying man. Others declare that he turned again to the solace of religion, and was attended on his deathbed by the abbeks too. Joseph, prostrated by grief, was taken into M. Perman's house and received the tenderest consolation. 8, footnote 8, Memoirs du ROI Joseph, I, 29. Failure as the ambitious father had been, he had nevertheless been so far the support of his family in their hopes of advancement. Sycophant and schemer as he had become, they recognized his untiring energy in three half, and truly loved him. He left them penniless and in debt, but he died in their service, and they sincerely mourned for him. On the 23rd of March the sorrowing boy wrote to his great uncle, the Archdeacon Lucian, our letter in eulogy of his father and begging the support of his uncle as guardian. This appointment was legal I made not long after. On the 28th he wrote to his mother. Both these letters are in existence, and sound like rhetorical school exercises corrected by a tutor. That to his mother is, however, dignified and affectionate, referring in a becoming spirit to the support her children owed her. As if to show what a thorough child he still was, the dreary little note closes with an odd postscript giving the relevant news of the birth, two days earlier, of a royal prince the Duke of Normandy.
This may have been added for the benefit of the censor who examined all the correspondence of the young men. Some time before, General Marbuf had married, and the pecuniary supplies to his boyfriend seem after that event to have stopped. De Bonaparte was left with four infant children, the youngest, Jerome, but three months old. Their great uncle, Lucian, the archdeacon, was kind, and Joseph, abandoning all his ambitions, returned to be, if possible, the support of the family. Napoleon's poverty was no longer relative or imaginary, but real and hard. Drawing more closely than ever within himself, he became a still more reared and reader and student, devoting himself with passionate industry to examining the works of Rousseau, the poison of whose political doctrines instilled itself with fiery and grateful stinging into the thin, cold blood of the unhappy cadet. In many respects the instruction he received was admirable, and there is a traditional anecdote that he was the best mathematician in the school. But on the whole he profited little by the short continuation of his studies at Paris. The marvelous French style which he finally created for himself is certainly unacademic in the highest degree, in the many courses of modern languages he mastered neither German nor English, in fact he never had more than a few words of either. His attainments in fencing and horsemanship were very slender. Among all his comrades he made Ptone friend while two of them became in later life his embittered foes. Philippux thwarted him at Acre, Picard at Bekerjuk became Schwarzenberg's most trusted advisor in the successful campaigns of Austria against France. Whether to alleviate as soon as possible the miseries of his destitution, or, as has been charged, to be rid of their querulous and exasperating inmate, the authorities of the military school shortened Bonaparte's stay to the utmost of their ability and admitted him to examination in August, 1785, less than a year from his admission. 9 He passed with no distinction, being 42nd in rank, but above his friend de Mazes, who was 56th. His appointment, therefore, was due to an entire absence of rivalry, the young nobility having no predilection for the arduous duties of service in the artillery. He was eligible merely because he had passed the legal age, and had given evidence of sufficient acquisitions. In an oft-quoted scription, 10, purporting to be an official certificate given to the young officer on leaving, he is characterized as reserved and industrious, preferring study to any kind of amusement, delighting in good authors, diligent in the abstract sciences, caring little for the authors. 11 thoroughly trained in mathematics and geography, quiet, fond of solitude, capricious, haughty, extremely inclined to egotism, speaking little, energetic in his replies, prompt and severe en repartee, having much self-esteem, ambitious and aspiring to annihilate, the youth is worthy of protection. There is, unfortunately, no documentary evidence to sustain the genuineness of this report, but wait for its origin it is so nearly contemporary that it probably contains some truth. Footnote 9, the examiner in mathematics was the great Laplace, footnote 10, taken from the apocryphal memoirs of the Count Dog. Previously mentioned, C. Masson, Napoleon in Q, I, 123, Duke, I, 260, Jung, I, 125, footnote 11, last cases, I, 112. Napoleon confessed his inability to learn German, but prided himself on his historical knowledge. The two friends had both asked for appointments in a regiment stationed at Valence. Known by the style of Lafayette. Dame Aziz had Abro there in it. The ardent young Corsican would be nearer his native land, and might, perhaps, be detached for service in his home. They were both nominated in September, but the appointment was not made until the close of October. Bonaparte was reduced to utter penury by the long delay, his only resource being the 200 livres provided by the funds of the school for each of its pupils until they reached the grade of captain. It was probably, and according to the generally received account, at his comrade's expense, and in his company, that he travelled. Their slender funds were exhausted by boyish dissipation at Lyon, 
and they measured on foot the long legs thence to their destination, arriving at Valence early in November. The growth of absolutism in Europe had been due at the outset to the employment of standing armies by the kings, and the consequent alliance between the crown, which was the paymaster, and the people, who furnished the soldiery. There was constant conflict between the crown and the nobility concerning privilege, constant friction between the nobility and the people in the survivals of feudal relation. This chuddy and wholesome contention among the three estates ended at last in the victory of the kings. In time, therefore, the army became no longer a mere support to the monarchy, but a portion of its moral agonism, sharing its virtues and its vices, its weakness and its strength reflecting, as in a mirror, the true condition of the state he so far as it was personified in the king. The French army, in the year 1785, was in a sorry plight. With the consolidation of classes in an old monarchical society, it had come to pass that, under the prevailing voluntary system, none but men of the lowest social stratum would enlist. Barracks and camps became schools of vice. Is there? exclaimed one who at a later day was active in the work of army reform is there a father who does not shudder when abandoning his son, not to the chances of war, but to the associations of a crowd of scoundrels a thousand times more dangerous? We have already had a glimpse of the character of the officers. Their first thought was social position and pleasure, duty and the practice of their profession being considerations of almost vanishing importance things were quite as bad in the central administration. Neither the organization nor the equipment nor the commissariat was in condition to ensure accuracy or promptness in the working of the machine. The regiment of Lafayette was but a sample of the whole. Dancing three times a week, says the advertisement for recruits, rackets twice, and the rest of the time skittles, prisoners base, and drill. Pleasures reign, every man has the highest pay and all air you will treated. Bonaparte is income, comprising his pay of eight hundred, his provincial allowance of a hundred and twenty, and the school pension of two hundred, amounted, all told, to eleven hundred and twenty livres a year. His necessary expenses for board and lodging were seven hundred and twenty, leaving less than thirty-five livres a month, about seven dollars, for clothes and pocket money. Fifteen years as lieutenant, fifteen as captain, and, for the rest of his life, half pay with a decoration. Such was the summary of the prospect for the ordinary commonplace officer in a like situation. Meantime, he was comfortably lodged with a kindly old soul, a sumptuative and keeper named Boo, whose daughter, of a certain age, gave a mother's care to the young lodger. In his weary years of exile, the emperor recalled his service at Valence as invaluable. The artillery regiment of Lafayette he said was unsurpassed in personnel and training semicolon though the officers were too old for efficiency, they were loyal and fatherly, the youngsters exercised their witty sarcasm on many, but he loved them all. During the first months of his garrison service Bonaparte, as an apprentice, saw arduous service in matters of detail, but he threw off entirely the darkness and reserve of his character, taking a full draught from the brimming cup of pleasure. On January 10, 1786, Fuels finally received to full standing as lieutenant. The novelty, the absence of restraint, the comparative emancipation from the arrogancy and slights to which he had hitherto been subject, good news from the family in Corsica, whose hopes as to the inheritance were once more high all these elements combined to intoxicate for a time the boy of sixteen. The strongest will cannot forever repress the exuberant soft budding manhood. There were balls, and with them the first experience of gallantry. The young officer even took dancing lessons. Moreover, in the drawing rooms of the Abbey St. Riff and of his friends, for the first time he saw the manners and heard the talk of refined society provincial, to be sure, but excellent. It was to the special favour of Monsignor de Marbuf, the Bishop of Autun, that he owed his swam reception. The acquaintances there made were with persons of local consequence, who in later years reaped a rich harvest for their condescension to the young stranger. In two excellent households he was a welcome and intimate guest, that of Lawbury and Columbia. The were daughters in both. 
his acquaintance with Mel. Delorbury was that of one who respected her character and appreciated her beauty. In 1805 she was appointed lady-in-waiting to the Empress, but declined the appointment because of her duties as wife and mother. In the intimacy with Mel. Du Columbia there was more coquetry. She was a year the senior and lived on her mother's estate some miles from Thetown. Rousseau had made fashionable long walks and life in the open. The frequent visits of Napoleon to Caroline were marked by youthful gaiety and budding love. They spent many innocent hours in the field sound garden of the chateau and parted with regret. Their friendship lasted even after she became de Bressiux, and they corresponded intimately for long years. Of his fellow officers he saw but little. Though he ate regularly at the table of the three pigeons where Thiele Utenants had their mess. This was not because they were distant, but because he had no genius for good fellowship, and the habit of indifference to his comrades had grown strong upon him. The period of pleasure was not long. It is impossible to judge whether the little self indulgence was a weak relapse from an iron purpose or part of a definite plan. The former is more likely. So abrupt and apparently conscience stricken was the return to labor. Heiss inclinations and his earnest help were combined in the longing for Corsica. 12. It was a bitter disappointment that under the army regulations he must serve a year as second lieutenant before leave could be granted. As if to compensate himself and still his longings for home and family, he sought the companionship of a young Corsicanatist named Pontorninai, then living at Turnon a few miles distant. To this friendship we owe the first authentic portrait of Bonaparte. It exhibits a striking profile with a well-shaped mouth, and the expression of gravity is remarkable in a sitter so young. The face portrays a studious mind. Even during the months from November to April he had not entirely deserted his favorite studies, and again Rousseau had been their companion and guide. In a little study of Corsica, dated the 26th of April, 1786, the earliest of his manuscript papers, he refers to the social contract of Rousseau with approval, and the last sentence is, thus the Corsicans were able, in obedience to all the laws of justice, to shake off the yoke of Genoa, and can do likewise with that of the French. Amen. But in the spring it was the then famous but since forgotten Abbe Raynal of whom he became a devotee. At the first blush it seems as if Bonaparte's studies were irregular and haphazard. It is customary to attribute slender powers of observation and undefined purposes to childhood and youth. The opinion may be correct in the main, and would, for the matter of that, be true as regards the great mass of adults. But the more we know of psychology through autobiographies, the more certain it appears that many a great life plan has been formed in childhood and carried through with unbending rigor to the end. Whether Bonaparte consciously ordered the course of his study in reading or not, there is unity in it from first to last. After the first true beginnings there were two nearly parallel lines in his work. The first was the acquisition of what was essential to the practice of a profession nothing more. No one could be a soldier in either army or navy without a practical knowledge of history and geography for the earth and its inhabitants are in a special sense the elements of military activity. Nor can towns be fortified, nor camps entrenched, nor any of the manifold duties of the general in the field be performed without the science of quantity and numbers. Just these things, and just so far as they were practical, the dark, ambitious boy was willing to learn. For spelling, grammar, rhetoric, and philosophy he had no care neither he nor his sister Eliza, that were strong natures of the family, could ever spell any language with accuracy and ease, or speak and write with rhetorical elegance. Among the private papers of his youth there is but one mathematical study of any importance, the rest are either trivial, or have some practical bearing on the problems of gunnery. When at Brienne, his patron had certified that he cared nothing for accomplishments and had none. This was the case to the end. But there was another branch of knowledge equally practical, but at that time necessary to so few that it was neither taught nor learned in the schools the art of politics. Chapter 6. Private Study and Garrison Life. Napoleon as a student of politics, nature of Rousseau's political teachings, the Abbe Raynal, 
Napoleon aspires to be the historian of Corsica, Napoleon's first love, his notions of political science, the books he read, Napoleon at Lyon, his transfer to Dwy, a victim to melancholy, return to Corsica. Side note, 1786-87. In one sense it is true that the first emperor of the French was a man if no agent of no country, in another sense he was, as few have he been, the child of his surroundings and of his time. The study of politics was his own notion, the matter and method of the study were reconditioned by his relations to the thought of Europe in the 13th century. He evidently hoped that his military and political attainments would one day meet in the culmination of a grand career. To the world and probably to himself, it seemed as if the glorious period of the consulate were the realization of this hope. Those years of his life which so appear were, in fact, the least successful. The unsoundness of his political instructors, and the temper of the age, combined to thwart this ambitious purpose and render unavailing Alice achievements. Rousseau had every fascination for the young of that time a captivating style, persuasive logic, the sentiment of a poet, the intensity of a prophet. A native of Corsica would be doubly drawn to him by his interest in that romantic island. Sitting at the feet of such a teacher, a young scholar would learn through convincing argument the evils of a passing social state as they were not exhibited elsewhere. He would discern the dangers of ecclesiastical authority, of feudal privilege, of absolute monarchy, he would see the disastrous influence in the prostitution, not only of social, but of personal morality, he would become familiar with the necessity for renewing institutions as the only means of regenerating society. All these lessons would have a value not to be exaggerated. On the other hand, when it came to the substitution of positive teaching for negative criticism, he would learn nothing of value and much that was most dangerous. In utter disregard of a sound historical method, Thos set up as the cornerstone of the new political structure a fiction of the most treacherous kind. Bonaparte in his notes, written as he read, shows his contempt for it in an admirable refutation of the fundamental error of Rousseau as to the state of nature by his mark. I believe man in the state of nature had the same power of sensation and reason which he now has. But if he did not accept their premises, there was a portion of the conclusion which he took with avidity, the most dangerous point in all Rousseau's system, namely, the doctrine that all power proceeds from the people, not because of the nature and their historical organization into families and communities, but because of an agreement by individuals to secure a public order and that, consequently, the consent given they can withdraw, the order they have created they can destroy. In this lay not merely the germ, but the whole system of extreme radicalism, the essence, the substance, and the sum of the French Revolution on its extreme and doctrinaire side. Rousseau had been the prophet and forerunner of the new social dispensation. The scheme for applying its principles is found in a walk which bears the name of a very mediocre person, the Abbe Raynal, a man who enjoyed in his day an extended and splendid reputation Wykno seems to have had only the slender foundations of unmerited persecution and the friendship of superior men. In 1770 appeared anonymously a volume, of which, as was widely known, he was the compiler. The philosophical and political history of the establishments and commerce of the Europeans in the two Indies is a miscellany of extracts from many sources, and of short essays by Reynolds' brilliant acquaintances, on superstition, tyranny, and similar themes. The reputed author had written for the public prints, and had published several works, none of which attracted attention. The amazing success of this one was not remarkable if, as some critics now believe, at least a third of the text was by Diderot. However this may be, the position of Reynal as a man of letters immediately became a foremost one and such was the vogue of a second edition published over his name in 1780 that the authorities became alarmed. The climax to his renown was achieved when, in 1781, his book was publicly burned, and the compiler fled into exile. By 1785 the storm had finally subsided, and though he had not yet returned to France, it is supposed that through the friendship of M. du Columbia, the friendly patroness of the young lieutenant, 
communication was opened between the great man and his aspiring Greda. 13, not yet 18, are the startling words in the letter, written by Bonaparte, I am a writer, it is the age when we must learn. Will my boldness subject me to your raillery? No, I am sure. If indulgence be a mark of true genius, you should have much indulgence. I enclose chapters 1 and 2 of our history of Corsica, with an outline of the rest. If you approve, I will go on, if you advise me to stop, I will go no further. The young historian's letter teems with bad spelling and bad grammar, but it is saturated with the spirit of his age. The chapters as they came to Reynolds' hands are not in existence so far as is known, and posterity can never judge how monumental their author's assurance was. The abbe's reply was kindly, but he advised the novice to complete his researches, and then to rewrite his pieces. Bonaparte was not unwilling to profit by the counsels he received, soon after, in July, 1786, he gave two orders to Geneva's bookseller, one for the books concerning Corsica, another for the memoirs of M. de Warens and her servant Claude in it, which are a sort of supplement to Rousseau's confessions. Footnote 13, Masson, Napoleon in Coup, Volume I, p. 160, denies all the statements of this paragraph. He likewise proves to his own satisfaction that Bonaparte was neither in Lyon nor in Douai at this time. The narrative here given is based on Coston and on Jung, who follows the former in his reprint of the documents, giving the very dubious reference, MSS. Archives de la Guerre. Although these manuscripts could not be found by me, I am not willing to discard Jung's authority completely nor to impugn his good faith. Men in office frequently play strange pranks with official papers, and these may yet be found. Moreover, there is some slight collateral evidence. Sevier, Napoleon A. Lyon, p. 4, and Souvenirs à l'usage des habitants de Douai. Douai, 1822. During May of the same year he jotted down with considerable full Neshis notions of the true relations between church and state. He had been reading Raustan's reply to Rousseau, and was evidently overpowered with the necessity of subordinating ecclesiastical to secular authority. The paper is rude and incomplete, but it shows whence he derived his policy of dealing with the Pope and the Roman Church in France. It has very unjustly been called an attempted refutation of Christianity, it is nothing of the sort. Ecclesiasticism and Christianity being hopelessly confused in his mind, he uses thetums interchangeably in an academic and polemic discussion to prove that the theory of the social contract must destroy all ecclesiastical assumption of supreme power in the state. Some of the lagging days were spent not only in novel reading, as the emperor in after years confessed to to remuse at, but in attempts at novel writing, to relieve the tedium of idle hours. It is said that first and last Bonaparte read were the five times through. In Orphanes among his boyish scribblings to show how fantastic were their dreams both of love and of glory in which he indulged. Many entertain a suspicion that amid the gaieties of the winter he had really lost his heart, or thought he had, and was repulsed. At least, in his dialogue on love written five years later, he says, I, too, wasn't in love, and proceeds, after a few lines, to decry the sentiment as harmful to mankind, a something from which God would do well to emancipate it. This may have referred to his first meeting and conversation with a courtesan at Paris, which he describes in one of his papers, but this is not likely from the context, which is not concerned with the gratification of sexual passion. It is of the nobler sentiment that he speaks, and there seems to have been in the interval no opportunity for philandering so good as the one he had enjoyed during his boyish acquaintance with Mill. Caroline du Columbia. It has, at all events, been her good fortune to secure, by this supposition, a place in history, not merely as the first girlfriend of Napoleon, but as the object of his first pure passion. But these were his avocations. The real occupation of his time was study. Besides reading again the chief works of Rousseau, and varying those of Raynal, his most beloved author, he also read much in the works of Voltaire, 
of Philang Eri, of Necker, and of Adam Smith. With notebook and pencil he extracted, annotated, and criticized, his mind alert and every faculty bent to the clear apprehension of the subject in hand. To the conception of the state as a private corporation, which he had imbibed from Rousseau, was now added the conviction that the institutions of France were no longer adapted to the occupations, beliefs, or morals of her people, and that evolution was a necessity. To judge from a memoir presented some eyes later to the Lyon Academy, he must have absorbed the teachings of the two Indies almost entire. The consuming zeal for studies on the part of this incomprehensible youth is probably unparalleled. Having read Plutarch in his childhood, he now devoured Herodotus, Strabo, and Diodorus, China, Arabia, and the Indies dazzled his imagination, and what he could lay hands upon concerning the East was soon assimilated. England and Germany next engaged his attention, and toward the close of his studies he became ardent in examining the minutest particulars of French history. It was, moreover, the science of history, and not its literature, which occupied him dry details of revenue, resources, and institutions, the Sorbonne, the Bullunigenitis, and church history in general, the character of peoples, the origin of institutions the philosophy of legislation all these he studied, and, if the fragments of his notes be trustworthy evidence, as they surely are, with some thoroughness. He also found time to read the masterpieces of French literature, and the great critical judgments which had been passed upon them. 14, footnote 14, the volumes of Napoleon in Kou contain the text of these papers as deciphered for M. Masson and revised by him. My own examination which antedated his transcription by more than a year, 1891, led me to trust their authenticity absolutely, as far as the writer's memory and good faith are concerned. I cannot rely as positively as Masson does on the Epoch de Marvie, which has the appearance of a casual scribbling done in an idle moment on the first scrap that came to hand. The agreeable and studious life at Valence was soon ended. Early in August, 1786, a little rebellion, known as the Two Cent Revolt, broke out in Lyon over a strike of the silk weavers for two cents and El Morpé and the revolt of the tavern keepers against the enforcement of the Banvin, an ancient feudal right levying a heavy tax on the sale of wine. The neighboring garrisons were ordered to furnish their respective quotas for the suppression of the uprising. Bonaparte's company was sent among others but those earlier on the ground had been active, several workmen had been killed, and their disturbance was already quelled when he arrived. The days he spent at Lyon were so agreeable that, as he wrote his uncle Fesch, he left the city with regret to follow his destiny. His regiment had been ordered northward to Dwy in Flanders, he returned to Valence and reached that city about the end of August. His furlough began nominally on October 1st, but for the Corsican officers a month's grace was added, so that he was free to leave on September 1st. The time spent under the summer skies of the north would have been dreary enough if he had regularly received news from home. Utterly without success in finding occupation in Corsica, and hopeless as to France, Joseph had some time before turned his eyes toward Tuscany for a possible career. He was now about to make a final effort and seek personally at the Tuscan capital official recognition with a view to relearning his native tongue, now almost forgotten, and to obtaining subsequent employment of any kind that might offer in the land of his birth. Lucian, the archdeacon, was seriously ill, and General Marbuf, the last influential friend of the family, had died. Louis had been promised a scholarship in one of the Royal Artillery Schools semicolon deprived of his patron, he would probably lose the appointment. Finally, the pecuniary affairs of M. de Bonaparte were again entangled, and now appeared hopeless. She had for a time been receiving an annual state bounty for raising mulberry trees, as France was introducing silk culture into the island. The inspectors had condemned this year's work, and were withholding a substantial portion of the allowance. These were the facts, and they probably reached Napoleon at Valence. It was doubtless a knowledge of them which put an end to all his light-heartedness and to his study, historical or political. 
he immediately made ready to avail himself of his leave so that he might instantly set out to his mother's relief. Despondent and anxious, he moped, grew miserable, and contracted a slight malarial fever which for the next six or seven years never entirely relaxed its hold on him. Among his papers has recently been found their long, wild, pessimistic rhapsody to which reference has already been made and in which there is talk of suicide. The plaintis of the degeneracy among men, of the destruction of primitive simplicity in Corsica by the French occupation, of his own isolation, and of his yearning to see his friends once more. Life is no longer worthwhile, his country gone, a patriot has naught to live for, especially when he has no pleasure and all his pain when the charic trough those about him is to his own as moonlight is to sunlight. If fear but a single life in his way, he would bury the avenging blade of his country and her violated laws in the bosom of the tyrant. Some of his complaining was even less coherent than this. It is absurd to take the morbid outpouring seriously, except in so far as it goes to prove that its writer was a victim of the sentimental egoism into which the psychological studies of the 18th century had degenerated, and to suggest that possibly if he had not been Napoleon he might have he been a worther. Though dated May 3rd, no year is given, and it may well describe the writer's feelings in any period of despondency. No such state of mind was likely to have arisen in the preceding spring, but it may have been written even then as a relief to pent up feelings such did not appear on the surface, or possibly in some later year when the agony of suffering for himself and his family laid hold upon him. In any case it expresses a bitter melancholy such as would be felt by a boy face to face with one dot of valence Napoleon visited his old friend the abbe saying truth, toes illicit favor for Lucian, who, having left Brienne, would study nothing but the humanities, and was determined to become a priest. At Aix he saw both his uncle Fesh and his brother. At Marseille he is said to have paid his respects to the abbe Raynal, requesting advice and seeking further encouragement in his historical labors. This is very doubtful, for there is no record of Reynolds' return to France before 1787. Lodging in that city, as appears from a memorandum on his papers, with O.M. Allard, he must soon have found a vessel sailing for his destination. Because he came expeditiously to Ajaxio, arriving in that city toward the middle of the month, if the ordinary time had been consumed in the journey. Such appears to be the likeliest to count off this period, although our knowledge is not complete. In the archives of Dwy, there is, according to an anonymous local historian, a record of Bonaparte's presence in that city with the regiment of Lafayette, and he is quoted as having declared at Elba to Sir Neil Campbell that he had been sent thither but in the epochs of my life, he wrote that he left Valence on September 1, 1786, for Ajaxio, arriving on the 15th. Weighing the probabilities, it seems likely that the latter was doubtful, since there is but the slenderest possibility of his having been at Dwy in the following year. The only other hypothesis, and there exists no record of his activities in Corsica before the spring of 1787. The chronology of that were years is still involved in obscurity and it is possible that Hewent with his regiment at Y, contracted his malaria there, and did not actually get leave of absence until February 1st of the latter year. Chapter 7. Further attempts at authorship. Straits of the Bonaparte family, Napoleon's efforts to relieve them, home studies, his history and short stories, visit to Paris, renewed petitions to government, more authorship secures extension of his leave, the family fortunes desperate, the history of Corsica completed, its style, opinions, and value, failure to find a publisher, sentiments expressed in his short stories, Napoleon's irregularities as a French officer, his life at Auxon, his vain appeal to Paoli, the history dedicated to Necker. Side note, 1787-89. When Napoleon arrived at Ajaxio, and, after an absence of eight years, was again with his family, he found their affairs in a serious condition. Not one of the old French officials remained, 
their diplomatic leniency of occupation was giving place to the official stringency of a permanent possession, proportionately the disaffection of the patriot remnant among the people was slowly developing into widespread discontent. Joseph, the hereditary head of a family which had been thoroughly French in conduct, and was supposed to be so in sentiment, which at least looked to the king for further favours, was still a staunch royalist. Having been unsuccessful in every other direction, he was now seeking to establish a mercantile connection with Florence which would enable him to engage in the oil trade. A modest beginning was, he hoped, about to be made. It was high time, for the only support of his mother and her children, in the failure to secure a promised subsidy for her mulberry plantations, was the income of the old archdeacon, who was now confined to his room and growing feebler every day under attacks of gout. Unfortunately, Joseph's well-meant efforts again came to naught. The behavior of the pale, feverish, masterful young lieutenant was not altogether praiseworthy. He filled the house with his newfangled philosophy, and assumed a self-important air. Among his papers and in his own handwriting is a blank form for engaging and binding recruits. Clearly, he had a tacit understanding either with himself or with others to secure some of the fine Corsican youth for the regiment of Lafia. But there is no record of any success in the enterprise. Among the letters which he wrote was one dated April 1, 1787, to the renowned Dr. Tissot of Lausanne, referring to his correspondent's interest in Paoli and asking advice concerning the treatment of the canon's gout. The physician never replied, and the epistle was found among his papers marked unanswered and of little interest. The old ecclesiastic listened to his nephew's patriotic tirades, and even approved, m. de Bonaparte coldly disapproved. She would have preferred calmer, more efficient common sense. Not that her son was inactive in her behalf, on the contrary. He began a series of boozy representations to the provincial officials which secured some goodwill and even trifling favour to the family. But the results were otherwise unsatisfactory, for the mulberry money was not paid. Napoleon's zeal for study was not in the least abated in the atmosphere of home. Joseph in his memoirs says the reunited family was happy in spite of troubles. There was reciprocal joy in their companionship and his long absent brother was glad in the pleasures both of home and of nature so congenial to his feelings and his tastes. The most important part of Napoleon's baggage appears to have been the books, documents, and papers he brought with him. That he had collections on Corsica has been told. Joseph says he had also the classics of both French and Latin literature as well as the philosophical writings of Plato. Likewise, he thinks, Ossian and Homer. In the discourse presented not many years later to the Leon Academy and in the talks at St. Helena, Napoleon refers to Heiss' enjoyment of nature at this time, to the hours spent in the grotto, under the majestic oak, or in the shade of the olive groves, all parts of the sadly neglected garden of Mill lie some distance from the house and belonging to his mother, to his walks on the meadows among the lowing herds to his wanderings on the shore at sunset, his return by moonlight, and the gentle melancholy which unbidden enveloped him in spite of himself. He savoured the air of Corsica, the smell of its th, the spicy breezes of its thickets, he would have known his home with his eyes shut, and with them open he found it the earthly paradise. Yet all the while he was busy, very busy, partly with good reading, partly in the study of history and in large measure with the practical conduct of the family affairs. As the time for return to service drew near it was clear that the mother with her family of four helpless little children, all a serious charge on her time and purse, could not be left without the support of an older son, at least, and Joseph was now about to seek his fortune Pisa. Accordingly Napoleon with methodical care drew up two papers still existing, a memorandum of how an application for a nude levy on the ground of sickness was to be made and also the form of application itself, which no doubt he copied. At any rate he applied, on the ground of ill health, for a renewal of leave to last five and a half months. It was granted, and the regular round of family cus went on, but the days and weeks brought no relief. Ill health thus, and perhaps sufficient to justify that plea 
but the physical fever was intensified by the checks which want set upon ambition. The passion for authorship reasserted itself with undiminished violence. The history of Corsica was resumed, recast, and vigorously continued, while at the same time the writer completed a short story entitled The Count of Essex, with an English setting, of course, comma, and Rutea Corsican novel. The latter abounds in bitterness against France, the most potent force in the development of the plot being the dagger. Thither's use of French, though easier, is still very imperfect. A slight essay, or rather story, in the style of Voltaire, entitled The Masked Prophet, was also completed. It was reported early in the autumn that many regiments were to be mobilized for special service among them that of Lafayette. This gave Napoleon exactly the opening he desired, and he left Corsica at once, without reference to the end of his furlough. He reached Paris in October, a fortnight before he was due. His regiment was still at Douai, he may have spent a few days with it in that city. But this is not certain, and soon after it was transferred to Saint Denis, now a most a suburb of Paris, it was destined for service in western France, where incipient tumults were presaging the coming storm. Eventually its destination was changed and it was ordered to Auxon. The Estates General of France were about to meet for the first time in own 175 years, they had last met in 1614, and had broken up in disorder. They were now called as a desperate remedy, not understood, but at least untried forever increasing embarrassments semicolon and the government, fearing still greater disorders, was making ready to repress any that might break out in districts known to be specially dies affected. All this was apparently of secondary importance to young Bonaparte, he had a scheme to use the crisis for the benefit of his family. Compelled by their utter destitution at the time of his father's death, he had temporarily and for that occasion assumed his father's role of suppliant. Now for a second time he sent in a petition. It was written in Paris, dated November 9, 1787, and addressed, in his mother's behalf, to the intendant for Corsica resident at the French capital. His name and position must have carried some weight, it could not have been the mere effrontery of an adventurer which secured him a hearing at Versailles, an interview with the Prime Minister, Le Mani de Brienne and admission to all theminer officials who might deal with his mother's claim. All these are privileges he declares that he had enjoyed and the statements must have been true. The petition was prefaced by a personal letter containing them. Though a supplication in form, the request is unlike his father's humble and almost cringing papers, being rather a demand for justice than a petition for favor, it is unlike them in another respect, because it contains a falsehood or at least an utterly misleading half-truth, a statement that he had shortened his leave it because of his mother's urgent necessities. The paper was not handed in until after the expiration of his leave, and his true object was not to rejoin his regiment, as was hinted in it, but to secure a second extension of leave. Such was the slackness of discipline that he spent all of November and the first half of December in Paris. During this period he made acquaintance with the darker side of Paris life. The papers numbered 4, 5, and 6 in the Fesh collection give a fairly detailed account of one adventure and his bitter repentance. The second suggests the writing of Historia as an antidote for unhappiness, and the last is a long, ramble and effusion in denunciation of pleasure, passion, and license, of glantery as utterly incompatible with patriotism. His acquaintance with history is ransacked for examples. Still another short effusion which may belong to the same period is in the form of an imaginary letter, saturated likewise with the Corsican spirit, addressed by King Theodore to Walpole. It has little value or meaning, except as it may possibly foreshadow the influence on Napoleon's imagination of England's boundless hospitality to political fugitives like Theodore and Paoli. Lieutenant Bonaparte remained in Paris until he succeeded in procuring permission to spend the next six months in Corsica, at his own charges. He was quite as disingenuous in his request to the Minister of War as in his memorial to the Intendant for Corsica representing that the estates of Corsica were about to meet, 
and Thathis' presence was essential to safeguard important interests which in his absence would be seriously compromised. Whatever such a plea may have meant, his serious cares as the real head of the family were ever uppermost, and never neglected. Louis had, as was feared, lost his appointment, and though not past the legal age, was really too old to await another vacancy. Lucian was determined to leave Brian in any case, and to stay at X in order to seize the first chance which might arise of entering the seminary. Napoleon made some provision what it was is not known for Louis's further temporary stay at Brian, and then took Lucian with him as far as their route lay together. He reached his home again on the 1st of January, 1788. The affairs of the family were at last utterly desperate, and were likely, moreover, to grow worse before they grew better. The old Archdeacon was failing daily, and, although known to have means, he declared himself destitute of ready money. With his death would eyes appear a portion of his income, his patrimony and savings, with Bonaparte's helped of course to inherit, were an uncertain quantity, probably insufficient for the needs of such a family. Their mulberry money was still unpaid, all hope of wresting the ancestral estates from the government authorities was buried, Joseph was without employment, and, as a last expedient, was studying in Pisa for admission to the bar. Louis and Lucien were each a heavy charge semicolon Napoleon's income was insufficient even for his own modest wants, regulated though they were by the strictest economy. Who shall cast a stone at the shiftiness of a boy not yet nineteen, charged with such cares, yet consumed with ambition, and saturated with the romantic sentimentalism of his times? Some notion of his embarrassment and spur can be obtained from a rapid survey of his mental states and corresponding facts. An ardent republican and revolutionary, he was tied by the strongest bonds to the most despotic monarchy in Europe. A patriotic Corsican, he was the servant of his country suppressor. Conscious of great ability, he was seeking an outlet in the pursuit of literature, a line of work entirely unsuited to his powers. The head and support of a large family, he was almost penniless, if he should follow his convictions, he and they might be altogether so. In the period of choice and requiring room for experiment, he saw himself doomed to a fixed, inglorious career, and caged in a framework of unpropitious circumstance. Whatever the moral obliquity in his feeble expedients, there is the pathos of human limitations in their character. Whether the resolution had long before been taken, or was of recent formation, Napoleon now intended to make fame and profit go hand in hand. The meeting of the Corsican estates was, as far as is known, entirely forgotten, and authorship was resumed, not merely with Theodore of one who writes from inclination but with the regular drudgery of a craftsman. In spite of all discouragements, he appeared to a visitor in his family, still considered the most devoted in the island to the French monarchy because so favoured by it, as being full of vivacity, quick in his speech and motions, his mind apparently hard at work in digesting schemes and forming plans and proudly rejecting every other suggestion but that of his own fancy. For this intolerable ambition he was often reproved by the elder Lucian, his uncle, a dignitary of the church. Yet these admonitions seemed to make no impression upon the mind of Napoleon, who received them with a grin of pity, if not of contempt. 15. The amusements of the versatile and headstrong boy would have been sufficient occupation for most men. Regulating, as far as possible his mother's complicated affairs, he journeyed frequently to Bastia, probably to collect money due for a young mulberry trees which had been sold, possibly to get material for his history. On these visits he met and dined with the artillery officers of the company stationed there. One of them, M. de Roman, a very pronounced royalist, has given in his memoirs a striking portrait of his guest. 16. His face was not pleasing to me at all, his character still less, and he was so dry and sententious for a youth of his age, a French officer too, that I never for a moment entertained thought of making him my friend. My knowledge of governments, ancient and modern, was not sufficiently extended to discuss with him his favorite subject of conversation. 
So when in my turn I gave their dinner, which happened three or four times that year, I retired after the coffee, leaving him to the hands of a captain of ours, far betterable than I was to lock arms with such a valiant antagonist. My comrades, like myself, saw nothing in this but absurd pedantry. Then believed that this magisterial tone which he assumed was meaningless until one day when he reasoned so forcibly on the rights of nations in general, his own in particular, underscore stupid gen's exclamation mark underscore that could not recover from our amazement, especially when in speaking of a meeting of their estates, about calling which there was some deliberation, and which M. Durbarin sought to delay, following in that the blunders of his predecessor, he said, that it was very surprising that M. de Baron thought to prevent them from deliberating about their interests, adding in a threatening tone, M. de Baron does not know the Corsicans, he will see what they can do. Thy's expression gave the measure of his character. One of our comrades replied, would you draw your sword against the king's representative? He made no answer. We separated coldly and that was the last time this former comrade did me the honor to dine with me. Making all allowance, this incident exhibits the feeling and purpose of Napoleon. During these days he also completed a plan for the defense of S.D. Florent, of La Mortilla, and of the Gulf of Ajaccio, drew up a report on the organization of the Corsican militia, and wrote a paper on the strategic importance of the Madeline Islands. This was his play his work was the history of Corsica. It was finished sooner than he had expected, anxious to reap the pecuniary harvest of his labors and resume his duties, he was ready for the printer when he left for France in the latter part of May to secure its publication. Aldorf dictated in its first form to a powerful patron, Monson Marbuf, then Bishop of Sins, like many works from the pen of Genius it remained at the author's death in manuscript. Footnote 15 Correspondence of Sir John Sinclair, I, 47, footnote 16, Souvenirs d'un officier royaliste, par M. de R, volume I, p. 117. The book was of moderate size, and of moderate merit. 17, its form, repeatedly changed from motives of expediency, was at first that of letters addressed to the Abbe Raynal. Its contents display little research and no scholarship. The style is intended to be popular, and is dramatic rather than narrative. There is exhibited, as everywhere in these early writings, an intense hatred of France, a glowing affection for Corsica and her heroes. A very short account of only a chapter will sufficiently characterize the whole work. Having outlined in perhaps the most effective passage the career of San Piero, and sketched his diplomatic failures at all the European courts except that of Constantinople, where at last he had secured sympathy and was promised aid, the author depicts the patriot's bitterness when recalled by the news of his wife's treachery. Confronting his guilty spouse, deaf to every plea for pity, hardened against the tender caresses of his children, the Corsican hero utters judgment. Madam, he sternly says, in the face of crime and disgrace, there is no other assault but death. Vanino at first falls unconscious, but, regaining her senses, she clasps her children to her breast and begs life for the sake. But feeling that the petition is futile, she then recalls the memory of her earlier virtue, and, facing her fate, begs as a last favor that no base executioner shall lay his soiled hands on the wife of San Piero but that he himself shall execute the sentence. Vanina's behavior moves her husband, but does not touch his heart. The pity and tenderness, says Bonaparte, which he should have awakened at for soul thenceforward closed to the power of sentiment. Vanina died. She died by the hands of Sampiero. Footnote 17, printed in Napoleon in Q, Volume 2, p. 167. Neither the publishers of Valence, nor those of Dole, nor those of Auxon, would accept the work. At Paris one was finally found who was willing to take a half risk. The author, disillusioned but sanguine, was on the point of accepting the proposition, and was occupied with considering ways and means, when his friend the Bishop of Sins was suddenly disgraced. 
the manuscript was immediately copied and revised, with the result, probably, of making its tone more intensely Corsican semicolon for it was now to be dedicated to Paoli. The literary aspirant must have foreseen the coming crash, and must have felt that the exile was to be again the liberator, and perhaps the master, of his native land. At any rate, he abandoned the idea of immediate publication, possibly in the dawning hope that as Paoli's lieutenant he could make Corsican history better than he could write it. It is this copy which has been preserved, the original was probably destroyed. The other literary efforts of this feverish time were not as successful even as those in historical writing. The stories are wild and crude, one only, the masked prophet, has any merit or interest whatsoever. Though more finished than the others, its style is also abrupt and full of surprises, the scene and characters are oriental semicolon the plot is a feeble invention. An ambitious and rebellious Samir is struck with blindness, and has recourse to a sylvan mask to deceive his followers. Unsuccessful, he poisons them all, throws their corpses into pits of quicklime, then leaps in himself, to deceive the world and leave no trace of mortality behind. His enemies believe, as he desired, that he and his people have been taken up into heaven. Thuhole, however, is dimly prescient and the concluding lines of Thiefable have been thought by believers in augury to be prophetic. Incredible instance. How far can the passion for fame go? Among the papers of this period are also a constitution for the Calot, a secret society of his regiment organized to keep its members up to the mark of conduct expected from gentlemen and officers, and many political notes. One of these rough drafts is a project for an essay in royal power, intended to treat of its origin and to display its usurpations, and which closes with these words, there are but few kings who do not deserve to be dethroned. The various absences of Bonaparte from his regiment up to this time are antagonistic to our modern ideas of military duty. The subsequent tones seem simply inexplicable, even in a service so lax as that of the crumbling Bourbon dynasty. Almost immediately after Joseph's return, on the 1st of June he sailed for France. He did not reach Auxon, where the artillery regiment Lafayette was now stationed, until early in that month, 1788. He remained the less than a year and a half, and then actually obtained another leave of absence, from September 10th, 1789, to February, 1791, which he fully intended should end in his retirement from the French service. 18. The incidents of this second term of garrison life are not numerous, but from the considerable body of his notes and exercises which dates from the period we know that he suddenly developed great zeal in the study of artillery, theoretical and practical, and that he redoubled his industry in the pursuit of historical and political science. In the former line he worked diligently and became expert. With his instructor Dutel Hegra intimate and the friendship was close throughout life. He associated on the best of terms with his old friend De Mazes and began a pleasant acquaintance with Gassendi. So faithful was he to the minutest details of his profession that he received marks of the highest distinction. Not yet twenty and only a second lieutenant, he was appointed, with six officers of higher rank, a member of the regimental commission to study the best disposal of mortars and cannon in firing shells. Either at this time or later. The date is uncertain, he had sole charge of important manoeuvres held in honour of the Prince of Kind. These honours he recounted with honest pride in a letter dated August 22nd to his great uncle. Among the fesh papers are considerable fragments of his writing on the theory, practice, and history of artillery. Antiquated as are their contents, they show how patient and thorough was the work of the student and some of their ideas adapted to new conditions were his permanent possession, as the greatest master of artillery at the height of his fame. In the study of politics he read Plato and examined the constitutions of antiquity, devouring with avidity what literature he could find concerning Venice, Turkey, Tartary, and Arabia. At the same time he carefully read the history of England, and made some accurate observations on the condition of contemporaneous politics in France. Footnote 18, 
Similar instances of repeated and lengthened absence from duty among the young officers are numerous and easily found in the archives. Nevertheless, Bonaparte's case is a very extraordinary example of how a clever person could work the system. The facts are bad enough, but as many cities claimed Homer, so in the Napoleonic legend events of a sojourn at Strasbourg about this time were given in great detail. He was in relations with a famous actress and wrote verses which are printed. Even Metternich records that the young Napoleon Bonaparte had just left the Alsatian capital when he himself arrived there in 1788. Later, in 1806, a fencing master claimed that he had instructed both these great men in the earlier year at Strasbourg. Yet the whole tale is impossible. See Napoleon in Coup, Volume I, p. 204. His last disappointment had rendered him more taciturn and misanthropic than ever, it seems clear that he was working to become an expert, not for the benefit of France, but for that of Corsica. Charged with the oversight of some slight works on the fortifications, he displayed such incompetence that he was actually punished by a short arrest. Misfortune still pursued the family. The youth who had been appointed to Brienne when Louis was expecting a scholarship suddenly died. M. De Bonaparte was true to the family tradition, and immediately forwarded a petition for the place, but was, as before, unsuccessful. Lucien was not yet admitted to X, Joseph was a barrister. To be sure, but briefless. Napoleon once again but for the last time comma and with marked impatience, even with impertinence comma took up the task of solicitation. The only result was a good-humoured, non-committal reply. Meantime the first mutterings of the evolutionary outbreak were heard, and spasmodic disorders, trifling but portentous, were breaking out, not only among the people, but even among the royal troops. One of these, at Sir, was occasioned by the news that the hated and notorious syndicate existing under the scandalous agreement with the king known as the bargain of famine had been making additional purchases of grain from two merchants off Tet town. This was in April, 1789. Bonaparte was put in command of a company and sent to aid in suppressing the riot. But it was indeed before he arrived, on May 1st he returned to Auxon. Illustration from the collection of W. C. Crane. Engraved by Huot. Charles Bonaparte, father of the Emperor Napoleon, 1785. Painted by Girard. Four days later, the estates met at Versailles. What was passing in their mind of the restless, bitter, disappointed Corsican is again plainly revealed. A famous letter to Paoli, to which reference has already been made, is dated June 12. It is a justification of his Sarisht work as the only means open to a poor man, the slave of circumstances, for summoning the French administration to the rough public opinion, viz., by comparing it with Paoli's. Willing to fast consequences, the writer asks for documentary materials and formal support, ending with ardent assurances of devotion from his family, his mother, and himself but there is a ring of false coin in many of its words and sentences. The infamy of those who betrayed Corsica was the infamy of his own father, the devotion of the Bonaparte family had been to the French interest, in order to secure a free education, with support for their children, in France. The enthusiasm of Napoleon was a cold, unsentimental determination to push their fortunes, which, with opposite principles, would have been honorable enough. In later years Lucien said that he had made two copies of the history. It was probably one of these which has been preserved. Whether or not Paoli read the book does not appear. Be that as it may, his reply to Bonaparte's letter, written some months later, was not calculated to encourage the would-be historian. With Hout absolutely refusing the documents asked for by the aspiring writer, he explained that he had no time to search for them and that, besides, Corsican history was only important in any sense by reason of the men who had made it, not by reason of its achievements. Among other bits of fatherly counsel was this, you are too young to write history. Make ready for such an enterprise slowly. 
patiently collect anecdotes and facts. Accept the opinions of other writers with reserve. As if to soften the severity of his advice, there follows a strain of modest self-depreciation, would that others had known less of me and I more of myself. Underscore probe de vivimus underscore, may our descendants so live that they shall speak of me merely as one who had good intentions. Bonaparte's last shift in the treatment of his book was most undignified and petty. With the unprincipled resentment of despair, in want of money, not of advice, he entirely remodeled it for the third time, its chapters being now put as fragmentary traditions into themeth of a Corsican mountaineer. In this form it was dedicated to Necker, the famous Swiss, who as French Minister of Finance was vainly struggling with the problem of how to distribute taxation equally, and to collect from the privileged classes their share. A copy was first sent to a former teacher for criticism. His judgment was extremely severe both as to expression and style. In particular, attention was called to the disadvantage of indulging in so much rhetoric for the benefit of an overworked public servant like Necker, and to thin appropriateness of putting his own metaphysical generalizations and captious criticism of French royalty into the mouth of a peasant mountaineer. Before the correspondence ended, Napoleon's student life was over. Necker had fled, the French Revolution was rushing on with ever increasing speed, and the young adventurer, despairing of success as a writer, seized the proffered opening to become a man of action. In a letter dated January 12, 1789, and written a talk on to his mother, the young officer gives a dreary account of himself. The swamps of the neighborhood and their malarious exhalations rendered the place, he thought, utterly unwholesome. At all events, he had contracted a low fever which undermined his strength and depressed his spirits. There was no immediate hope of a favorable response to the partition for the monies due on the Mulberry Plantation because the Jean Happy period in French finance delays furiously, underscore sick underscore, their discussion of our affair. Let us hope, however, that we may be compensated for our long and weary waiting and that we shall receive complete restitution. He writes further a terse sketch of public affairs in France and Europe, speaks despairingly of what the Council of War has in store for the engineers by the proposed reorganization, and closes with tender remembrances to Joseph and Lucien, begging for news and reminding them that he had received no home letter since the preceding October. The reader feels that matters have come to a climax and that the scholar is soon to enter the arena of revolutionary activity. Curiously enough, the language used is French, this is probably due to the fact that it was intended for the family, rather than for the neighborhood circle. Chapter 8. The Revolution in France. The French aristocracy, priests, lawyers, and petty nobles, burghers, artisans, and laborers, intelligent curiosity of the nation, exasperating anachronisms, contrast of demand and resources, the great nobles a barrier to reform, mistakes of the king, the estates meet at Versailles, the court party provokes violence, downfall of feudal privilege. Side note, 1787-89. At last the ideas of the century had declared open war on its institutions. Their moral conquest was already coextensive with Central and Western Europe, but the first efforts toward their realization were to be made in France, for the reason that the line of least resistance was to be found not through the most downtrodden, but through the freest and the best instructed nation on the continent. Both the clergy and the nobility of France had become accustomed to the absorption in the crown of their ancient feudal power. They were content with the great offices in the church in the army, and in their civil administration, with exemption from the payment of taxes, they we are happy in the delights of literature and the fine arts, in their joys of a polite, self-indulgent, and spendthrift society, so artificial and conventional that for most of its members a sufficient occupation was found in the study and exposition of its trivial but complex customs. The conduct and maintenance of a salon, the stage, gallantry, clothes, table manners, the use of the fan, these air as specimens of what were considered not the incidents but the essentials of life. The serious minded among the upper classes were as enlightened as an of their rank elsewhere. 
they were familiar with prevalent philosophies, and full of compassion for miseries which, for lack of a power, they could not remedy, and which, to their dismay, they only intensified in their attempts at alleviation. They were even ready for considerable sacrifices. The gracious side of the character of Louis XVI is but a reflection of the piety, moderation, and earnestness of many of the nobles. His rule was mild, there were no excessive indignities practiced in the name of royal power except in cases like it at of the bargain of famine, where he believed himself helpless. The lower clergy, as a whole, were faithful in the performance of the duties. This was not true of the hierarchy. They were great landowners, and their interests coincided with those of the upper nobility. The doubt of the country had not left them untouched, and there were many without conviction or principle, time serving and irreverent. The lawyers and other professional men were to be found, for the most part, in Paris and in the towns. They had their livelihood in the irregularities of society, and, as a class, re retentive of ancient custom and present social habits. Although by birth they belonged in the main to the third estate, they were in reality adjunct to the first, and consequently, being integral members of neither, formed a strong independent class by themselves. The petty nobles were in much the same condition with regard to the wealthy, powerful families in their own estate and to the rich burghers, they married the fortunes of the latter and accepted their hospitality, but otherwise treated them with the same exclusive condescension as that displayed to themselves by the great dot. But if the estate of the clergy and the estate of the nobility were alike divided in character and interests, this was still more true of the burghers. In 1614, at the close of the Middle Ages, the third estate had been little concerned with the agricultural laborer. For various reasons this class had been gradually emancipated until now the year was less surfage in France than elsewhere, more than a quarter, perhaps a third, of the land was in the hands of peasants and other small proprietors. This, to be sure, was economically disastrous, for over-division of land makes tillage unprofitable, and these very men were the taxpayers. The change had been still more marked in the denizens of towns. During the last two centuries the wealthy burghers had grown still more wealthy in the expansion of trade, commerce, and manufactures, many had struggled and bought their way into the ranks of the nobility. The small tradesmen had remained smug, hard to move, and resentful of change. But there was a large body of men unknown to all previous constitutions, and growing ever larger with the increase in population intelligent and unintelligent artisans half-educated employees in workshops, mills, and trading houses, ever recruited from the country population, seeking such intermittent occupation as the towns afforded. The very lowest stratum of this society was then, as no, most dangerous, idle, dissipated, and unscrupulous, they were yet sufficiently educated to discuss and disseminate perilous doctrines, and were often most ready in speech and fertile in resource. This comparative well being of a nation, devoted like the ancient Greeks to novelty, avid of great ideas and great deeds, holding opinions not merely for the pleasure of intellectual gymnastics but logically and with a view to their realization, sensitive to influences like the deep impressions made on their thinkers by the English and American revolutions such relative comfort with its attendant opportunities for discussion was not the least of many causes which made France the vanguard in the great revolution which had already triumphed in theory throughout the continent and ways eventually to transform the social order of all Europe. Discussion is not only a safety valve, it is absolutely essential in governments where the religion, morals, opinions, and occupations of the people give form and character to institutions and legislation. The centralized and despotic Bourbon monarchy of France was an anachronism among an intelligent people. So was every institution emanating from and dependent upon it. It was impossible for the structure to stand indefinitely, however tenderly it was treated, however cleverly it was propped and repaired. As in the case of England in 1688 and of her colonies in 1772, the immediate and direct agency in the crash was a matter of money. But the analogy holds good no further. 
for in France the questions of property and taxation were vastly more complex than in England, where the march of events had so largely destroyed feudalism, or in America, where feudalism had never existed. On the great French estates the laborers had first to support the proprietor and his representatives, then the church and the king semicolon the minute remainder of their gains was scarcely sufficient to keep the wolf from the door. The small proprietors were so hampered in their operations by the tiny size of their holdings that they were still restricted to ancient and wretched methods of cultivation, but they too were so burdened with contributions direct and indirect that famine was always imminent with them as well. Under whatever name the tax was known, license, octro, bridge and ferry toll, road work, salt tax, or whatever it may have been, it was chiefly distasteful not because of its form but because it was oppressive. Some of it was paid to the proprietors, some to the state. The former was more hateful because the gainer was near and more tangible, the hatred of the country people for the feudal privileges and those who held them was therefore concrete and quite as intense as the more doctrinaire dislike of the poor in the towns to the rich. Such was the alienation of classes from each other throughout the beginning and middle of the century that the disasters which French arms suffered at the hands of Marlborough and Frederick, so far from humiliating the nation, gave pleasure and not pain to the masses because they were, as thought, defeats not of France, but of the nobility and of the crown. Feudal dues had arisen when those imposing them had the physical force to compel their payment and were also the proprietors of the land on which they were exacted. Now the nobility were entirely stripped of power and in many instances of land as well. How empty and bottomless the oppressive institutions and how burdensome the taxes which rested on nothing but a paper grant, musty with age and backed only by royal complaisance. Want too was always looking in at the doors of the many, while the few were enjoying the national substance. This year was a crisis, for before the previous harvest time devastating hailstorms had swept the fields, in 1788, during the winter they had been pinching want and many had perished from destitution and cold semicolon the advancing seasons had brought warmth, but sufficient time had not even yet elapsed for fields and herds to bring forth their increase, and by the myriad firesides of the people hunger was still an unwelcome guest. With wholesome economy such crises may be surmounted in a rich and fertile country. But economy had not been practiced for fifty years by the governing classes. As early as 1739 there had been a deficiency in the French finances. From small beginnings the annual loans had grown until, in 1787, the sum to be raised over and above the regular income was no less than 32 millions of dollars. This was all due to the extravagance of the court and the aristocracy, who spent, for the most part, far more than the amount they actually collected and which they honestly believed to be their income. Such a course was vastly more disastrous than it appeared being ruinous not only to personal but to national well-being, inasmuch as what the nobles, even earnest and honest ones, believed to be their legitimate income was not really such. Two-thirds of the land was in their hands, the other third paid the entire land tax. They were therefore regarding as thrown two-thirds of what was in reality taken altogether from their pockets of the small proprietors small sacrifices the ruling class professed itself ready to make, but such a one as to pay their share of the land tax never. It had been proposed also to destroy the monopoly of the grain trade, and to abolish the road work, a task more hateful to the people than any tax, because it brought them into direct contact with the exasperating superciliousness of pet officials. But in all these proposed reforms, Necker, Callan, and Le Mene de Brienne, each approaching the nobles from a separator standpoint, had alike failed. The nobility could see in souk retrenchment and change nothing but ruin for themselves. An assembly of notables, called in 1781, would not listen to propositions which seemed suicidal. The king began to alienate the affection of his neutral allies, the people, by yielding to the clamor of the core party. From the nobility he could wring nothing. The royal treasury was therefore actually bankrupt, the nobles believed that they were threatened with bankruptcy, and the people knew that they themselves were not only bankrupt, 
but also hungry and oppressed. At last the king, aware of the nation's extremity, began to undertake reforms without reference to class prejudice, and on his own authority. He decreed a stamp tax, and the equal distribution of Thieland tax. He strove to compel the unwilling Parliament of Paris, a court of justice which, though ancient, he himself had but recently reconstituted, to register his decrees, and then banished it from the capital because it would not. That court had been the last remaining check on absolutism in the country, and, as such, an ally of the people, so that although the motives and the measures of Louis were just, the high-handed means to which he resorted in order to carry them alienated him still further from the affections of the nation. The Parliament, in justifying its opposition, had declared that taxes in France could be laid only by the Estates General. The people had almost forgotten the very name, and were entirely ignorant of what that body was, vaguely supposing that, like the English Parliament or the American Congress, it was in some sense a legislative assembly. They therefore made their voice heard in no uncertain sound, demanding that the estates should meet. Louis abandoned his attitude of independence, and recalled the Paris Parliament from Trous, but only to exasperate its members still further by insisting on a huge loan, on the restoration of civil rights to the Protestants, and on restricting not only its powers, but those of all similar course throughout the realm. The Parliament then declared that France was a limited monarchy with constitutional checks on the power of the Crown, and exasperated men flocked to the city to remonstrate against the menace to their liberties and the degradation of all the Parliaments by the King's action in regard to that of Paris. Those from Brittany formed an association, which soon admitted other members and developed into the notorious Jacobin Club, so called from its meeting place, a convent on the Rue Street Honor, once occupied by Dominican monks who had moved thither from the Rue Street Jacques. To summon the estates was a virtual confession that absolutism in France was at an end. In the 17th century the three estates liberated separately. Such matters came before them as were submitted by the Crown, chiefly demands for revenue. A decision was reached by the agreement of any two of the three, and wait the proposition the Crown submitted was either accepted or rejected. There was no real legislation. Louis no doubt hoped that the 18th century assembly would be like that of the 17th. He could then, by the coalition of the nobles and the clergy against the burghers, or by any other arrangement of two to one, secure authorization either for his loans or for his reforms, as the case might be and so carry both. But the France of 1789 was not the France of 1614. As soon as the call for the meeting was issued, and the decisive steps were taken, the whole country was flooded with pamphlets. Most of them were ephemeral, one was epochal. In it the Abbe Sias asked the question, what is the third estate? and answered so as to strengthen the already spreading conviction that the people of France were really the nation. The king was so far convinced as to agree that the third estate should be represented by delegates qual in number to those of the clergy and nobles combined. The elections passed quietly, and on May 5, 1789, the estates met at Versailles, under the shadow of the court. It was immediately evident that the hands of the clock could not be put back two centuries, and that here was gathered an assembly unlike any that had ever met in the country, determined to express the sentiments, and to be thexcative, of the masses who in their opinion constituted the nation. On June 17, therefore, after long talk and much hesitation, the representatives of the Third Estate declared themselves the representatives of the whole nation and invited their colleagues of the clergy and nobles to join them. Their meeting place having been closed in consequence of this decision, they gathered without authorization in the royal tennis court on June 20, and bound themselves by oath not to disperse until they had introduced a new order. Louis was nevertheless nearly successful in his plan of keeping the sittings of the three estates separate. He was thwarted by the eloquence and courage of Meyerup. 
On June 27 a majority of the delegates from the two upper estates joined those of the third estate in constituting a national assembly. At this juncture the court party began the disastrous policy which in then was responsible for most of the terrible excesses of the French Revolution, by insisting that troops should be called to restrain the assembly, and that Necker should be banished. Louis showed the same vacillating spirit now that he had displayed iron yielding to the assembly and assented. The noble officers had lately shown themselves untrustworthy, and the men in the ranks refused to be when called to fight against the people. The baser social elements of the whole country had long since swarmed to the capital. Their leaders now fanned the flame of popular discontent until at last Essort was had to violence. On July 12 the barriers of Paris were burned, and the regular troops were defeated by the mob in the place Vendôme. On July 14 the Bastille, in itself a harmless necronism, but considered by the masses to typify all the tyrannical shifts and inhuman oppressions known to despotism, was razed to the ground. As if to crown their baseness, the extreme conservatives among the nobles, the very men who had brought the king to such straits, now abandoned him and fled. Louis finally bowed to the storm, and came to reside among his people in Paris as a sign of submission. Bailey, an excellent and judicious man, was made mayor of the city, and Lafayette, with his American laurels still unfaded, was made commander of a newly organized force, to be known as the National Guard. On July 17 the king accepted the red, white, and blue the recognized colors of liberty as national. The insignia of a dynasty were exchanged for the badge of a principal. A similar transformation took place throughout the land, and administration everywhere passed quietly into the hands of the popular representatives. The flying nobles found their cheeks hotter than Paris. Not only must the old feudal privileges go, but with them the old feudal grants, the charters of oppression in Themyanum and chests. These charters the peasants insisted must be destroyed. If they could not otherwise gain possession of them, they resorted to violence, and sometimes in the intoxication of the hour they exceeded the bounds of reason, abusing both the persons and the legitimate property of their enemies. Death or surrender was often the alternative. So it was that there was no refuge on their estates, not even a temporary one, for those who had so long possessed them. Many had already passed into foreign lands, the emigration increased, and continued in a steady stream. The moderate nobles, honest patriots to whom life in exile was not life at all, now clearly saw that the Eredem must yield, in the night session of August 4, sometimes called the Saint Bartholomew of Privilege, they surrendered their privileges in a mass. Every vestige, not only of feudal, but also of chartered privilege, was to be swept away, even the king's hunting grounds were to be reduced to the dimensions permitted to a private gentleman. All men alike, it was agreed, were to renounce the conventional and arbitrary distinctions which had created inequality in civil and political life, and accept the absolute equality of citizenship. Liberty and fraternity were the two springers of the new watch, its keystone was to be equality. On August 23 the assembly decreed freedom of religious opinion, on the next day freedom of the press. Chapter 9. Bonaparte and Revolution in Corsica Napoleon's studies continued at talks on, another illness and a furlough, his scheme of Corsican liberation, his appearance at twenty, his attainments and character, his shifty conduct, the homeward journey, new parties in Corsica, Solicetti and the Nationalists, Napoleon becomes a political agitator and leader of the radicals, the National Assembly incorporates Corsica with France and grants amnesty to Paoli momentary joy of the Corsican patriots, the French assembly ridicules Genoa's protest, Napoleon's plan for Corsican administration. Side note, 1789-90. Such were the events taking place in the great world while Bonaparte was at Auxon. That town, as had been expected, was most uneasy, and on July 19, 1789, there was an actual outbreak of violence, directed there as elsewhere, against the tax receivers. The riot was easily suppressed, and for some weeks yet, 
the regular round-off studious monotony in the young lieutenant's life was not disturbed except as his poverty made his asceticism more rigorous. I have no their resource but work, he wrote to his mother, I dress but once in eight days, Sunday parade. I sleep but little since my illness, it is incredible. I retire at ten, and rise at four in the morning. I take but one meal a day, at three, that is good for my health. More bad news came from Corsica. The starving patriot fell seriously ill, and for a time his life hung in the balance. On August 8 he was at last sufficiently restored to travel, and applied for a six months furlough, to begin immediately. Under the regulations, in spite of his previous leaves and irregularities, he was this year entitled to such a vacation, but not before October. His plea that Thew Winter was unfavorable for the voyage to Corsica was characteristic, for it was neither altogether true nor altogether false. He was feverish and ill, excited by news of turmoils at home, and wished to be on the scene of action, this would have been a true and sufficient ground for his request. It was likewise true, however, that his chance for a smooth passage was better in August than in October, and thus that in fact, though probably irrelevant, might move the authorities. Their answer was favorable, and on September 16 he left Hawks on. In the interval occurred a mutiny in the regiment. The pay of the men was far in arrears, and they demanded a division of the surplus which had accumulated from the various regimental grants and which was managed by the officers for the benefit of their own mess. The officers were compelled to yield, so far had revolutionary license supplanted royal and military authority. Of course a general orgy followed. It seems to have been during these days that the scheme of Corsican liberation which brought him finally into the field of politics took shape in Napoleon's mind. Fesh had returned to Corsica and had long kept his nephew thoroughly informed of the situation. By the anarchy prevailing all about him in France, and beginning to prevail in Corsica, his eyes were opened to the possibilities of the revolution for one who knew how to take advantage of the change yet ordered. The appearance of Bonaparte in his twentieth year was not in general noteworthy. His head was shapely, but not uncommon in size, Altdorf disproportionate to the frame which bore it. His forehead was wide and off medium height, on each side long chestnut hair lanky as we may suppose from his own account of his personal habits fell in stiff, flat locks over his lean cheeks. His eyes were large, and in their steel blue irises, lurking under deep arched and projecting brows, was a penetrating quality which veiled the mind within. The nose was straight and shapely, the mouth large, the lips full and sensuous although the powerful projecting chin diminished somewhat the true effect of the lower one. His complexion was sallow. The frame of his body was in general small and fine, particularly his hands and feet semicolon but his deep chest and short neck were huge. This lack of proportion did not, however, interfere with his gait, which was firm and steady. The student of character would have declared the stripling to be self-reliant and secretive, ambitious and calculating, masterful, but kindly. In an age when phrenology was a mania, its masters found in his cranium the organs of what they called imagination and causality, of individuality, comparison, and locality by which jargon they meant to say that he had a strong power of imaging and of inductive ear reasoning, a knowledge of men, of places and of things. The life of the young officer had thus far been so commonplace as to awaken little expectation for his future. Poor as he was, and careful of his slim resources, he had, like the men of his class, indulged his passions to a certain degree, but he had not been riotous in his living, and he had so far not a debt in the world. What his education and reading were makes clear that he could have known nothing with a scholar's comprehensive thoroughness except the essentials of his profession. But he could master details as no man before or since, he had a vast fund of information, and a historic outline drawn in fair proportion and powerful strokes. His philosophy was meager, but Heck knew the principles of Rousseau and Reynal thoroughly, his conception of politics and men was not scientific, 
but it was clear and practical. The trade of arms had not been to his taste. He heartily disliked routine, and despised the petty duties of his rank. His profession, however, was a means to an end, of any mastery of strategy, tactics or even interest in them he had as yet given no sign, but was absorbed in contemplating and analyzing the exploits of the great world conquerors. In particular his mind was dazzled by the splendors of the Orient as the only field on which an Alexander Kaldave displayed himself, and he knew what but a few great minds have grasped, that the interchange of relations between the East and the West had been the life of the world. The greatness of England who understood to be largely due to her bestriding the two hemispheres. Up to this moment he had been a theorist, and might have wasted his fine powers by further indulgence in dazzling generalizations, as so many boys do when not called to test their hypotheses by experience. Henceforward he was removed from this temptation. A plan for an elective council in Corsica to replace that of the nobles, and for a local militia, having been matured, he was a cautious and practical experimenter from the moment he left Hawks on. Thus far he had put into practice none of his fine thoughts, nor the lessons learned in books. The family destitution had made him a solicitor of favors, and, but for the turn in public affairs, he might have continued to be one. His own inclinations had made him both a good student and a poor officer semicolon without a field for larger duties, he might have remained as he was. In Corsica his line of conduct was not changed abruptly, their possibilities of greater things dawning gradually, the application of great conceptions already formed, came with the march of events, note like the sun bursting out from behind a cloud. Travelling by way of X. Napoleon took the unlucky Lucian with him. This wayward but independent younger brother, making no allowance, Ash tells us in his published memoirs, for the disdain an older boy a ghoul is supposed to feel for a younger one, blood relative or not, had been repelled by the cold reception his senior had given him at Brian. Having left that school against the advice of the same would be mentor, his suit for admission to X had been fruitless. Necessity was driving him homeward, and the two who in after days regained to be separated were now, for almost the only time in their lives, companions for a considerable period. Their intercourse made them no more harmonious in feeling. The only incident of the journey was a visit to the Abbe Reynal at Marseille. We would gladly know something of the talk between the master and the pupil but we do not. Napoleon found no change in the circumstances of the Bonaparte family. The old archdeacon was still living, and for the moment Al except Elisa were at home. On the whole, they were more needy than the. The death of their patron, Marbuf, had been followed by their final rejection of their long-urged suit, and this fact, combined with political opinions of the elder Lucian, was beginning to wean them from the official clique. There were the same factions as before the official party and the patriots. Since the death of Charles de Bonaparte, the former had been represented at Versailles by Butterfuoco, Choi Isil's unworthy instrument in acquiring the island, and now, as then, an uninfluential and consequential self-seeker. Its members were all aristocrats and royalist in politics. The higher priesthood were of similar mind and had chosen the Abbe Peretti to present them. The parish priests, as in France, were with the people. Both the higher classes were comparatively small, in spite of twenty years of peace under French rule, they were both excessively unpopular, and utterly without any hold on the islanders. They had been partisan with an influential name, a son of the old-time patriot Gaffery, the father-in-law of Butterfuoco. The overwhelming majority of the natives were little changed in their temper. There were the old, unswerving patriots who wanted absolute independence, and were no called paolists, there were the self styled patriots, the younger men, who wanted a protectorate that they might enjoy virtual independency and secure a career by peace. There was in the harbour towns on the eastern slope the same submissive, peace loving temper as of old, and west the same fiery, warlike spirit. Corti was the centre of Paoli's power, Calvi was the seat of French influence, Bastia was radical, Ajaxio was about equally divided between the younger and older parties, 
with a strong infusion of official influence. Both the representatives of the people in the National Convention were of the Moderate Party, one of them, Sir Lissetti, was a man of ability, a friend of the Bonapartes, and destined later to influence deeply the course of their affairs. He and his colleague Colonel were urging on National Assembly measures for the local administration of Thieland. To this faction, as to the other, it had become clear that if Corsica was to reap the benefits of the new era it must be by union under Paoli. All, old and young alike, desired a thorough reform of the barbarous jurisprudence, and, like all other French subjects, a free press, free trade, the abolition of all privilege, equality in taxation, eligibility to office without regard to rank, and their diminution of monastic revenues for the benefit of education. Now air could such changes be more easily made than in a land just emerging from barbarism, where old institutions were disappearing and new on were still fluid. Paoli himself had come to believe that independence could more easily be secured from a regenerated France, and with her help, than by a warfare which might again arouse the ambition of Genoa. Bonaparte's natural associates were the younger men Masseria, son of far patriot line, Postso di Borgo, Peraldi, Cuneo, Ramellini, and other less influential. The only Corsican with French military training, Q was, in view of uncertainties and probabilities already on the horizon, a person of considerable consequence. His contribution to Theshemes of the young patriots was significant, it consisted in a proposal to form a body of local militia for the support of that central committee which his friends so ardently desired. The plan was promptly adopted by the associates, the radicals seeing in it a means to put arms once more into the hands of the people, the others no doubt having in mind the storming of the Bastille and the possibility of similar movements in Ajaxio and elsewhere. Bonaparte, the only trained officer among them, may have dreamed of abandoning the French service, and of a supreme command in Corsica. Many of the people who appeared well disposed toward France had from time to time received permission from the authorities to carry arms, many carried themes accurately and without a license, but proportionately there were so few in both classes that vigorous or successful armed resistance was in most places impracticable. The attitude of the Department of War at Paris was regulated by but a few ago, and was of course hostile to thin sidious scheme of a local militia. The Minister of War would do nothing but submit the suggestion to the body against whose influence it was aimed, the hated Council of Twelve Nobles. The stupid sarcasm of such a step was well nigh criminal. Under such instigation, the flames of discontent broke out in Corsica. Paoli's agents were again most active. In many towns, the people rose to attack the citadels or barracks, and to seize the authority. In Ajaxio Napoleon de Bonaparte promptly asserted himself as the natural leader. The already existing democratic club was rapidly organized into the nucleus of a home guard, and recruited in numbers. But there were none of Paoli's mountaineers to aid the unwarlike burghers, as there had been in Bastia. Gaffery appeared on the scene, but neither the magic of his name, the troops that accompanied him, nor the adverse representations of the council, which he brought with him, could allay the discontent. He therefore remained for three days in seclusion, and then departed in secret. On the other hand, their populace was intimidated, permitting without resistance the rooms of the club to be closed by the troops, and the town to be put under martial law. Nothing remained for the agitators but to protest and disperse. They held a final meeting, therefore, on October 31, 1789, in one of the churches, and signed an appeal to the National Assembly, to be presented by Solicetti and Colonna. It had been written, and was read aloud, by Bonaparte, as he now signed himself. 19. Some share in its composition was later claimed for Joseph, but the fiery style, the numerous blunders in grammar and spelling, the terse thought, and the concise form, are out characteristic of Napoleon. The right of petition, the recital of unjust acts, the illegal action of the council, the use of force, the hollowness of the pretexts under which their request had been fused, the demand that the troops be withdrawn and redress granted all these are crudely but forcibly presented. The document presages revolution. 
under a well-constituted and regular authority, its writer and signatories would of course have been punished for insubordination. Even as things were, an officer of the king was running serious risks by his prominence in connection with it. Footnote 19, printed in Coaston, 2, 94. Discouraging as was the outcome of this movement in Ajaxio, similar agitations elsewhere were more successful. The men of Isola Rossa, under Arena, who had just returned from a consultation with Paoli in England, were entirely successful in seizing the supreme authority, so ere those of Bastia, under Murati, a devoted friend of Paoli. An untrustworthy authority, a personal enemy of Bonaparte, declares Thavlata, thwarted in his own town, at once went over to Bastia, then the residence of General de Barin, the French royalist governor, and successfully directed the revolt in that place, but there is no corroborative evidence to this doubtful story. Simultaneously with these events the National Assembly had been baiting how the position of the king under the new constitution was to be expressed by his title. Absolutism being ended. He could no longer be king of France, a style which to men then living implied ownership. King of the French was selected as the new form, showed the Adand of Navarre. Solicetti, with consummate diplomacy, had already warned many of his fellow delegates of the danger lest England should intervene in Corsica, and France lose one of her best recruiting grounds. To his compatriots he set forth that France was best protector, whether they desired partial or complete independence. He now suggested that if the assembly thus recognized the separate identity of the Pyrenean people, they must supplement the phrase still further by the words and of Corsica, for it had been only nominally, and as a pledge, that Genoa in 1768 had put France in control. At this stage of the debate, Volney presented a number of formal demands from the Corsican patriots asking that the position of their country be defined. One of these papers certainly came from Bastia, among them also was probably the document which had been executed at Ajaxio. This was the culmination of the skillful revolutionary agitation which had been started and directed by Masario under Paoli's guidance. The anomalous position of both Corsica and Navarre was clearly depicted in the mere presentation of such petitions. If the Navarrese are not French, what have we to doubt them, or they with us? said Meyerup. The argument was as soon answerable for one land as for the other, and both were incorporated in the realm, Corsica on November 30, by a proposition of Solicetes, who was apparently unwilling, but who posed as one under imperative necessity. In reality he had reached the goal for which he had long been striving. Dumarias, later so renowned as a general, and Myrab, the great statesman and orator, had both been members of the French army of occupation which reduced Corsica to submission. Thielatter now recalled his misdeed with sorrow and shame in an impassioned plea for amnesty to all political offenders, including Paoli. There was bitter opposition, but the great orator prevailed. The news was received in Corsica with every manifestation of joy. Semicolon bonfires were lighted, and dooms were sung in the churches. Paolito rejoined his own again. What more could disinterested patriots desire? Corsica, a province of France. How could her aspiring youth secure a wider field for the exercise of their powers, and the attainment of ambitious ends? The desires of both parties were temporarily fulfilled. The names of Myrab, Solicetti, and Volney were shouted with acclaim, those of Butterfuogo and Peretti with reprobation. The regular troops were withdrawn from Ajaxio, the ascendancy of the liberals was complete. Then feeble Genoa was heard once more. She had pledged their sovereignty, not sold it, had yielded its exercise, and not the thing itself. France might administer the government as she chose, but annexation was another matter. She appealed to the fairness of the king and the National Assembly to safeguard her treaty rights. Her tone was querulous, her words without force. In the assembly their protest was but fuel to the fire. On January 21, 1790, occurred an animated debate in which the matter was fully considered. The discussion was notable, as indicating the temper of parties and the nature of their action at that stage of the revolution. Mirabas ever was the leader. 
He and his friends were scornful not only because of Genoa's temerity in seeming still to claim what France had conquered, but of her conception that mere paper contracts were binding where principles of public law were concerned. The opposition mildly but firmly recalled the existence of other nations than France, and suggested the consequences of international bad faith. The conclusion of the matter was the adoption of a cunning and insolent combination of two propositions, one made by each side, to lay the request on the table, or to explain that there is no occasion for its consideration. The incident is otherwise important only in the light of Napoleon's future dealings with the Italian Commonwealth. The situation was now most delicate, as far as Bonaparte was concerned. His suggestion of a local militia contemplated the extension of the revolutionary movement to Corsica. His appeal to the National Assembly demanded merely the right to do what one French city or district after another had done, to establish local authority, to form a national guard, and to unfurl the red, white, and blue. There's nothing in it about the incorporation of Corsica in France, that had come to pass through the insurgents of Bastia, who had been organized by Paoli, inspired by the attempt at Ajaxio, and guided at least by Solicetti. A little later Bonaparte took pains to set forth how much better, under his plan, would have been the situation of Corsican affairs if, with their guard organized and their colors mounted, they could have recalled Paoli, and have awaited the event with power either to reject such propositions as the royalists, if successful, would have made, or to accept the conclusions of the French assembly with proper self-respect and not on compulsion. Hitherto he had lost no opportunity to express his hatred of France. Semicolon. It is possible that he had planned the virtual independence of Corsica, with himself as the liberator, or at least as Paoli's San Biero. The reservations of his Ajaxio document, and the bitterness of his feelings, are not, however, sufficient proof of such a presumption. But the incorporation had taken place, Corsica was a portion of France and everybody was wild with delight. Chapter 10. First Lessons in Revolution. French soldier and Corsican patriot, Paoli's hesitancy, his return to Corsica, cross-purposes in France, a new furlough, money transactions of Napoleon and Joseph, open hostilities against France, address to the French Assembly, the Bastille uprising, reorganization of Corsican administration, meeting of Napoleon and Paoli. Corsican Politics, Studies and Society. Side note, 1790. What was to be the future of one whose feelings were so hostile to the nation with the fortunes of which he now seemed irrevocably identified? There is no evidence that Bonaparte ever asked himself such disquieting questions. To judge from his conduct, he was not in the least troubled. Fully aware of the disorganization, both social and military, which was well nigh universal in France, with two months more of his furlough yet unexpired, he awaited developments, not hastening to meet difficulties before they presented themselves. What the young Democrats could do, they did. The town government was entirely reorganized, with a friend of the Bone Apparts as mayor, and Joseph employed at last exclamation mark as his secretary. A local guard was all zorist and equipped. Being French, However, and not Corsican, Napoleon could not accept a command in it, for he was already an officer in the French army. But he served in the ranks as a common soldier, and was an ardent agitator in the club, which almost immediately reopened its doors. In the impossibility of further action there was a real absent authorship. The history of Corsica was again revised, though not softened. The letters into which it was divided were addressed to Raynal. In collaboration with Fesch, Bonaparte also drew up a memoir on the oath which was required from priests. When Paoli first received news of the amnesty granted at the instant to Alf Myrab, and of the action taken by the French Assembly, which had made Corsica a French department, he was delighted and deeply moved. His noble instincts told him at once that he could no longer live in the enjoyment of an English pension or even in England, for he was convinced that his country would eventually reach a more perfect autonomy under France than under the wing of any other power, and that as a patriot he must not fail even in appearance to maintain that position. 
but he also felt that his return to Corsica would endanger the success of this policy. The ardent mountaineers would demand more extreme measures for complete independence than he could take, the lowlanders would be angry at the attitude of sympathy with his old friends which he must assume. In a spirit of self-sacrifice, therefore, he made ready to exchange his comfortable exile for owner more uncongenial and of course more bitter dot but the National Assembly, with less insight, desired nothing so meek as his presence in the new French department. He was growing old and he yielded against his better judgment to the united solicitation of French interest and of Corsican impolicy. Passing through France, he was detained for over two months by the ovations forced upon him. In Paris the king urged him to accept honours of every kind, but they were firmly refused, the reception, however, which the assembly gave him in the name of liberty, he declared to be the proudest occasion of his life. At Lyon the populace crowded the streets to cheer him, and legations from the chief towns of his native island met him to solicit for each of their respective cities the honour of his landing. On July 14, 1790, after 21 years of exile, the Najd hero set foot on Corsican land at Maginot, near Carpo Corso. His first act was to kneel and kiss the soil. The nearest town was Bastia, the revolutionary capital. There and elsewhere the rejoicings were general, and the ceremonies were such as only the warm hearts and willing hands of a primitive Italian people could devise and perform. Not one true Corsican but must see and hear and touch him. But in less than a month his conduct was, as he had foreseen, some as represented by friend and foe alike, that it was necessary to defend him in Paris against the charge of scheming to hand over Thieland to England. It is not entirely clear where Bonaparte was during this time. It is said that he was seen in Valence during the latter part of January, and the fact is adduced to show how deep and secret were his plans for preserving the double chance of an opening in either France or Corsica, as matters might turn out. The love affair to which he refers in that thesis on the topic to which reference has been made would be an equally satisfactory explanation, considering his age. Whatever waste the fact as to those few days, he was not absent long. The serious division between the executive in France and the new assembly came to light in an ugly circumstance which occurred in March. On the 18th the French flotilla unexpectedly appeared off Street Florent. It was commanded by Raleigh an ardent royalist, who had long been employed in Corsica. His secret instructions were to embark the French troops, and to leave the island to its fate. This was an adroit stab at the Republicans of the Assembly, for, should the evacuation be secured, it was believed that either the radicals in Corsica would rise, overpower, and destroy the friends of France, call in English help, and diminish the number of democratic departments by one, or that Genoa would immediately step in and reassert her sovereignty. The moderates of Street Florent were not to be thus duped, sharp and angry discussions arose among both citizens and troops as to the obediency due to such orders, and soon both soldiers and townsfolk were in a frenzy of excitement. A collision between the two parties occurred, and Raleigh was killed. Papers were found on his person which proved that his sympathizers would gladly have abandoned Corsica to its fate. For the moment the young Corsicans were more devoted than ever to Paoli, since now only through his good offices with the French assembly could a chance for the success of their plans be secured. Such was the diversity of opinion as to ways and means, as to sources, opportunities, and details that everything was, for the moment, in confusion. On April 16 Bonaparte applied for an extension of his furlough until the following October, on the plea of continued ill health, that he might drink the waters a second time at Oestsa, whose springs, he explained, had shown themselves to be facetious in his complaint. He may have been at that resort on sea before, or he may not. Doubtless the fever was still lingering in his system. What the degree of his illness was we cannot tell. It may have unfitted him for active service with his regiment, it did not disable him from pursuing his occupations in writing and political agitation. His request was granted on May 20. The history of Corsica was now finally revised, 
and the new dedication completed. This, with a letter and some chapters of the book, was forwarded to Raynal, probably by post. Joseph, who was one of the delegates to meet Paoli, would pass through Marseille, wrote Napoleon to the Abbe, and would hand him the rest if he should so desire. The text of the unlucky book was not materially altered. Its theory appears always to have been that history is but a succession of great names, and the story, therefore, is more a biographical record than a connected narrative. The dedication, however, was a new step in the painful progress of more accurate thinking and better expression. The additions to the volume contained, amid many immaturities and platitudes, some ripe and clever thought. Bonaparte's passion for his bantling was once more the ardor of a misdirected genius unsullied by the desire for money, which had played a temporary part. We know nothing definite of his pecuniary affairs, but somehow other his fortunes must have mended. There is no other explanation of his numerous and costly journeys, and we hear that for a time he had money in his purse. In the will which he dictated at St. Helena is a bequest of 100,000 francs to the children of his friend who was the first mayor of Ajaxio by the popular will. It is not unlikely that the legacy was a grateful souvenir of advances made about this time. There is another possible explanation. The club of Ajaxio had chosen a delegation, of which Joseph Bonaparte was a member, to bring Paoli home from France. To meet its expenses. The municipality had forced the authorities of the priest's seminary to open their strong box and to hand over upward of 2,000 francs. Napoleon may have shared Joseph's portion. We should be reminded in such a stroke, but with a difference, to be sure, of what happened when, a few years later, the hungry and ragged soldiers of the Republic were led into the fat plains of Lombardy. The contemptuous attitude of the Ajaxio liberals toward the religion of Rome seriously alienated the superstitious populace from them. Bonaparte was once attacked in the public square by a procession organized to deprecate the policy of the National Assembly with regard to the ecclesiastical estates. One of the few royalist officials left in Corsica also took advantage of the general disorder to express his feelings plainly as to the acts of the same body. He was arrested, tried in Ajaxio, and acquitted by a sympathetic judge. At once the liberals took alarm, their club and the officials first protested, and then on June 25 assumed the offensive in the name of the assembly. It was on this occasion probably that he was seen by the family friend who narrated his memories to the English diarist already mentioned. I remember to have seen Napoleon very active among the enraged populace against those then called aristocrats, and running through the streets of Ajaxio so busy in promoting dissatisfaction that, though he lost his hat, he did not feel nor care for the effects of the scorching sun to which he was exposed the whole of that memorable day. The revolution having struck its poisonous root, Napoleon never ceased stirring up his brothers, Joseph and Lucian, who, being moved at his instance, were constantly attending clubs and popular meetings where they often delivered speeches and debated public matters, while Napoleon sat listening in silence, as he had not earned for oratory. One day in December, the narrator continues, I was sent for by his uncle already mentioned, in order to assist him in preparing his testament, and, after having settled his family concerns, the conversation turned upon politics, when, speaking of the probability of Italy being revolutionized, Napoleon, then present, quickly replied, had I the command, I would take Italy in twenty-four hours. Twenty, footnote twenty, correspondence of Sir John Sinclair, I, forty-seven. At last the opportunity to emulate the French cities seemed assured. It was determined to organize a local independent government, seize its citadel with the help of the Home Guard, and throw the hated royalists into prison. But the preparations were too open, the governor and most of his friends fled in season to their stronghold, and raised the drawbridge. The agitators could lay hands on but four of their enemies, among whom were the judge, the offender, and an officer of the garrison. So great was the disappointment of the radicals that they would have vented their spite on these, it was with difficulty that the lives of the prisoners were saved by the efforts of the militia officers. The garrison really sympathized with the insurgents, 
and would not obey orders to suppress the rising by an attack. In return for this forbearance the regular soldiers stipulated for the liberation of their officer. In the end the chief offenders among the radicals were punished by imprisonment or banished, and the tumult subsided, but the French officials now had strong support, not only from the hierarchy, as before, but from the plain pious people and their priests. This result was a second defeat for Napoleon Bonaparte, who was most certainly the instigator and leader of the uprising. He had been ready at any moment to assume the direction of affairs, but had gained the outcome of such a movement as could alone secure a possible temporary independence for Corsica and a military command for himself was absolutely naught. Little perturbed by failure, he took up the Pento right to proclamation justifying the action of the municipal authorities. The paper was dated October 31, 1789, and fearlessly signed both by himself and the other leaders, including the mayor. It execrates the sympathizers with the old order in France, and lords the assembly, with all its works, denounces those who sold Thieland to France, which could offer nothing but an end of the chain that bound her, and warns the enemies of the new constitution that their day is over. There is a longing reference to the ideal self-determination which the previous attempt might have secured. The present rising is justified, however as an effort to carry out the principles of the new charter. 21. There are the same suggested force and suppressed free as in his previous manifesto, the same fervid rhetoric, the same a lack of coherence in expression. The same two elements, that of 18th century metaphysics and that of his own uncultured force, combine in the composition. Naturally enough, the unrest of the town was not diminished. There was even a slight collision between the garrison and the civil authorities. Footnote 21, for the text see Napoleon in Q, 2, 92. Bonaparte was of course suspected and hated by Catholics and military alike. French officer though he was, no one in Corsica thought of him otherwise than as a Corsican revolutionist. Among his own friends he continued his unswerving career. It was he who was chosen to write the address from Ajaxio to Paoli, although the two men did not meet until somewhat later. With the arrival of the great liberator the grasp of the old officials on the island relaxed, and the bluster of the few who had grown rich in the royal service ceased. The assembly was finally triumphant, this new department was at last to be organized like those of the adoptive mother. It was high time for the public order was seriously endangered in this transition period. Their disturbances at Ajaxio had been trifling compared with the evolutionary procedure inaugurated and carried to extremes in Bastia. This city being the capital and residence of the governor, Bonaparte and his comrades had no sooner completed their address to the French assembly than they hurried thither to beard de Baron and revolutionize the garrison. Their success was complete garrison and citizens alike were roused and the governor cowed. Both soldiers and people assumed the tricolor cockade on November 5, 1789. Baronvin assented to the formation of a national militia. On this base ice order was established. This was another affair from that at Ajaxio and attracted the attention of the Paris Assembly, strongly influencing the government in its arrangements with Paoli, the young Bonaparte was naturally very uneasy as to his position and saw Maine fairly quiet until February, when the incorporation of Thieland with France was completed. Immediately he gave free vent to high snedges. Two letters of Napoleon's written in August, 1790, display a feverish spirit of unrest in himself, and enumerate the many uprisings in the neighborhood with their varying degrees of success. Under provisional authority, arrangements were made, after some delay, to hold elections for the officials of the new system whose legal designation was directors. Their appointment and conduct would be determinative of Corsica's future, and were therefore of the highest importance. In a pure democracy the voters assembled to deliberate and record their decisions. Such were the local district meetings in Corsica. Thysicos, the representatives to the Central Constituent Assembly which was to meet at Orestsa on September 9, 1790. Joseph Bonaparte and Fesch were among the members sent from Ajaxio. 
the healing waters which Napoleon wished to quaff at or as a worthy influence of the debates. Although he could not be a member of the assembly on account of his youth, he was determined to be present. The three relatives travelled from their home in company, Joseph enchanted by the scenery, Napoleon studying the strategic points on the way. In order that his presence at Orestsa might not unduly affect the course of events, Paoli had delicately chosen as his temporary home the village of Rostino, which was on their route. Here occurred the meeting between the two great Corsicans, the man of ideas and the man of action. No doubt Paoli was anxious to win a family so important and a patriot sordant. In any case, he invited the three young men to accompany him over the fatal battleground of Ponte Nuovo. If it had really been Napoleon's ambition to become the chief of the French National Guard for Corsica, which would now, in all probability, be fully organized, it is very likely that he would have exerted himself to secure the favor of the only man who could fulfill his desire. There is, however, a tradition which tends to show quite the contrary, it is said that after Paoli had pointed out the disposition of his troops for Theophatil conflict Napoleon dryly remarked, the result of these arrangements was just what it was bound to be. Among the Emperor's reminiscences at the close of his life, he recalled this meeting, because Paoli had on that occasion declared him to be a man of ancient mould, like one of Plutarch's heroes. The constituent assembly at Orestsa sat for a month. Its sessions passed almost without any incident of importance except the first appearance of Napoleon as an orator in various public meetings held in connection with its labours. He is said to have been bashful and embarrassed in his beginnings, but, inspirited by each occasion, to have become more fluent, and finally to have won the attention and applause of his hearers. What he said is not known, but he spoke in Italian, and succeeded in his design of being at least a personage in the pregnant events now occurring. Both parties were represented in the proceedings and conclusions of the convention. Corsica was to constitute but a single department. Paoli was elected president of its directory and commander-in-chief of its National Guard, a combination of offices which again made him virtual dictator. He accepted them unwillingly, but the honors of a statue and an annual grant of $10,000, which were voted at the same time, he absolutely declined. The Paolist party secured the election of Canon Belsas vice president, of Panathari as secretary, of Arena as Solisetti substitute, of Postso di Borgo and Gentili as members of the directory. Colonna, one of the delegates to the National Assembly, was a member of the same group. The younger patriots, or young Corsica, as we shall say now, perhaps, were represented by their delegate and leader Solisetti, who was chosen as plenipotentiary in Butterfuoco's place, and by Multido, Gentili and Pompey as members of the directory. For the moment, however, Paoli was Corsica, and such petty politics was significant only as indicating the survival of countercurrents. For some dissent to a vote of censure passed upon the conduct of Butterfuoco and Peretti, but it was insignificant. Postso di Borgo and Gentili were chosen to declare at the bar of the National Assembly the devotion of Corsica to its purposes, and to the course of reform ace represented by it. They were also to secure, if possible, both their permission to form a departmental national guard, and the means to pay and arm it. The choice of Postso di Borgo for a mission of such importance and preference to Joseph was a disappointment to the Bonapartes. In fact, not one of the plans concerted by the two brothers succeeded. Joseph sustained the pretensions of Ajaxia to be capital of the island, but honor was awarded to Bastia. He was not elected a member of the general directory, though he succeeded in being made a member for Ajaxio in the district directory. Whether to work off his ill humor, or from far-seeing purpose, Napoleon used the hours not spent in wire pulling and listening to the proceedings of the assembly for making a series of excursions which were a virtual canvas of the neighborhood. The houses of the poorest were his resort, partly by heist and born power of pleasing, partly by diplomacy, he won their hearts and all he and their inmost feelings. His purse, which was for the moment full, was open for their gratification in a way which moved them deeply. For years target practice had been forbidden, 
as giving dangerous skill in the use of arms. Liberty having returned, Napoleon organized many of the old rural festivals in which contests of that nature had been the chief feature, offering prizes from his own means for the best marksmen among the youth. His success in feeling the pulse of public opinion was so great that he never forgot the lesson. Not long afterward, in the neighborhood of Valence, comma, in fact, to the latest times, comma, he courted the society of the lowly, and established, when possible, a certain intimacy with them. This gave him popularity, while at the same time it enabled him to obtain the most valuable indications of the general temper. Chapter 11. Traits of Character. Literary Work. The Leon Prize, Essay on Happiness, Thwarted Ambition, The Corsican Patriots, The Brothers Napoleon and Louis, Studies in Politics, Reorganization of the Army, The Change in Public Opinion, A New Leave of Absence, Napoleon Again at Auxon, Napoleon as a Teacher, Further Literary Efforts, The Sentimental Journey, His Attitude Toward Religion. Side Note, 1791. On his return to Ajaxio, the rising agitator continued as before to frequent his club. The action of the convention at Orestso in displacing Butterfioco had inflamed the young politicians still more against the renegade. This effect was further heightened when it was known that, at the reception of their delegates by the National Assembly, the Greater Council had, under Myrab's leadership, virtually taken the same position regarding both him and his clique. Napoleon had written, probably in the previous year, a notorious diatribe against Butterfioco in the form of a letter to its object and the very night on which the news from Paris was received, he seized the opportunity to read it before the club at Ajaxio. The paper, as now in existence, is pompously dated January 23, 1791, from my summer house of Milai. This was the retreat on any of the little family properties to which reference has been made. There in the rocks was a grotto known familiarly by that name semicolon Napoleon had improved and beautified the spot, using it, as he did his garden at Brienne, for contemplation and quiet study. Although the letter to Matto Butterfuoco has been often printed, and was its author's first successful effort in writing, much emphasis should not be laid on it except in noting the better power to express tumultuous feeling and in marking the implications which show an expansion of character. Insubordinate to France it certainly is, and intemperate semicolon turgid, too, as any youth of twenty could well make it. No doubt, also, it was intended to secure notoriety for the writer. It makes as clear the thorough apprehension its author had as to the radical character of the revolution. It is his final and public renunciation of the royalist principles of Charles de Bonaparte. It contains also the last profession of morality which a youth is not ashamed to make before the cynicism of his own life becomes too evident for the castigation of selfishness and insincerity in others. Its substance is a just reproach to a selfish dreamer, the froth and scum are a characteristic rather of the time and the circumstances than of the personality behind them. There is no further mention of a difference between the destinies of France and Corsica. To compare the pamphlet with even the poorest work of Rousseau, as has often been done, is absurd, to vilify it as ineffective trash is equally so. As may be imagined, the letter was received with mad applause, and ordered to be printed. It was now the close of January, Bonaparte's leave had expired on October 15. On November 16, after loitering a whole month beyond his time, he had secured a document from the Ajaxio officials certifying that both he and Louis were devoted to the new Republican order, and bespeaking assistance for both in any difficulties which might arise. The busy Corsican perfectly understood that he might already at that time be regarded as a deserter in France, but still he continued his dangerous loitering. He had two objects in view, one literary, one political. Besides the successful letter he had been occupied with a second composition, the notion of which had probably occupied him as his purse grew Ledner. The jury before which this was to be laid was to be, however, not a heated body of young political agitators, but an association of old and mature men with calm, critical minds the Leon Academy. 
that society was finally about to award a prize of 1500 livres funded by Reynal long before as early as 1780 for the best thesis on the question. Has the discovery of America been useful or hurtful to the human race? If the former, how shall we best preserve and increase the benefits? If the latter, how shall we remedy the evils? Americans must regret that the learned body had been compelled for lack of interest in so concrete a subject to change the theme, and now offered in its place the question, what truths and ideas should be inculcated in order best to promote the happiness of mankind. Napoleon's astounding paper on this remarkable theme was finished in December. It bears the marks of carelessness, haste, and overconfidence in every direction in style, in content, and in lack of accuracy. Illustrious Raynal, writes the author, the question I am about to discuss is worthy of your steel. But without assuming to be metal of the same temper, I have taken courage, saying to myself with Correggio, I, too, am a painter. Thereupon follows a long encomium upon Paoli, whose principal merit is explained to have been that he strove in his legislation to keep for every man a property sufficient with moderate exertion on his own part for the sustenance of life. Happiness consists in living conformably to the constitution of our organization. Wealth is a misfortune, primogeniture a relic of barbarism, celibacy a reprehensible practice. Our animal nature demands food, shelter, clothing, and the companionship of woman. These the essentials of happiness, but for its perfection we require both reason and sentiment. These theses are the tolerable portions, being discussed with some coherence. But much of the essay is mere meaningless rhetoric and bombast, which sounds like the effusion of a boyish rhapsodist. At the sound of your, reasons voice let the enemies of nature be still, and swallow their serpents' tongues in rage. The eyes of reason restrain mankind from the precipice of the passions, as her decrees modify likewise the feeling of their rights. Many other passages of equal absurdity could be quoted, full of a fetched metaphor, abounding in strange terms, straining rhetorical figures to distortion. 22, and yet in spite of the bombast, Certain essential Napoleonic ideas appear in the paper much as they endured to the end, namely, those on heredity, on the equal division of property, and on the nature of civil society. And there is one prophetic sentence which deserves to be quoted. A disordered imagination. Thrill lies the cause and source of human misfortune. It sends us wandering from sea to sea, from fancy to fancy, and when at last it grows calm opportunity has passed. The hour strikes, and its possessor disabhorring life. In later days the author threw what he probably supposed was the only existing manuscript of this vaporing effusion into the fire. But a copy of it had been made at Lyon, perhaps because one of the judges thought, as he said, that it might have been written by a man otherwise gifted with common sense. Another has been found among the papers confided by Napoleon to Fesch. The proofs of authenticity are complete. It seems miraculous that its writers would have become, as he did, master of a concise and nervous style when once his words became the complement of his deeds. Footnote 22, these phrases may nearly all be found in the notes which he had taken or jottings he had made while reading Voltaire and Rousseau, Napoleon in Coup, 2, 209-292. The second cause for Bonaparte's delay in returning to France on the expiration of his furlough was his political and military ambition. This was suddenly quenched by the receipt of news that the Assembly at Paris would not create the longed for National Guard, nor the ministry lend itself to any plan for circumventing the law. It was, therefore, evident that every chance of becoming Paoli's lieutenant was finally gone. By the advice of the President himself, therefore, Bonaparte determined to withdraw once more to France and to await results. Corsica was still distracted. A French official sent by the War Department just at this time to report on its condition is not sparing of the language he uses to denounce the independent feeling and anti French sympathies of the people. The Italian, he says, acquiesces, but does not forgive, an ambitious man keeps no faith, and estimates his life by his power. 
The agent further describes the Corsicans as so accustomed to unrest by forty years of anarchy that he would gladly seize the first occasion to throw off the domination of laws which restrain the social disorder. The Bonaparte faction, enumerated with the patriot brigands Ampaglini at their head, he calls despicable creatures, ruined in reputation and credit. It would be hard to find a higher compliment to Paoli and his friends, considering the source from which these words emanated. They were Alpor and they were all in debt. Even now, in the age of reform, they saw their most cherished plans thwarted by the presence in every tone of garrisons composed of officers and men who, though long resident in the island, and attached to its people by many ties, re nevertheless conservative in their feelings, and, by the instinct of th tradition and discipline, devoted to the still powerful official boroughs not yet destroyed by the revolution. To replace these by all ill organized and equipped National Guard was now the most ardent wish of all patriots. There was nothing unworthy in Napoleon's longing for a command under the much desired but ever elusive reconstitution of a force organized and armed according to the model furnished by France itself. Repeated disappointments like those he had suffered for, and was experiencing again, would have crushed the spirit of a common man. But the young author had his manuscripts in his pocket, one of them he had means and authority to publish. Perfectly aware, moreover, of their dice organization in the nation and the army, careless of the order fulminated on December 2, 1790, against absent officers which Heck knew to be aimed especially at the young nobles who were deserting in troops, with his spirit undaunted, and his brain full of resources, he left Ajaxio on February 1, 1791, having secured a new set of certificates as to his patriotism and devotion to the cause of the revolution. Like the good son and the good brother which he had always been, He was not forgetful of his family. Life at his home had not become easier. Joseph, to be sure, had an office and a career, but the younger children were becoming a source of expense, and Lucian would not accept the provision which had been made for him. The next, now ready to be educated and placed, was Louis, a boy already between twelve and thirteen years old. Accordingly, Louis accompanied his brother. Napoleon had no promise not even an outlook, for the child semicolon but he determined to have him at hand in case anything should turn up, and while waiting, to give him from his own slender means weight of a precarious education the times and circumstances could afford. We can understand the untroubled confidence of the boy, we must admire their trust, determination, and self-reliance of the elder brother. Though he had overrun his leave for three and a half months, there was not only no severe punishment in store for Napoleon on his arrival at Auxon, but there was considerate regard, and, later, promotion. Officers with military training and loyal to the assembly were becoming scarce. The brothers had travelled slowly, stopping first for a short time at Marseille, and then at Aix to visit friends, wandering several days in a leisurely way through the parts of Dauphine round about Valence associating again with the country people, and forming opinions as to the course of affairs, Bonaparte reopened his correspondence with Fesh on February 8 from the hamlet of Serve in order to acquaint him with the news and the prospects of the country, describing in particular the formation of patriotic societies by all the towns to act in concert for carrying out the decrees of the assembly. 23. This beginning of Federation for the Revolution, as it was called, in its spread finally welded the whole country, civil and even military authorities, together. Napoleon's presence in the time and place of its beginning explains much that followed. It was February 13 when he rejoined his regiment. Footnote 23, I am in the cabin of a poor man whence I like to write you after long conversation with these good people. Nazica, p. 161. Comparatively short as had been the time of Bonaparte's absence, everything in France, even the army, had changed and was still changing. Step by step the most wholesome reforms were introduced a such in turn showed itself essential, promotion exclusively according to service among the lower officers, the same, 
with room for royal discretion, among the higher grades, division of the forces into gillas, reserves, and national guards, the two former to be still recruited by voluntary enlistment. The ancient and privileged constabulary, and many other formerly existing but inefficient army bodies, were swept away, and the present system of gendarmerie was created. The military courts, too, were reconstituted under an impartial body of martial law. Simple numbers were substituted for theticular distinctions hitherto used by the regiments, and a fair schedule of pay, pensions, and military honours abolished all chance for undue favouritism. The necessity of compulsory enlistment was urged be a few with all the energy of powerful conviction, but the plan was dismissed as despotic. The assembly debated as to whether, under the new system, king or people should wield the military power. They could find no satisfactory solution, and finally adopted a weak compromise which went far to destroy the power of Mirab, because carried through by him. The entire work of the commission was temporarily rendered worthless by these two essential defects there was no way of filling the ranks, no strong arm to direct the system. The first year of trial, 1790, had given the disastrous proof. By this time all monarchical and absolutist Europe was awakened against France, only a mere handful of enthusiastic men in England and America, still fewer elsewhere, were in sympathy with her efforts. The stolid common sense of the rest saw only ruin ahead, and Vodaskins the idealism of her unreal subtleties. The French nobles, sickened by the thought of reform, had continued their silly and wicked flight, the neighbouring powers, now preparing for an armed resistance to the spread of the revolution, were not slow to obey them in their schemes. On every border agencies for the encouragement of desertion were established, and by the opening of 1791 the effective fighting force of France was more than decimated. There was no longer any question of discipline, it was enough if any person worthy to command or serve could be retained. But the remedy for this disorganization was at hand. In the letter to Fesch, to which reference has already been made, Napoleon, after his observations among the people, wrote, I have everywhere found the peasants firm in the stirrups, steadfast in their opinions, especially in Dauphine. They are all disposed to perish in support of the Constitution. I saw what valence are resolute people, patriotic soldiers, and aristocratic ices. There are, however, some exceptions. For the president of the club is a captain named Duserb. He is captain in the regiment of Fores in garrison at Valence. The women are everywhere royalist. It is not amazing, liberty is a prettier woman than they, and eclipses them. All the parish priests of Dauphine have taken the civic oath semicolon they make sport of the bishop's outcry. What is called good society is three fourths aristocratic, that is. They disguise themselves as admirers of the English constitution. What a concise, terse sketch of that rising tide of national feeling which was soon to make good all defects and to fill all gaps in the new military system, put the army as part of the nation under their popular assembly, knit regulars, reserves, and home guard into one, and give moral support to enforcing the proposal for compulsory enlistment. This movement was Bonaparte's opportunity. Declaring that he had twice endeavoured since the expiration of his extended furlough to cross into France, he produced certificates to that effect from authorities of Ajaccio, and begged for his pay and allowances since that date. His request was granted. It is impossible to deny the truth of his statement, or the genuineness of his certificates. But both we loose perversions of a half-truth shifts palliated by the uncertainties of a revolutionary epoch. A habitual casuistry is further shown in an interesting letter written at the same time to M. James, a business friend of Joseph Suchelans, in which there occurs a passage of double meaning, to the effect that his elder brother hopes to come in person the following year as deputy to the National Assembly, which was no doubt true, for, in spite of being incapacitated by age, he had already sat in the Corsican Convention and in the Ajaxio Councils. But the imperfect French of the passage could also mean, and, casually read, does carry the idea, that Joseph, being already a deputy, 
would visit his friend the following year in person. Bonaparte's connection with his old regiment was soon to be broken. He joined it on February 13, he left it on June 14. With these four months, his total service was five years and nine months, but he had been absent, with or without leave, something more than half the time. His old friends in Auxon were few in number, if indeed there were any at all. No doubt his fellow officers were tired of performing the absentees' duties, and of good fellowship there could be in any case but little, with such difference of taste, politics, and fortune as there was between him and them. However, he made a few new friends, but it was in the main the old solitary life which he resumed. His own room was in a cheap lodging house, and, according to the testimony of a visitor, furnished with a wretchy junk curtained couch a table, and two chairs. Louis slept on a pallet in a closet nearby. All pleasures but those of hope were utterly banished from those plucky lives, while they studied in preparation for the examination which might admit the younger to his brother's corpse. The elder pinched and scraped to pay the younger's board semicolon himself, according to a probable but rather untrustworthy account, brushing his own clothes that they might last longer and supping often on dry bread. His only place of resort was the political club. One single pleasure he allowed himself the occasional purchase of some long coveted volume from the shelves of a town bookseller. 24, footnote 24, Napoleon in Coup, 2, 108 underscore et sec. Underscore of course neither authorship nor publication was forgotten. During these months were completed the two short pieces. A dialogue on love, and the acute reflections on the state of nature, from bot off which quotations have already been given. I too was once in love, he says of himself in the former. It could not well have been an Ajaxio, and it must have been the memories of the old valence, of a pleasant existence now ended, which called forth the doleful confession. It was the future Napoleon who was presaged in Theantilisis. I go further than the denial of its existence. I believe it is hurtful to society, to the individual welfare of men. The other trenchant document demolishes the cherished hypothesis of Rousseau as to man in a state of nature. The precious manuscripts brought from Corsica were sent to the only publisher in the neighborhood, at Diola. The much revised history was refused, the other whether by money is furnished from the Ajaxio club, or at the author's risk is not known was printed in a slim octavo volume of 21 pages, and published with the title, Letter of Bonaparte to Butterfugo. A copy was at once sent to Paoli with a renewed request for such documents as would enable the writer to complete his pamphlet on Corsica. The Patriot again replied in a very discouraging tone, Butterfugo was too contemptible for notice, the desired papers he was unable to send and such a boy could not in any case be a historian. Bonaparte was undismayed and continued his researches. Joseph was persuaded to add as solicitations for the desired papers to those of his brother, but too received a flat refusal. Short as was Bonaparte's residence at Auxon, he availed himself to the utmost of the slackness of discipline in order to gratify his curiosity as to the state of the country. He paid frequent visits to Marmont in Dijon, and he made what he called at St. Helena his sentimental journey to Nwitz in Burgundy. The account he gave last cases of the aristocracy in the little city, and of its assemblies at the mansion of a wine merchant's widow, is most entertaining. To his Ostgassendi and to the worthy mayor he aired his radical doctrines with great complacence, but according to his own account he had not the best of it in the discussions which ensued. Under the Empire Gassendi's son was a member of the Council of State, and in one of its sessions he dared to support some of his opinions by quoting Napoleon himself. The Emperor remembered perfectly the conversation at Nwit, but meaningly said that his friend must have been asleep and dreaming. Several traditions which throw some light on Bonaparte's attitude toward religion date from this last residence in Auxon. He had been prepared for confirmation at Brian by a confessor who was now in retirement at Dole, the same to whom when first consul he wrote an acknowledgment of his indebtedness, adding, without religion there is no happiness, no future possible. I commend me to your prayers.
their dwelling of this good man was the frequent girl of his walks abroad. Dot again, he once jocularly asked a friend who visited him in his room, if he had heard mass that morning, opening, as he spoke, a trunk, in which was the complete vestment of a priest. The regimental chaplain, who must have been his friend, had confided it to him for safe keeping. Finally, it was in these dark and never forgotten day soft trial that Louis was confirmed, probably by the advice of his brother. Even though Napoleon had collaborated with Fesch in the paper on the oath of priests to the constitution, though he himself had been mobbed in Corsica as the enemy of the church, it does not appear that had any other than decent and reverent feelings toward religion and its professors. Chapter 12. The Revolution in the Rhone Valley. A dark period, Bonaparte, first lieutenant, second sojourn in Valence, books and reading, the National Assembly of France, the King returns from Versailles, administrative reforms in France, passing of the old order, flight of the King, Bonaparte's oath to sustain the constitution, his view of the situation, his revolutionary zeal, insubordination, impatience with delay, a serious blunder avoided, return to Corsica. Side note, 1791. The tortuous course of Napoleon's life for the years from 1791 to 1795 has been neither described nor understood by those who have written in his interest. It was his own desire that his biographies, in spite of the fact that his public life began after Rivoli, should commence with recovery of Toulon for the convention. His detractors, on the other hand, have studied this prefatory period with such evident bias that dispassionate readers have been repelled from its consideration. And yet the sordid tale well repays perusal, for in this epoch of his life many of his characteristic qualities were tempered and ground to the keen edge they retained throughout. Swept onward toward that reckless ocean of political chaos, the youth seemed afloat with how to ours or compass, in reality, his craft was well under control and his could correct. Whether we attribute his conduct to accident or to design, from an adventurer's point of view the instinct which made him spread his sails to the breezes of Jacobin favor was quite as sound as hat which later, when Jacobinism came to be abhorred, made him anxious that the fact should be forgotten. In the early stages of army reorganization, changes were mad with how much regard to personal merit. The dearth of ancient officers being such that even the most indifferent had some value. About the 1st of June, 1791, Bonaparte was promoted to the rank of first lieutenant, with a salary of 1300 livres, and transferred to the 4th Regiment, which was in Valence. He heard the news with mingled feelings promotion was, of course, welcome, but he shrank from returning to his former station and from leaving the three or four warm friends he had among his comrades in the old regiment. On the ground that the arrangements he had made for educating Louis would be disturbed by the transfer, he besought the war office for permission to remain at Auxon with the regiment, now known as the first. Probably the real ground of his disinclination waste fear that a residence at Valence might revive the painful emotions which time had somewhat withered. He may also have felt how discord and radical opinions he was beginning to hold would be with those still cherished by his former friends. But the authorities were inexorable, and on June 14 the brothers departed, Napoleon for the first time leaving debts which he could not discharge, for the new uniform of a first lieutenant, a sword, and some wood, he owed about 115 livres. This sum he was careful to pay within a few years and as soon as his affairs permitted. Dot arrived at Valence, he found that the old society had vanished. Both the bishop and the abbe saint if were dead. M. Du Columbia had withdrawn with her daughter to her country seat. The brothers rebel, therefore, to take up their lives just where they had made their break at Auxon, Louis pursuing the studies necessary for entrance to the corps of officers. Napoleon teaching him, and frequenting the political club, both destitute and probably suffering, for the officer's pay was soon far in arrears. In such desperate straits it was a relief for the elder brother that the allurements of his former associations were dissipated, such companionship as he now had was among the middle and lower classes, whose estates were more proportionate to his own, 
and whose sentiments were virtually identical with those which he professed. The list of books which he read is significant Cox's Travels in Switzerland, Duke Close's Memoirs of the Reigns of Louis XIV and Louis XV, Machiavelli's History of Florence, Voltaire's Essay on Manners, Duvernet's History of the Sorbonne, Lenoble's Spirit of Gerson, and Delaure's History of the Nobility. There exist among us papers outlines more or less complete of all these books. They prove that he understood what he read, but unlike other similar jottings by him they give little evidence of critical power. Aside from such historical studies as would explain the events preliminary to that revolutionary age upon which he saw that France was entering, he was carefully examining the attitude of the Gallican Church toward claims of the papacy and considering the role of the aristocracy in society. It is clear that he had no intention of being merely a curious onlooker at the successive phases of the political and social transmutation already beginning, he was bent on examining causes, comprehending reasons, and sharing in the movement itself. By the summer of 1791 the first stage in the transformation of France had almost passed. The reign of moderation in reform was nearly over. The National Assembly had apprehended the magnitude but not the nature of its task, and was unable to grasp the consequences of the new constitution it had outlined. The nation was sufficiently familiar with the idea of the crown as an executive, but hitherto the executive had been at the same time legislator, neither king nor people quite knew how the king was to obey the nation when the former trained in school of the strictest absolutism, was deprived of all volition, and the latter gave its orders through a single chamber, responsive to the levity of the masses, and controlled neither by an absolute veto power, nor by any feeling of responsibility to a calm public opinion. This was the urgent problem which had to be solved under conditions the most unfavorable that could be conceived. During the autumn of 1789 famine was actually stalking abroad. The Parisian populace grew horned and dismal, but the king and aristocracy at Versailles had food in plenty, and the contrast was heightened by a lavish display in the palace. The royal family was betrayed by one of its own house, the despicable Philip Egalite, who sought to stir up the basest dregs of society, that in the ferment he might rise to thet up, hungry Paris, stung to action by rumors which he spread and by bribes which he lavished, put Lafayette at its head and on October 5th marched out to the gates of the royal residence in order to make conspicuous the contrast between its own sufferings and the wasteful comfort of its servants, as the king and his ministers were now considered to be. Louis and the National Assembly yielded to the menace, the court returned to Paris, politics grew hotter and more bitter, the fickleness of the mob became a stronger influence. Soon Jacobin Club began to wield the mightiest single influence, and as it did so it grew more and more radical. Throughout the long and trying winter the masses remained, nevertheless, quietly expectant. There was much tumultuous talk, but action was suspended while the assembly sat and struggled to solve its problem, elaborating a really fine paper constitution. Unfortunately, the provisions of the document had no relation to the political habits of the French nation or to the experience of England and the United States, the only free governments then in existence. Feudal privilege, feudal provinces, feudal names having been obliterated, the whole of France was rearranged into administrative departments, with geographical in place of historical boundaries. It was felt that the ecclesiastical domains, the holders of which were considered as meritrustees, should be adapted to the same plan, and this was done. Ecclesiastical as well as aristocratic control was thus removed by the stroke of a pen. In other words, by the destruction of the mechanism through which the temporal and spiritual authorities exerted remnants of their power, they were both completely paralyzed. The king was denied all initiative, being granted merely a suspensive veto, and in the reform of the judicial system the prestige of the lawyers was also destroyed. Royalty was turned into a function, and the courts were stripped of both the moral and physical force necessary to comply obedience to their decrees. Every form of the guardianship to which for centuries the people had been accustomed was thus removed royal, aristocratic, ecclesiastical, and judicial. Untrained to self-control, 
they were as ready for mad excesses as were the German Anabaptists after the Reformation or the English sectaries after the execution of Charles. Attention has been called to the disturbances which arose in Auxon and elsewhere, to the emigration of the nobles from that quarter, to the utter break between the parish priests and the higher church functionaries in Dauphine, this was but a sample of the whole. When, on July 14, 1790, the king accepted a constitution which decreed a secular reorganization of the ecclesiastical hierarchy according to the terms of which both bishops and priests were to be elected by the taxpayers, two-thirds of all the clergy in France refused to swear allegiance to it. All attempts to establish the new administrative and judicial systems were more or less futile, their eyes affection of officials and lawyers became more intense. In Paris alone the changes were introduced with some success, the municipality being rearranged into 48 sections, each with a primary assembly. These were the bodies which later gave Bonaparte the opening whereby he entered his real career. The influence of the Jacobin club increased, just in proportion as the majority of its members grew more radical. Necker trimmed to their demands, but lost popularity by his monotonous calls for money and fell in September, reaching his home on Lake Lehman only with the greatest difficulty. Meyerab succeeded him as the sole possible prop to the tottering throne. Under his leadership the moderate monarchists, or philants, as they were later called, from the convent of that order to which he withdrew, seceded from the Jacobins, and before the assembly had ceased its work the nation was cleft in two, divided into opponents and adherents of monarchy. As if to ensure disasters of such an antagonism, the assembly, which numbered among its members every main in France of ripe political experience, committed the incredible folly of self-effacement, voting that not one of its members should be eligible to the legislature about to be chosen. A new impulse to the revolutionary movement was given by the death of Mirab on April 2, 1791. His obsequies were celebrated in Manai places, and being a native of Provence, there were probably solemn ceremonies at Valence. There is a tradition that they occurred during Bonaparte's second residence in the city, and that it was he who superintended the draping of the choir in the principal church. It is said that the hangings were arranged to represent a funerary urn, and that beneath, in conspicuous letters, ran the legend, Behold what remains of the French Lycagus. Myrop had indeed displayed a genius for politics. His scheme for a strong ministry, chosen from the assembly, standing in bold relief against the feebleness of Necker in persuading Louis to accept the suspensive veto, and to choose his cabinet without relation to the party in power. When the mad dissipation of the statesman's youth demanded its penalty at the hour so critical for France, the king and the moderates alike lost courage. In June, the worried and worn out monarch determined that the game was not worth the playing and on the 21st he fled. Though he was captured, and brought back to act the impossible role of a democratic prince, the patriots who had wished to advance with experience and tradition as guides were utterly discredited. All the world could see how pusillanimous was the royalty they had wished to preserve, and Themaces made up their mind that, real or nominal, the institution was not only useless, but dangerous. This feeling was strong in the Renvli and the adjoining districts, which have ever been the home of extreme radicalism. Sympathy with Corsica and the Corsicans had long been active in southeastern France. Neither the island nor its people here felt to be strange. When a society for the defense of the constitution was formed in Valence, Bonaparte, though a Corsican, was at first secretary, then president, of the association. The friends of the constitution grew daily more numerous, more powerful, and more radical in that city, and when the great solemnity of swearing allegiance to the new order was to be celebrated, it was chosen as a convenient and suitable place for a convention of twenty two similar associations from the neighboring districts. The meeting took place on July 3, 1791. The official administration of those to the civil, military, judicial, and ecclesiastical authorities occurred on the 14th. Before a vast altar erected on the drill ground, in the presence of all the dignitaries, with cannon booming and the air resounding with shouts and patriotic songs, 
the officials in groups, the people in mass, swore with uplifted hands to sustain the constitution, to obey the National Assembly, and to die, if need be, in defending French territory against invasion. Scenes as impressive and dramatic as this occurred all over France. He appealed powerfully to the imagination of the nation. And profoundly influenced public opinion. Until then, said Bonaparte, referring to the solemnity, I doubt not that if I had received orders to turn my guns against the people, habit, prejudice, education, and the king's name would have induced me to obey. With the taking of the national oath it became otherwise, my instincts and my duty were thenceforth in harmony. But the position of liberal officers was still most trying. In their streets and among the people they were in a congenial atmosphere semicolon behind the closed doors of the drawing rooms, in the society of ladies, and among their fellows in the mess, there were constraint and suspicion. Out of doors all was exultation. In the houses of the hitherto privileged classes all was sadness and uncertainty. But everywhere, indoors or out, was spreading the fear of war, if not civil at least foreign war, with the French emigrants as the allies of the salients. On this point Bonaparte was mistaken. As late as July 27, 1791, he wrote to Nordin, an intimate friend how was chief of the military bureau at Auxon, will there be war? No semicolon Europe is divided between sovereigns who rule over men and those who rule over cattle and horses. The former understand the revolution, and are terrified, they would gladly make personal sacrifices to annihilate it, but they dare not lift the mask for fear the fires will break out in their own houses. See the history of England, Holland, etc. Those who bear the rule over horses misunderstand and cannot grasp the bearing of the constitution. They think this chaos of incoherent ideas means an end of French power. You would suppose, to listen to them, that our brave patriots were about to cut an Enoth's throats and with their blood purge the land of the crimes committed against kings. The news contained in this letter is most interesting. There are accounts of the zeal and spirit everywhere shown by the democratic patriots, of a petition for the trial of the king sent up from the recent meeting at Valence and an assurance by the writer that his regiment is sure, except as to half the officers. He adds in a postscript, the southern blood courses in my veins as swiftly as their own. Pardon me if you feel distressed in reading my scrawl. 25, footnote 25, Bonaparte to Nordin, 27th of July, 1791, in Butches et True, Histoire Parlementaire, 17, 56. Restlessness is the habit of the agitator, and Bonaparte's temperament was not exceptional. His movements and purposes during the months of July and August are very uncertain in the absence of documentary evidence sufficient to determine them. But his early East biographers, following what was in their time a comparatively short tradition, enable us to fix some things with a high degree of probability. The young radical had been but two months with his new command when he began to long for change, the fever of excitement and discomfort of his life, with probably some inkling that a Corsica National Guard would ere long be organized, awakened in him a purpose to be off once more, and accordingly he applied for leave of absence. His colonel, a very lukewarm constitutionalist, angry at the notoriety which his lieutenant was acquiring, had already sent in a complaint of Bonaparte's insubordinate spirit and of his inattention to duty. Standing on a formal right, he therefore refused the application. With quick resource of a schemer, Bonaparte turned to a higher authority, his friend Dutel, who was Inspector General of Artillery in the department and not unfavorable. Something, however, must have occurred to cause delay for weeks passed and the desired leave was not granted. While awaiting a decision the applicant was very uneasy. To friends he said that he would soon be in Paris, to his great uncle he wrote, send me three hundred livres, that some would take me to Paris. There, at least, a person can show himself, overcome obstacles. Everything tells me that I shall succeed there. Will you stop me for lack of hundred grounds? 
and again, I am waiting impatiently for the six crowns my mother owes me, I need them sadly. These demands for money meet with no response. The explanation of Bonaparte's impatience is simple enough. One by one the provincial societies which had been formed to support the constitution were affiliating themselves with influential Jacobins at Paris, who were now the strongest single political power in the country. He was the recognized leader of their sympathizers in the Rhone Valley. He evidently intended to go to headquarters and see for himself what the outlook was. With backers such as he thus hoped to find, some advantage, perhaps even the long desired command in Corsica, might be secured. It was rare good fortune that the young Hotspur was not yet to be cast into the seething cauldron of French politics. The time was not yet ripe for the exercise of his powers. The storming of the Bastille had symbolized the overthrow of privilege and absolute monarchy, the flight of the king presaged the overthrow of monarchy, absolute otherwise. The executive gone, the legislature popular and democratic but ignorant how to administer or conduct affairs, the judiciary disorganized, and the army transforming itself into a patriotic organization was the more to come? Yes. Thus far. In spite of well-meant attempts to substitute new constructions for the old, all had been disintegration. French society was to be reorganized only after further pulverizing, cohesion would begin only under pressure from without a pressure applied by the threats of erratic royalists that they would bring in the foreign powers to coerce and arbitrate, by the active demonstrations of the emigrants, by the outbreak of foreign wars. These were the events about to take place semicolon they would in the end evolve from the chaos of mob rule first the irregular and temporary dictatorship of the convention, then the tyranny of the directory, at the same time they would infuse a fervor of patriotism, into the whole mass of the French nation, stunned, helpless, and leaderless, but loyal, brave, and vigorous. In such a crisis the people would tolerate, if not demand a leader strong to exact respect for France and to enforce his commands, would prefer the vigorous mastery of one to the feeble misrule of the many or the few. Still further, the man was as unready as the time, for it was, in all probability, not as a Frenchman but as an ever-true Corsican patriot at Bonaparte wished to show himself, overcome obstacles at this conjuncture. On August 4, 1791, the National Assembly at last decided to form a paid volunteer National Guard of a hundred thousand men, and their decision became a law on August 12. The term of enlistment was a, four battalions were to be raised in Corsica. Bonaparte heard of the decision on August 10, and was convinced that the hour for realizing his long cherished aspirations had finally struck. He could certainly have done much in Paris to secure office in a French Corsican National Guard, and with this in mind he immediately wrote a memorandum on the armament of the new force, addressing it, with characteristic assurance, to the Minister of War. When, however, three weeks later, on August 30, 1791, a leave of absence arrived, to which he was entitled in the course of routine, and which was not granted by the favor of any one, he had abandoned all idea of service under France in the Corsican Guard. The disorder of the times was such that while retaining office in the French army he could test in an independent Corsican command the possibility of climbing to leadership the before abandoning his present subordinate place in France. In view, apparently, of this new venture, he had for some time been taking advances from the regimental paymaster until he had now in hand a considerable sum 290 livres. A formal announcement to the authorities might have elicited embarrassing questions from them, so he and Louis quietly departed without explanations, leaving for the second time debts of considerable amount. They reached Ajaxio on September 6, 1791. Napoleon was not actually a deserter, but he had in contemplation a step toward the defiance of French authority the acceptance of service in a Corsican military force. Chapter 13. Bonaparte the Corsican Jacobin. Bonaparte's Corsican patriotism, his position in his family, the situation of Joseph, Corsican politics, Napoleon's power in the Jacobin club of Ajaxio, 
his failure as a contestant for literary honors, appointed adjutant general, his attitude toward France, his new ambitions, use of violence, lieutenant colonel of volunteers, politics in Ajaxio, his first experience of street warfare, his manifesto, dismissed to Paris, his plans, the position of Louis XVI, Bonaparte's delinquencies, disorganization in the army, petition for reinstatement, the Marseillaise, Bonaparte a spectator, his estimate of France, his presence at the scenes of August 10, State of Paris, Flight of Lafayette. Side note, 1791-92. This was the third time in four years that Bonaparte had revisited his home. 26. On the plea of ill health he had been able the first time to remain a year and two months, giving full play to his Corsican patriotism and his own ambitions by attendance at Orestsa, and by political agitation among the people. The second time he had remained at a year and four months, retaining his hold on his commission by subterfuges and irregularities which, though condoned, had strained Edis relations with the Ministry of War in Paris. He had openly defied the royal authority, relying on the coming storm for the concealment of his conduct if it should prove reprehensible, or for preferment in his own country if Corsica should secure her liberties. There is no reason, therefore, to suppose that his intentions for the third visit were different from those displayed in the other two, although again solicitude for his family was doubtless one of many considerations. Footnote 26, It is not entirely clear whether he arrived late in September or early in October, 1791. He remained until May, 1792. During Napoleon's absence from Corsica the condition of his family had not materially changed. Soon after his arrival the old archdeacon did, and his little fortune fell to the Bonapartes. Joseph, failing shortly afterward in his plan of being elected deputy to the French legislature, was chosen a member of the Corsican directory. He was, therefore, forced to occupy himself entirely with his new duties and to live at Corti. Fesh, as the eldest male, the mother's brother, and a priest at that expected to assume the direction of the family affairs. But he was doomed to speedy disenchantment, thenceforward Napoleon was the family dictator. In conjunction with his uncle Hughes the whole or a considerable portion of the archdeacon's savings for the purchase of several estates from the national domain, as the sequestrated lands of the monasteries were called, rendered thus more self-important. He talked much in the home circle concerning the greatness of classical antiquity, and wondered who would not willingly have been stabbed, if only he could have been Caesar. An feeble ray of his glory would be an ample recompense for sudden death. Such chances for Caesarism as the island of Corsica afforded were very rapidly becoming better. The Bonapartes had no influence whatever in these elections. Joseph was not even nominated. The choice fell upon two men selected by Paoli, one of them, Peroldi, was already embittered against the family, the other, Postso di Borgo, though so far friendly enough, thereafter became a relentless foe. Rising to eminence as a diplomat, accepting service in one and another country of Europe, the latter thwarted Napoleon at several important conjunctures. Paoli is thought be some to have been wounded by the frank criticism of his strategy by Napoleon, more likely he distrusted youths educated in France, and ho, though noisy Corsicans, were, he shrewdly guessed, impregnated with French idealism. He himself cared for France only as by her help the largest possible autonomy for Corsica could be secured. In their directory of the department of Corsica, Joseph, and with him the Bonaparte influence, was reduced to impotence, while gratified with high position. The ignorance of the administrators was only paralleled by the difficulties of their work. During the last few months religious agitation had been steadily increasing. Pious Catholics were embittered by the virtual expulsion of the old clergy, and the induction to office of new priests who had sworn to uphold the constitution. Amid the disorders of administration the people in ever larger numbers had secured arms, as of yore, they appeared at their assemblies under the guidance of their chiefs, ready to fight at a moment's notice. It was but a step to violence, 
and without any other provocation than religious exasperation that Aunt's folk of Bastia had lately sought to kill their new bishop. Even Arena, who had so recently seized the place in Paoli's interest, was now regarded as a French radical, maltreated, and banished with his supporters to Italy. The new election was at hand, the contest between the Paolists and the extreme French party grew hotter and hotter. Not only deputies to the new assembly, but likewise the superior oasis of the new guard, were to be elected. Bonaparte, being only a lieutenant of the regulars, could according to the law aspire no higher than an appointment as adjutant major with the title and pay of captain. It was not worthwhile to lose his place in France for this, so he determined to stand for one of the higher elective offices, that of lieutenant colonel, a position which would give him more power, and, under the latest legislation, entitle him to retain his grade in the regular army. There were now two political clubs in Ajaxio, that of the Corsican Jacobins, country people for the most part, and that of the Corsican Philants, composed of the officials and townsfolk. Bonaparte became a moving spirit in the former, and determined at any cost to destroy the influence of the latter. The two previous attempts to secure Ajaxio for the radicals had failed, a third was already under consideration. The new leader began to garnish his language with thus fine and specious phrases which thenceforth were never wanting in his utterances at revolutionary crises. Law, he wrote about this time, is like those statues of some of the gods which are veiled under certain circumstances. For a few weeks there was little or nothing Todo in the way of election earring at home, he therefore obtained permission to travel with the famous Volney, who desired a philosopher's retreat from Paris storms and had been chosen director of commerce and manufactures in the island. This journey was for a candidate like Bonaparte invaluable as a means of observation and of winning friends for his cause. Before the close of this trip, his furlough had expired, his regiment had been put on a war footing and orders had been issued for the return of every officer to his post by Christmas Day. But in the execution of his fixed purpose the young Corsican patriot was heedless of military obligations to France, and willfully remained absent from duty. Once more the spell of a wild, free life was upon him, he was enlisted for the campaign, though without position or money to back him. The essay on happiness which he had presented to the Academy of Lyon had failed, as a matter of course, to win the prize, one of the judges pronouncing it too badly arranged, too uneven, too disconnected, and too badly written to deserve attention. This decision was a double blow, for it was announced about this time, at a moment when fame and money would both have been most welcome. Thescant income from the lands purchased with the legacy of the old Actaeon remained the only resource of the family for the lavish hospitality which, according to immemorial, semi-barbarous tradition, was required of a Corsican candidate. A peremptory order was now issued from Paris that those officers off the line who had been serving in the National Guard with a grade lower than that of Lieutenant Colonel should return to regular service before April 1, 1792. Here was an implication which might be turned to account. As a lieutenant on leave, Bonaparte should of course have returned on December 25th, if, however, he were an officer of volunteers he could plead the new order. Though as yet the recruits had not come in, and no companies had been formed, the mere idea was sufficient to suggest a means for saving appearances. An appointment as adjutant major was solicited from the major general in command of the department, and he, under authorization obtained in due time from Paris, granted it. Safe from the charge of desertion thus far, it was essential for his reputation and for his ambition that Bonaparte should be elected lieutenant colonel. Success would enable him to plead that his first lapse in discipline was due to irregular orders from his superior, that anyhow he had been an adjutant major, and that finally the position of lieutenant colonel gave him immunity from punishment and left him blameless. He nevertheless was uneasy, and wrote two letters of a curious character to his friend Sissi, the Commissioner-General at Valence. In the first, written five weeks after the expiration of his leave, he calmly reports himself, and gives an account of his occupations, mentioning incidentally that unforeseen circumstances, 
duties the Idris and most sacred, had prevented his return. His correspondent would be so kind as not to mention the letter to the gentleman of the regiment, but the writer would immediately return if his friend in his unassisted judgment thought best. In the second he plumply declares that in perilous times the post of a good Corsican is at home, that therefore he had thought of resigning, but his friends had arranged the middle course of appointing him adjutant major in the volunteers so that he could make his duty as a soldier conform to his study as a patriot. Asking for news of what is going on in France, he says, writing like an outsider, if underscore your underscore nation loses courage at this moment, it is done with forever. It was toward the end of March that the volunteers from the mountains began to appear in Ajaxio for the election of their officers. Napoleon had bitter and powerful rivals, but his recent trip had apparently enabled him to win many friends among the men. While, therefore, success was possible by that means, there was an author influence almost as powerful that of three commissioners appointed by the directory of the island to organize and equip the battalion. Thesir Morati, a friend of Peraldi, the Paolist deputy, Quenza, more or less neutral, and Grimaldi, a devoted partisan of the Bonapartes. With skillful diplomacy Napoleon agreed that he would not presume to be candidate for the office of first lieutenant colonel, which was desired by Peretti, a near friend of Paoli, for his brother-in-law, Quenza, but would seek the position of second lieutenant colonel. In this way he was assured of goodwill from two of the three commissioners. The other was of course hostile, being a partisan of Peraldi. The election, as usual in Corsica, seems to have passed in turbulency and noisy violence. His enemies attacked Bonaparte with every weapon their money, their influence, and in particular with ridicule. His stature, his poverty, and his absurd ambitions were held up to contempt and scorn. The young Hotspur was cut to the quick, and, forgetting Corsican ways, made the witless blunder of challenging Peraldi to a duel, an institution scorned by the Corsican devotees of Vendetta. The climax of contempt was Peraldi's failure even to notice the challenge. At the crisis, Solicetti, a warm friend of the Bonapartes and a high official of the department, appeared with a considerable armed force to maintain order. This cowed the conservatives. The third commissioner, living as a guest with Peraldi, was seized during the night preceding the election by a body of Bonaparte's friends, and put under lock and key in their candidate's house to make you entirely free, you were not free where you were, said the instigator of the stroke, when called to explain. To the UC of fine phrases was now added a facility in employing violence at a pinch which likewise remained characteristic of Bonaparte's career down to the end. Nazica, who alone records the tale, sees in Thysvent the precursor of the long series of state strokes which culminated on the 18th Brumaire. There is a story that in one of the scuffles incident to this brawl a member of Postsodi Borgis family was thrown down and trampled on. Be that as it may, Bonaparte was successful. This of course intensified the hatred already existing, and from that moment the families of Peraldi and of Postsodi Borgo were his deadly enemies. Quenza, who was chosen first lieutenant colonel, was a man of no character whatever, a nobody. He was moreover absorbed in the duties of a place in the departmental administration. Bonaparte, therefore, was in virtual command of a sturdy, well armed, legal force. Having been adjutant major, and being now a regularly elected lieutenant colonel according to statute, he applied, with a well calculated effrontery, to his regimental paymaster for the pay which had accrued during his absence. It was at first refused, for in the interval he had been cash eyed for remaining at home in disobedience to orders, but such were the irregularities of that revolutionary time that later, virtual deserter as he had been, it was actually paid and he was restored to his place. He sought and obtained from the military authorities of Thieland certificates of his regular standing and leave to present them in Paris if needed to maintain his rank as a French officer, but in the final event there was no necessity for their use. No one was more adroit than Bonaparte in taking advantage of possibilities. He was a pluralist without conscience. 
a French regular if the emergency should demand it, he was likewise a Corsican patriot and commander in the volunteer guard of the island, fully equipped for another move. Perhaps, at last, he could assume with success the liberator's role of Sampiero. But an opportunity must occur or be created. One was easily arranged. Ajaxio had gradually become a resort for many ardent Roman Catholics who had refused to accept the new order. The town authorities, although there were some extreme radicals among them, were, on the whole, in sympathy with these conservatives. Through the devices of his friends in the city government, Bonaparte's battalion, the second, was on one pretext or another assembled in and around the town. Thereupon, Following the most probable account, which, too, is supported by Bonaparte's own story, a demand was made that according to the recent ecclesiastical legislation of the National Assembly, the Capuchin monks, who had been so far undisturbed, should evacuate the air freery. Feeling ran so high that the other volunteer companies were summoned, they arrived on April 1st. At once the public order was jeopardized, on one extreme were the religious fanatics, on the other the political agitators, both of whom were loud with threats and ready for violence. In the middle, between two fires, was the mass of the people, who sympathized with the ecclesiastics, but wanted peace at any hazard. Quarreling began first between individuals of the various factions, but it soon resulted in conflicts between civilians and the volunteer guard. The first step taken by the military was to seize and occupy the cloister, which lay just below the citadel, the final goal of their leader, whoever he was, and the townsfolk believed it was Bonaparte. Once inside the citadel walls, the Corsicans and regular French service would, it was hoped, fraternize with their kin semicolon with such a beginning all the garrison might in time be won over. This further exasperated the ultramontanes and on Easter Day, April 8, they made demonstrations so serious that the scheming commander Bonaparte again, it was believed found the much desired pretext to interfere, there was a melee, and one of the militia officers was killed. Next morning the burghers found their town beset by the volunteers. Good citizens kept to their houses, while the acting mayor and the council were assembled to authorize an attack on the citadel. The authorities could not agree, and dispersed, the following forenoon it was discovered that the acting mayor and his sympathizers had taken refuge in the citadel. From the vantage of this stronghold they proposed to settle the difficulty by the arbitration of a board composed of two from each side, under the presidency of the commandant. There was again no agreement. Worn out at last by the haggling and delay, an officer of the garrison finally ordered the militia officers to withdraw their forces. By the advice of some determined radical Bonaparte again, in all probability the latter flatly refused, and the night was spent in preparation for a conflict which seemed inevitable. But early in the morning the commissioners of the department, who had been sent by Paoli to preserve the peace, arrived in a body. They were welcomed gladly by the majority of the people, and, after hearing the case, dismissed the battalion of volunteers to various posts in the surrounding country. Public opinion immediately turned against Bonaparte, convinced as the populace was that he was the author of the entire disturbance. The commander of the garrison was embittered, and sent a report to the war department displaying the young Weiss's behavior in the most unfavorable light. Bonaparte's defense was contained in a manifesto which made the citizens still more furious by its declaration that the whole civic structure of their town was worthless, and should have been overthrown. The aged Paoli found his situation more trying with every day. Under a constitutional monarchy, such as he had admired and studied in England, such as he even yet hoped for and expected in France, he had believed his own land might find a virtual autonomy. With riot and disorder in every town, it would not be long before the absolute disqualification of his countrymen for self-government would be proved and the French administration restored. For his present purpose, therefore, the peace must be kept, and Bonaparte, upon whom, whether justly or not, the blame for these recent broils rested, must be removed elsewhere, if possible. 
but as the troublesome youth was Thesson of an old friend and the head of a still influential family, it must be done without offence. The government at Paris might be pacified if the absentee officer were restored to his post, with Quenzu in command of the volunteers, there would be little danger of a second outbreak in Ajaxio. It was more than easy, therefore, for the discredited revolutionary, on the implied condition and understanding that he should leave Corsica, to secure from the authorities the papers necessary to puff himself and his actions in the most favourable light. Bonaparte armed himself accordingly with an authenticated certificate as to the post should held, and the period during which he had held them, and with an author as to his civis a phrase used at that time to designate the quality of friendliness to the revolution. The former seems to have been framed according to his own statements, and was speciously deceptive, yet inform the commander-in-chief, the municipality of Ajaxio, and the authorities of the department were united in certifying to his unblemished character and regular standing. This was something. Whither should the scapegoat betake himself? Valence, where a royalist colonel regarded him as a deserter, was of course closed, and in Paris alone could the necessary steps be taken to secure restoration to rank with back pay, or rather the reversal of the whole record as it then stood on the regimental books. For this reason he likewise secured letters of introduction to the leading Corsicans in French capital. His departure was so abrupt as to resemble flight. He hastened to Corti, and remained just long enough to understand the certainty of his overwhelming loss in public custom throughout Corsica. On the way he is said to have seen Paoli for a short time and to have received some encouragement in a plan to raise another battalion of volunteers. Joseph claimed to have advised his brother to have nothing to do with the plan, but to leave immediately for France. In any case Napoleon's mind was clear. A career in Corsica on the grand scale was impossible for him. Borrowing money for their journey, he hurried away and sailed from Bastia on May 2, 1792. The outlook might have disheartened a weaker man. Peroldi, the Corsican deputy, was a near relative of the defeated rival, Paoli's displeasure was only too manifest. The bitter hate of a large element in Ajaxio, including the royalist commander of the garrison, was unconcealed. Napoleon's energy, rashness, and ambition combined to make Postsudi Borgo detest him. He was accused of being a traitor, the source of all trouble, of plotting a new Saint Bartholomew, ready for any horror in order to secure power. Rejected by Corsica, would France receive him? Would not the few French friends he had be likewise alienated by these last escapades? Could the formal record of regimental offences be expunged? In any event, how slight the prospect of success in the great mad capital, amid the convulsive throes of a nation's disorders. But in the last consideration lay his only chance. The Nationstice order was to supply the remedy for Bonaparte's irregularities. The king had refused his sanction to the secularization of the estates which had once been held by the emigrants and recusant ecclesiastics. Semicolon the Jacobins retorted by open hostility to the monarchy. The plotting of noble and princely refugees with various royal and other schemers two years before had been a crime against the king and the constitutionalists for it jeopardized their last chance for existence, even their very lives. Within so short a time what had been criminal in the emigrants had seemingly become the only means of self-preservation for their intended victim. His constitutional supporters recognized that, in the adoption of this course by the king, the last hope of a peaceful solution to their awful problem had eyes appeared. It was now almost certain and generally believed that Louis himself was in negotiation with the foreign sovereigns, to thwart his plans and avert the consequences it was essential that open hostilities against his secret allies should be begun. Consequently, on April 20, 1792, by the influence of the king's friends war had been declared against Austria. The populace, awed by the armistice called out, were at first silently defiant, an attitude which changed to open fury when the defeat of the French troops in the Austrian Netherlands was announced. The moderate republicans, or Girondists, as they were called from their district where they were strongest, 
were now the mediating party semicolon their leader, Roland, was summoned to form a ministry and appease this popular rage. It was one of his colleagues who had examined the complaint against Bonaparte he received from the commander of the garrison at Ajaxio. According to a strict interpretation of the military code there was scarcely a crime which Bonaparte had not committed, desertion, disobedience, tampering, attack on constituted authority, and abuse of official power. The minister reported the conduct of both Quenzel and Bonaparte is most reprehensible, and declared that if their offence had been purely military he would have court-martialed them. Learning first at Marseille that war had broken out, and that the companies of his regiment were dispersed to various camps for active service, Bonaparte hastened northward. A new passion, which was indicative of the freshly awakened patriotism, had taken possession of the popular fancy. Where the year before the current and universal phrase had been federation, the talk was now all for the nation. It might well be so. Before the traveller arrived at his destination further disaster had overtaken the French army, one whole regiment had deserted under arms to the enemy, and individual soldiers were escaping by hundreds. The officers of the 4th Artillery were sinning and running away in about equal numbers. Consternation roulette supreme, treason and imbecility were everywhere charged against authorities. War within, war without, and the army in a state of collapse. The emigrant princes would return and France be sold to a bondage tenfold more galling than that from which she was struggling to free herself. When Bonaparte reached Paris on May 28, 1792, the outlook was poor for a suppliant, bankrupt in funds and nearly so in reputation, but he was undaunted, and his application for an statement in the artillery was made without the loss of a moment. A new minister of war had been appointed but a few days before, comma, the six changes in that office during as many months, comma, and the assistant now in charge of the artillery seemed favorable to the request. For a moment he thought of restoring the suppliant to his position, but events were marching too swiftly and demands more urgent jostled aside the claims of an obscure lieutenant with a shady character. Bonaparte at once grasped the fact that he could win his cause only by patience or by importunity, and began to consider how he should arrange for a prolonged stay in the capital. His scant resources were already exhausted, but he found Bourrienne, a former schoolfellow at Brienne, in equal straits, waiting like himself for something to turn up. Over their meals in a cheap restaurant on the Rue Street on or they discussed various means of gaining a livelihood, and seriously contemplated a partnership in subletting furnished heat rooms. But Bourrienne very quickly obtained the post of secretary in the embassy at Stuttgart, so that his comrade was left to make his struggle alone by pawning what few articles of value he possessed. The days and weeks were full of incidents terrible and suggestive in nature. The assembly dismissed the king's bodyguard on May 29. On June 13, the Girondists were removed from the ministry. Within a few days, it was known at court that Prussia had taken the field as an ally of Austria, and on the 17th, a conservative, Finland cabinet was formed. Three days later, the popular insurrection began. On the 26th, the news of the coalition was announced and on the 28th Lafayette endeavoured to stay the tide of furious discontent which was now rising in the assembly. But it was as ruthless as that of the ocean, and on July 11 the country was declared in danger. There was, however, a temporary check to the rush, a moment of repose in which the king, on the 14th, celebrated among his people the fall of the Bastille. But an address from the local assembly at Marseille had arrived demanding the dethronement of Louis and the abolition of the monarchy. Such was the impatience of the great southern city that, without waiting for the logical effect of their declaration, its inhabitants determined to make a demonstration in Paris. On the 30th a deputation 500 strong arrived before the capital. On August 3rd, they entered the city singing the immortal song which bears the name, but which was written at Strasbourg by an officer of engineers. Rugate de Lisle. The southern fire of the newcomers kindled Dagon the flame of Parisian sedition, and the radicals fanned it. At last, on August 10, 
the conflagration burst forth in an uprising such as had not yet been seen of all that was outcast and lawless and great town, with them consorted the discontented and the envious, the giddy and the frivolous, the curious and the fickle, all fun-stable elements of society. This time the king was unnerved, in despair he fled for asylum to the chamber of the assembly. That body, unsympathetic for him, but sensitive to the ragings of the mob without, found the fugitive unworthy of his office. Before night the kingship was abolished, and the royal family were imprisoned in the temple. There is no proof that the young Corsican was at this time other than an interested spectator. In a hurried letter written to Joseph on May 29th he notes the extreme confusion of affairs, remarks that Postso di Borgo is on good terms with the Minister of War, and recommends his brother to keep on good terms with Paoli. There is a characteristic little paragraph on the uniform of the National Guard. Though he makes no reference to the purpose of his journey, it is clear that he is calm, assured that in the wholesale flight of officers a man like himself is assured of restoration to rank and duty. Two others dated June 14th and 18th respectively are scarcely more valuable. He gives a crude and superficial account of French affairs internal and external, of no value as history. He had made unsuccessful efforts to revive the plea for their mother's mulberry subsidies, had dined with M. Perman, had visited their sister Mariana at Street Sir, where she had been called Elisa to distinguish her from another Mariana. He speculates on the chance of her marrying without a dot. In quiet times, the wards of Street Sir received, on leaving, a dowry of 3,000 livres, with 300 more for an outfit, but as matters then were, the establishment was breaking up and there were no funds for that purpose. Like the rest, the Corsican girl was soon to be stripped of her pretty uniform, the neat silk gown, the black gloves, and the dainty bronze slippers which M. de Maintenon had prescribed for the noble damsels at the royal school. In another letter written four days later there is a graphic account of the threatening demonstrations made by the rabble and a vivid description which indicates Napoleon's being present when the mob recoiled at the very door of the Tuileries before the calm and dignified courage of the king. There is even a story, told as of the time, by Bourrienne, a very doubtful authority, but probably invented later, of Bonaparte's openly expressing contempt for riots. How could the king let the rascals in? He should have shot down a few hundred, and the rest would have run. This statement, like others made by Bourrienne, is to be received with the utmost caution. Illustration, from the collection of W. C. Crane. Bonaparte, General in Chief of the Army of Italy. In a letter written about the beginning of July, probably to Lucien or possibly to Joseph, and evidently intended to be read in the Jacobin Club of Ajaxio, there are clear indications of its writer's temper. He speaks with judicious calmness of the project for education and reform, of Lafayette's appearance before the assembly, which had pronounced the country in danger and was now sitting in permanence, as perhaps necessary to prevent its taking an extreme and dangerous cowers, of the French as no longer deserving the pains men took for them, since they were a people old and without continuity or coherence. 27 of their leaders as poor creatures engaged on low plots, and of the damper which such a spectacle puts on ambition. Clearly the lesson of moderation which he inculcates is for the first time sincerely given. The preacher, according to his own judgment for the time being, is no Frenchman, no demagogue, nothing but a simple Corsican anxious to live far from the madness of mobs and the emptiness of so-called glory. Footnote 27 the rare and curious pamphlet entitled Manuscript de Lyle Delby, attributed to Munthalan and probably published by Edward O'Meara, contains headings for ten chapters which were dictated by Napoleon at Elba on February 22, 1815. The argument is, the Bourbons ascended the throne, in the person of Henry IV, by conquering the so-called Holy League against the Protestants, and by the consent of the people. A third dynasty thus followed the second, then came the Republic, and its succession was legitimated by victory, by the will of the people, and by the recognition of all the powers of Europe. The Republic made a new France by emancipating the Gauls from the rule of the Franks. 
the people had raised their leader to the imperial throne in order to consolidate their new interests, this was the fourth dynasty, etc., etc. The contemplated book was to work out in detail this very conception of a nation as passing through successive phases, at the close of each it is worn out, but a new ruler regenerates it, throwing off the incrustations and giving room to the life within. It is interesting to note the genesis of Napoleon's ideas and the pertinacity with which he held them. It has been asserted that on the dreadful day of August 10 Bonaparte's assumed philosophy was laid aside, and that he was a mob leader at the barricades. His own account of the matter as given at St. Helena does not bear this out. I felt, said he, as if I should have defended the king if called to do so. I was opposed to those who would found the republic by means of the populace. Besides, I saw civilians attacking men in uniforms, that gave me a shock. He said further in his reminiscences that he viewed the entire scene from the windows of a furniture shop kept by Forval at de Bourienne, brother of his old school friend. The impression left after reading his narrative of the frightful carnage before the Tuileries of thin decencies committed by frenzied women at the close of the fight, of the mad excitement in the neighboring cafes, and of his own calmness throughout, is that he was in no way connected either with the actors or their deeds, except to shout, hurrah for the nation. When summoned to do so by a gang of ruffians who were parading the streets under the banner of a gory head elevated on a pike. 28. The truth of his statements cannot be established by any collateral evidence. Footnote 28, Las Cases, Memorial de Saint Helene, v. 170. It is not likely that an ardent radical leader like Bonaparte, well known and influential in the Rhone Valley, had remained a stranger to the Marseille deputation. If the Duchess de Brunsby be worthy of any credence, he was very influential and displayed great activity with authorities during the 7th and 8th, running hither, thither, everywhere, to secure address for an illegal domiciliary visit which her mother, M. Perman, had received on the 7th. But the testimony is of very little value, such is her anxiety to establish an early intimacy with the great man of her time. Joseph, and his memoirs, 29 declares that his brother was present at the conflict of August 10, and that Napoleon wrote him at the time, if Louis XVI had appeared on horseback, he would have conquered. After the victory of the Marseillais, continues the passage quoted from the letter, I saw a man about to kill a soldier of the guard. I said to him, Southron, let us spare the unfortunate. Art thou from the south? Yes. Well, then, we will spare him. Moreover, it is a fact that Santer, the notorious leader of the mob on that day, way three years later, on the 13th of Vendemiaire, air, most useful to Bonaparte, that though degraded from the office of general to which was appointed in the revolutionary army, he was in 1800 restored to his rank by the first consul. All this is consistent with Napoleon's assertion, but it proves nothing conclusively and there is certainly ground for suspicion when we reflect that these events were ultimately decisive of Bonaparte's fortunes. Footnote 29, Memoirs du ROI Joseph, I, 47. The Phil and Ministry fell with the King, and an executive council composed of radicals took its place. For one single day Paris re-led like a drunkard, but on the next the shops were open again. On the following Sunday the opera was packed at a benefit performance for the widows and orphans of those who had fallen in victory. A few days later Lafayette, as commander of the armies in the north, issued a pronunciamento against the popular excesses. He even arrested the commissioners of the assembly who were sent to supplant him and take the ultimate direction of the campaign. But he quickly found that his old prestige was gone. He had not kept pace with the mad rush of popular opinion, neither in person nor as the sometime commander of the National Guard had he any longer the slightest influence. Impeached and declared an outlaw, he, like the king, lost his balance, and fled for refuge into the possessions of Liege. The Austrians violated the sanctuary of neutral territory, and captured him, exactly as Napoleon at a later day violated the neutrality of Baden in the case of the Duke d'Union. 
On August 23 the strong place of Longwy was delivered into the hands of the Prussians, the capitulation being due, as was claimed, to treachery among the French officers. Chapter 14. Bonaparte the French Jacobin. Reinstatement, further solicitation, promotion, Napoleon and Eliza, occupations in Paris, return to Ajaccio, disorders in Corsica, Bonaparte a French Jacobin, expedition against Sardinia, course of French affairs, Paoli's changed attitude, estrangement of Bonaparte and Paoli, mischances in the preparations against Sardinia, failure of the French detachment, Bonaparte and the fiasco of the Corsican detachment. His commission lapses, further developments in France, results of French victory, England's policy, Paoli in danger, denounced and summoned to Paris. Side note, 1792-93. The committee to which Bonaparte's request for reinstatement was referred made a report on June 21, 1792, exonerating him from blame. The reasons given were avidly based on the representations of the suppliant himself, first, that Dutel, th inspector, had given him permission to sail for Corsica in time to avoid the equinox, a distorted truth, and, second, that the Corsican authorities had certified to his civism, his good conduct, and his constant presence at home during his irregular absence from the army, a truthful statement, but incomplete since no mention was made of their eyes gracefully striates at Ajaxio and of Bonaparte's share in them. The attitude of the government is clearly expressed in a dispatch of July 8 from the Minister of War, Lajard, to Maillard, commander of the Ajaxio garrison. The misdeeds of Quenzo and Bonaparte were of far civil and not a military nature, cognizable therefore under the new legislation only by ordinary courts, not by military tribunals. Thu prizings, however, had been duly described to the commissioners by Peraldi, they state as their opinion that the deputy was ill-informed and that his judgment should not stand in the way of justice to M. de Bonaparte. On July 10 the Minister of War adopted the committee's report, and this fact was announced in a letter addressed by him to Captain Bonaparte. The situation is clearly depicted in a letter of August 7 from Napoleon to Joseph. Current events were so momentous as to overshadow personal considerations. Besides, there had been no military misdemeanor at Ajaxio and his reinstatement was sure. As things were, he would probably establish himself in France, Corsican as high inclinations were. Joseph must get himself made a deputy for Corsicato the assembly, otherwise his role would be unimportant. He had been studying astronomy, a superb science and with his knowledge of mathematics easy of acquisition. His book The History, no doubt was copied and ready, but this was no time for publication. Besides, he no longer had the petty ambition of an author. His family desired he shall go to his regiment, as likewise did the military authorities at Paris, and thither he would go. A formal report in his favor was drawn up on August 20. On the 30th he was completely reinstated or rather his record was entirely sponged out and consigned, as was hoped, to oblivion, for his captain's commission was dated back to February 6, 1792, the day in which his promotion would have occurred in due course if he had been present in full standing with his regiment. His arrears for that rank were to be paid in full. Such success was intoxicating. Monk, the great mathematician, had been his master at the military school in Paris, and was now minister of the navy. True to his nature, with the carelessness of an adventurer and the effrontery of a gambler, then the fledged captain promptly put in an application for a position as lieutenant colonel of artillery in the sea service. The authorities must have thought the petition a joke, for the paper was pigeonholed, and has been found marked S. Ah, that is, underscore sans bons underscore with how triply. Probably it was written in earnest, the motive being possibly an invincible distaste for the regiment in which he had bent eyes graced, which was still in command of a colonel who was not disposed to leniency. An easy excuse for shirking duty and returning to the old habits of a Corsican agitator was at hand. 
The events of August 10 settled the fate of all monarchical institutions, even those which were partly charitable. Among other royal foundations suppressed by the Assembly in August 18 was that of Street Sir, formally styled the establishment of St. Louis. The date fixed for closing was just subsequent to Bonaparte's promotion, and the pupils were then to be dismissed. Each beneficiary was to receive a mileage of one lever for every league she had to traverse. 352 was Thesm due to Eliza. Someone must escort an unprotected girl on the long journey, no one was so suitable as her elder brother and natural protector. Accordingly, on September 1st, the brother and sister appeared before the proper authorities to apply for the traveling allowance of the latter. Whatever other accomplishments Mul. De Bonaparte had learned at the school of St. Louis, she was still as deficient in writing and spelling as her brother. The formal requisitions written by both are still extant, they would infuriate any conscientious teacher in a primary school. Nor did they suffice the school authorities demanded an order from both the city and department officials. It was by the kind intervention of the mayor that the red tape was cut, the money was paid on the next day and that night the brother and the sister lodged in the Holland Patriots Hotel in Paris, where they appear to have remained for a week. This is the statement of an early biographer, and appears to be borne out by an autograph letter of Napoleon's, recently found, in which he says he left Paris on a date which, although the figure is blurred, seems to be the 9th. 30. Some days would be necessary for the new captain to procure a further leave of absence. Judging from subsequent events, it is possible that he was also seeking further acquaintance and favor with the influential Jacobins of Paris. During the days from the second to the seventh more than a thousand of the royalists confined in the prisons of Paris were massacred. It seems incredible if that a man of Napoleon's temperament should have seen and known nothing of the riotous events connected with such bloodshed. Yet no air does he hint that he had any personal knowledge. It is possible that he left earlier than is generally supposed, but it is not likely in view of the known dates of his journey. In any case he did not seriously compromise himself, doing at the most nothing further than to make plans for the future. It may have become clear to him, for it was true and he behaved accordingly, that France was not yet ready for him, nor he for France. Footnote 30 Napoleon in Coup, 2, 408. It is, moreover, a strong indication of Bonaparte's interest in the French Revolution being purely tentative that as soon as the desired leave was granted, probably in the second week of September, without waiting for the all important 1500 levers of arrears, now due him, but not paid until a month later, he and his sister set out for home. They travelled by diligence to Lyon and thence by the Rhone to Marseille. During the few hours halt of the boat at Valence, Napoleon's friends, among them some of his creditors, who apparently bore him no grudge, waited on him with kindly manifestations of interest. His former landlady, M. Boo, Aldorf her bill had been but insignificantly diminished by payment so on account, brought as her gift a basket of the fruit in which the neighborhood abounds at that season. The regiment was no longer there, the greater portion, with the colonel, being now on the northeastern frontier under Dumarias, facing the victorious legions of Prussia and Austria. On the 14th the travelers were at Marseille, in that friendly democratic city they were nearly mobbed as aristocrats because Elisa wore feathers in her hat. It is said that Napoleon flung the fending object into the crowd with a scornful no more re aristocrats than you and so turned their howls into laughing approval. It was about a month before the arrears of pay reached Marseille, 2,950 livres in all, and some sum of money and doubly welcome at such a crisis. It was probably October 10 when they sailed for Corsica, and on the 17th Bonaparte was once more in his home, no longer so confident, perhaps, of a career among his own people, but determined to make another effort. It was his fourth return. Lucien and Fesch were leaders in the radical club, Joseph was at his old post, his ambition to represent Ajaxio at Paris was again thwarted, the successful candidate having been Multido, a family friend, Louis, 
as usual, was disengaged and idle. Bonaparte and the younger children were well, he himself was of course triumphantly vindicated by his promotion. The ready money from the fortune of the old archdeacon was long since exhausted, to be sure, but the excellent vineyards, mulberry plantations, and gardens of the family properties were still productive, and Napoleon's private purse had been replenished by the quartermaster of his regiment. The course of affairs in France had materially changed the aspect of Corsican politics, the situation was, if anything, more favorable for a revolutionary venture than ever before. Solicetti had returned to Corsica after the adjournment of the Constituent Assembly with many new ideas which he had gathered from observing the conduct of the Paris Commune, and these he unstintingly disseminated among his sympathizers. They proved to be apt scholars, and quickly caught the tricks of demagogism, bribery, corruption, and malversation of the public funds. He had returned to France before Bonaparte arrived as a member of the newly elected legislature, but his evil influence survived his departure, and his lieutenants were ubiquitous and active. Paoli had been rendered helpless, and was sunk in despair. He was now commander-in-chief of the regular troops in garrison, but it was a position to which he had been appointed against his will, for it weakened his influence with his own party. Post Sodi Borgo, his staunch supporter and Bonaparte's enemy, was attorney general in Solicetti's stead. As Paoli was at the same time general of the volunteer guard, the entire power of the islands, military and civil, was in his hands but the responsibility for good order was likewise his, and the peoplier, if anything, more unruly than ever, for it was to their minds illogical that their idol should exercise such supreme power, not as a Corsican, but in the name of France. The composition of the two chief parties had therefore changed materially, and although their respective views were modified to a certain extent, they were more embittered than ever against each other. Bonaparte could not be neutral. His nature and his surroundings forbade it. His first step was to resume his command in their volunteers, and, under pretext of inspecting their posts, to make a journey through the island. His second was to go through the form of seeking a reconciliation with Paoli. Corsican historians, in their eagerness to appropriate the greatness of both Paoli and Napoleon, habitually misrepresent their relations. At this time each was playing for his own hand, the elder exclusively for Corsica's advantage as he saw it, the younger was more ambitious personally although he was beginning to see that in the course of the revolution Corsica would secure more complete autonomy as a French department than in any other way. It is not at all clear that as late as this time Paoli was eager for Napoleon's assistance nor the latter for Paoli's support. Their complete breach came soon and lasted until, when their views no longer clashed, they both spoke generously one of the other. In the clubs, among his friends and subordinates at the various military stations, Napoleon's talk was loud and imperious, his manner haughty and assuming. Our letter written by him at the time to Costa, then a lieutenant in the militia and a thorough Corsican, explains that the writer is detained from going to Bonifacio by an order from the General, Paoli, to come to Corti. He will, however, hasten to his post at the head of the volunteers on the very next day, and there will be an end to all disorder and irregularity. Greet our friends, and a shrim of my desire to further their interests. The epistle was written in Italian, but that fact signifies little in comparison with the new tone used in speaking about France. The enemy has abandoned Verdun and Longwy, and recrossed the river to return home, but our people are not asleep. Lucian added a postscript explaining that he had sent a pamphlet to his dear Costa, as to a friend, not as to a co worker for that he had been unwilling to be. Both the brothers seem already to have considered the possibility of abandoning Corsica. No sooner had war been declared against Austria in April, than it became evident that the powers whose territories bordered on those of France had previously reached an agreement, and were about to form a coalition in order to make the war general. The Austrian Netherlands, what we now know as Belgium, were already saturated with the evolutionary spirit. It was not probable that much annoyance would come from that quarter. Spain, Prussia, and Holland would, 
However, surely join the alliance, and if the Italian principalities, with the Kingdom of Sardinia, should take the same course, France would be in dire straits. It was therefore suggested in the assembly that a blouse would be struck at the House of Savoy, in order to awe both that and other courts of Italy into inactivity. The idea of an attack on Sardinia for this purpose originated in Corsica, but among the friends of Solicetti, and it was he who urged the scheme successfully. The sister island was represented as eager to free itself from the control of Savoy. In order to secure Paoli's influence not only in his own island, but in Sardinia, where he was likewise well known and admired, the ministers forced upon him the unwelcome appointment of a lieutenant general in the regular army, and his friend Peraldi was sent to prepare a fleet at Toulon. The events of August 10 put an end for the time being to constitutional government in France. The commissioners of the Paris sections supplanted the municipal council, and Danton, climbing to power as their representative plain man, became momentarily the presiding genius of the new Jacobin commune, which was soon able to usurp the supreme control of France. A call was issued for the election by manhood suffrage of a national convention, and a committee of surveillance was appointed with the bloodthirsty Marat as its motive power. At the instigation of this committee large numbers of royalists, constitutionalists, and others suspected of holding kindred doctrines, were thrown into prison. The assembly went through the form of confirming the new despotism, including both the commune of the sections and a Jacobin ministry in which Danton held the portfolio of justice. It then dispersed. On September 2 began that general clearance of the jails under mock forms of justice to which reference has been made. It was really a massacre, and lasted, as has been said, for five days. Versailles, Lyon, Mx, Reims, and Orleans were similarly purified. Amid these scenes the immaculate Robespierre, whose hands were not soiled with the blood spilled on August 10, appeared as the calm statesman controlling the wild vagaries of Thoreau and impulsive but unselfish and uncalculating Danton. These two, with Philippe Galite and Clotter Boys, were among those elected to represent Paris in the convention. That body met on September 21. As they sat in the amphitheatre of the assembly, the Girondists, or moderate Republicans, who were in a strong majority, were on the right of the president's chair. High up on the extreme left were the Jacobins, or mountain, between were placed those timid trimmers who were called the plain and the marsh according to the degree of their democratic sentiments. The members were, of course, without exception Republicans. The first act of the convention was to oblige the monarchy, and to declare France a republic. The next was to establish an executive council. It was decreed that September 22, 1792, was the first day of the year one of the Republic. Under the leadership of Brissot and Roland, the Girondists asserted their power as the majority, endeavouring to restore order in Paris, and to bridle the extreme Jacobins. But notwithstanding its right views and its numbers, the Girondist party displayed no sagacity, before the year one was three months old. The unscrupulous Jacobins with the aid of the Paris Commune, had reasserted their supremacy. The declaration of the Republic only hastened the execution of Silicetti's plan regarding Sardinia, and the convention was more energetic than the legislative had been. The fleet was made ready, troops from France were to be embarked at Villefranche, and a force composed in part of regulars, in part of militia was to be equipped in Corsica and to sail thence to join the main expedition. Bonaparte's old battalion was among those that were selected from the Corsican volunteers. From the outset Paoli had been unfriendly to Theshim, its supporters, whose zeal far outran their means, were not his friends. Nevertheless, he was in supreme command of both regulars and volunteers and the government having authorized the expedition, the necessary orders had to be issued through him as the only channel of authority. Bonaparte's reappearance among his men had been of course irregular. Being now a captain of artillery in the 4th Regiment, on active service and in the receipt of full pay, he could no longer legally be a lieutenant colonel of volunteers, 
a posish which had also been made one of emolument. But he was not a man to stand on slight formalities, and had evidently determined to seize both horns of the dilemma. Paoli, as a French official, of course could not listen for an instant to such a preposterous notion. But as a patriot anxious to keep all influence he could, and as a family friend of the Bonapartes, he was unwilling to order the young captain back to his post in France, as he might well have done. The interview between the two men at court was, therefore, indecisive. The older was benignant but firm in refusing his formal consent, the younger pretended to be indignant that he could not secure his rights, it is said that he even threatened to denounce in Paris the anti-nationalist attitude of his former hero. So it happened that Bonaparte returned to Ajaxio with a permissive authorization, and, welcomed by his men, assumed a command to which he could have no claim, while Paoli shut his eyes to an act of flagrant insubordination. Paoli saw that Bonaparte was irrevocably committed to revolutionary France, Bonaparte was convinced, or pretended to be, that Paoli was again leaning toward an English protectorate. French imperialist writers hint without the slightest basis of proof that both Paoli and Postsudi Borgo were in the pay of England. Many have believed, in the same gratuitous manner, that there was a plot among members of the French party to give Bonaparte the chance, by means of the Sardinian expedition, to seize the chief command at least of the Corsican troops, and thus eventually to supplant Paoli. If this conjecture be true, Paoli either knew nothing of the conspiracy, or behaved as he did because his own plans were not yet ripe. The drama of his own personal perplexities, cross purposes, and ever false positions, was rapidly moving to an end, the logic of Evans was too strong for the upright but perplexed old patriot, and a scene or two would soon complete the final act of his public career. The plan for invading Sardinia was over complex and too nicely adjusted. One portion of the fleet was to skirt the Italian shores, make demonstrations in the various harbours, and demand in one off that of Naples public reparation for an insult already afforded to the new French flag, which displayed the three colours of liberty. The other portion was first to embark the Corsican guards and French troops at Ajaccio, then to unite with the former in the Bay of Parma, whence both were to proceed against Cagliari. But the French soldiers to be taken from the army of the Vanda General Anselm were in fact non existent. The only military force to be found was a portion of the Marseille National Guard mere boys, unequipped, untrained, and inexperienced. Winds and waves, too, were adverse, two of the vessels were wrecked, and one was disabled. The rest were badly demoralized, and their crews became unruly. On the arrival of the ships at Ajaxio, a party of roistering sailors went ashore, affiliated immediately with the French soldiers of the garrison, and in the rough horseplay of such occasions picked a quarrel with Satane of the Corsican militia, killing two of their number. The character of the islanders showed itself at once in further violence and the fiercest threats. The tumult was finally allayed but it was perfectly clear that for Corsicans and Marseillais to be embarked on the same vessel was to invite mutiny, riot, and bloodshed. Bonaparte thought he saw his way to an independent command, and at once proposed what was manifestly the only alternative a separate Corsican expedition. The French fleet accordingly embarked the garrison troops, and proceeded on its way, the Corsicans remained ashore, and Bonaparte with them. Scenes like that at Ajaxio repeated in the harbour of Street Florent, and the attack on Cagliari by the French failed, partly, as might be supposed, from the portment of the fleet and the wretched quality of the men, partly because the two flotillas, or what was left of them, failed to effect a junction at the appointed place and time. When they did unite, it was February 14, 1793, the men were ill fed and mutinous. The troops that landed to storm the place fell into a panic, and would actually have surrendered if the officers had not quickly re embarked them. The costly enterprise met with but a single success Naples was cowed, and the court promised neutrality, with reparation for th insult to the trickler. The Corsican expedition was quite as ill starred as the French. Paoli accepted Bonaparte's plan, but appointed his nephew, Colonel Cesari 
to lead, with instructions to see that, if possible, this unfortunate expedition shall end in smoke. 31. The disappointed but stubborn young aspirant remained in his subordinate place as an officer of this second battalion of the Corsican National Guard. It was a month before the volunteers could be equipped and a French corvette with her attendant feelakers could be made ready to sail. On February 20, 1793, the vessels were finally armed, manned, and provisioned. The destination of the flotilla was the Magdalena Islands one of which is Carpura, since renowned as the home of Garibaldi. The troops embarked and put to sea. Almost at once the wind fell, there was a two-day scum, and the ships reached their destination with diminished supplies and dispirited crews. The first attack, made on St. Stephen, was successful. Bonaparte and his guns were then landed on that spot to bombard, across a narrow strait, Magdalena the chief town on the mainland. The enemy's fire was soon silenced, and nothing remained but for the corvette to work slowly round the intervening island of Carpura, and take possession. The vessel had suffered slightly from the enemy's fire, two of her crew having been killed. On the pretense that a mutiny was imminent, Colonel Cesare declared that cooperation between the sloop and the shore batteries was no longer possible. The artillery and their commander were re-embarked only with the utmost difficulty, the unlucky expedition returned on February 27 to Bonifacio. Footnote 31, reported by Rai and Rinasa and given in Napoleon in Coup, 2, 418. Both Bonaparte and Quenza were enraged with Paoli's nephew, declaring him to have acted traitorously. It is significant of the utter anarchith and prevailing that nobody was punished for the disgraceful fiasco. Bonaparte, on landing, at once bade farewell to his volunteers. He reported to the War Ministry in Paris and a copy of the memorial was sent to Paoli as responsible for his nephew that the Corsican volunteers had been destitute of food, clothing, and munitions, but that nevertheless their gallantry had overcome all difficulties and that in the hour of victory they were abased by the shameful conduct of their comrades. He must have expressed himself freely, for he was mobbed by the sailors in the square of Bonifacio. The men from Bocagnano, partly from the Bonaparte estates at that place, rescued them from serious danger. 32. When he entered Ajaxio, on March 3, he found that he was no longer, even by assumption, a lieutenant colonel semicolon for during his short absence the whole Corsican guard had been disbanded to make way for two battalions of light infantry whose officers were to be appointed by the directory of the island. Footnote 32, for the original of this protest see Napoleon in Coup, 2, 439. Strange news now greeted his ears. Much of what had occurred since his departure from Paris he already knew. France having destroyed root and branch the tyranny of feudal privileges, the whole social edifice was slack in every joint, and there was no strong hand to tighten their bolts, for the king, in dallying with foreign courts, had virtually deserted his people. The monarchy had therefore fallen, but not until its friends had resorted to the expedient of a foreign war as a prop to its fortunes. The early victories won by Austria and Prussia had stung the nation to madness. Robespierre and Danton having become a dictators, all moderate policy was eclipsed. The Executive Council of the Convention, determined to appease the nation, gathered their strength in one vigorous effort, and put three great armies in the field. On November 6, 1792, to the amazement of the world, Dumarias won the Battle of Gemapes, thus conquering the Austrian Netherlands as far north as Liege. The Celt, which had been closed since 1648 through the influence of England and Holland, was reopened, trade resumed its natural channel, and, in the exuberance of popular joy, measures were taken for the immediate establishment of a Belgian Republic. The other two armies, under Gustine and Kellerman, were less successful. The former, having occupied Frankfurt, was driven back to the Rhine, the latter defeated allies at Varmi but failed in the task of coming to cust in support at the proper moment for combined action. 
Meantime the agitation in Paris had taken the form of personal animosity to Louis Capet, as the leaders of the disordered populace called the king. In November he was summoned to the bar of the convention and questioned. When it came to the consideration of an actual trial, the Girondists, willing to save the prisoner's life, claimed that the convention had no jurisdiction, and must appeal to the sovereign people for authorization. The Jacobins insisted on the sovereign power of the convention, Robespierre protesting in the name of the people against an appeal to the people. Supported by the noisy outcries not only of the Parisian populace, but of their followers elsewhere, the radicals prevailed. By a vote of 366 to 355 the verdict of death was pronounced on January 17, 1793, and four days later the sentence was executed. Thy's act was a defiance to all monarchs, or, in other words, to all Europe. The younger Pitt was at this juncture Prime Minister of England. Like the majority of his countrymen, he had mildly approved the course of the French Revolution down to 1789, with them, in the same way, his opinions had since that time undergone a change. By the aid of Burke's beast but masterful eloquence the English people were gradually convinced that Jacobinism, violence, and crime were the essence of the movement, constitutional reform but a specious pretext. Between 1789 and 1792 there was a rising tide of adverse public sentiment so swift and strong that Pitt was unable to follow it. By the execution of Louis the English moderates were silenced. The news was received with a cry of horror, and the nation demanded war. Were king's heads to fall, and republican ideas, supported by republican armies, to spread like a conflagration? The still monarchical liberals of England could give no answer to the case of Louis or to the instance of Belgium, and were stunned. The English anti-Jacobins became as fanatical as the French Jacobins. Pitt could not resist the torrent. Yet in his extreme necessity he saw his chance for a double stroke, to throw the blame for the war on France, and to consolidate once more his near Ivanished power in Parliament. With masterly adroitness France was tempted into a declaration of war against England. Enthusiasm raged in Paris like fire among dry stubble. France, if so it must be, against the world. Liberty and equality her religion. The land a camp. The entire people an army. 300,000 men to be selected, equipped, and drilled at once. Nothing indicates that Bonaparte was in any way moved by the terrible massacres of September, or even by the news of the king's unmerited fate. But the declaration of war was a novelty which must have deeply interested him, for what was Paoli now to do? From gratitude to England he had repeatedly and earnestly declared that he could never take up arms against her. He was already a lieutenant general in the service of her enemy, his division was assigned to the feeble and disorganized army of Italy, which was nominally being equipped for active service, and the leadership, so ran the news received at Ajaccio, had been conferred on the Corsican director. The fact waste hat the radicals of the convention had long been aware of the old patriot's devotion to constitutional monarchy, and now saw their way to be rid of so dangerous a foe. Three successive commanders of Thatami had already found disgrace in their attempts with inadequate means to dislodge the Sardinian troops from the mountain passes of the Maritime Alps. Mindful, therefore, of their fate, and of his obligations to England, Paoli firmly refused the proffered honor. Suspicion as to the existence of an English party in the island had early been awakened among the members of the mountain, for half the Corsican delegation to the convention had opposed the sentence passed in the king, and Solicetti was the only member who voted in the affirmative. When the ill starred Sardinian expedition reached Toulon, the blame of failure was laid by the Jacobins on Paoli's shoulders. Solicetti, who was now a real power among the leaders at Paris, felt that he must hasten to his department in order to forestall events, if possible, and keep together the remnants of sympathy with France. Fuels appointed one of a commission to enforce in the island the decrees of the convention. The commission was well received and the feeling against France was being rapidly allayed when, most unexpectedly, 
Fatal news arrived from Paris. In the preceding November Lucien Bonaparte had made the acquaintance in Ajaccio of Huguet de Simonville, who was on his way to Constantinople as a special envoy of the Provisory Council then in charge of the Paris administration. In all probability he was sent to test Paoli's attitude. Versatile and insinuating, he displayed great activity among the islanders. On any occasion he addressed the radical club of Ajaccio but Thorfloquent. He was no linguist, and his French rhetoric would have fallen flat but for the fervid zeal of Lucian, who at the close stood in his place and rendered the ambassador's speech in Italian to an enthralled audience. This event among others showed the Yunja brothers' mettle, the intimacy thus inaugurated ripened quickly and endured for long. The ambassador was recalled to the mainland on February 2, 1793, and took his newfound friend with him a secretary or useful man. Both were firm Jacobins. And the master having failed in making any impression on Paoli during his Corsican sojourn, the man, as the facts stand, took a mean revenge by denouncing the lieutenant general as a traitor before a politica meeting in Toulon. Lucian's friends have thought the words unstudied and unpremeditated, uttered in the heat of unripe oratory. This may be, but he expressed no repentance and the responsibility rests upon his memory. As a result of the denunciation an address calumniating the Corsican leader in the most excited terms was sent by the Toulon Jacobins to the deputy of the department in Paris. Of all this Napoleon knew nothing, he and Lucien were slightly alienated because the latter thought his brother but a lukewarm revolutionary. The news of the defection of Dumouriez had just arrived at the capital, public opinion was inflamed, and on April 2 Paoli, who seemed likely to be a second Dumouriez, was summoned to appear before the convention. For a moment he became again the most popular man in Corsica. He had always retained many warm personal friends even among the radicals semicolon the royalists were now forever alienated from a government which had killed their king. The church could no longer expect protection when impious men were in power. These three elements united immediately with the Paolists to protest against the arbitrary act of the convention. Even in that land of confusion there was a degree of cash hitherto unequalled. Chapter 15. A Jacobin Higuera. The waning of Corsican patriotism, rise of French radicalism, alliance with Salicetti, another scheme for leadership, failure to seize the citadel of Ajaccio, second plan, Paoli's attitude toward the convention, Bonaparte finally discredited in Corsica, Paoli turns to England, plans of the Bonaparte family, their arrival in Toulon, Napoleon's character, his Corsican career, lessons of his failures, his ability, situation, and experience. Side note, 1793. Bonaparte was for an instant among the most zealous of Paoli's supporters, and, taking up his ever-ready pen, he wrote to impassioned papers whose respective tenors it is not easy to reconcile, one an appeal to the convention in Paoli's behalf, the author demand addressed to the municipality of Ajaccio that the people should renew their oath of allegiance to France. The explanation is somewhat recondite, perhaps, but not discreditable. Solicetti, as chairman of a committee of the Convention on Corsican Affairs, had conferred with Paoli on April 13. The result was so satisfactory that on the 16th the latter was urged to attend a second meeting at Bastia in the interest of Corsican reconciliation and internal peace. Meantime Lucian's performance at Marseille had fired the train which led to the convention's action against Paoli, and on the 17th the order for his arrest reached Solicetti, how was of course charged with its execution. For this he was not prepared, nor was Bonaparte. The essential of Corsican annexation to France was order. The Corsican folk flocked to protect Paoli and Corti, and the local government declared for him. There was in Chota rebellion and within a few days the districts of Calvi and Bastia were squarely arrayed with Solicetti against Bonifacio and Ajaccio, which supported Paoli and Postso di Borgo. The Bonapartes were convinced that the decree of the convention was precipitate, and pleaded for its recall. At the same time they saw no hope for peace in Corsica, 
except through incorporation with France. But compromise proved impossible. There was a truce when Paoli on April 26 wrote to the convention regretting that he could not obey their summons on account of infirmities, and declaring his loyalty to France. In consequence, said convention withdrew its decree and sent a new commission of which Solicetti was not a member. This was in May, on the eve of the Girondin overthrow. The measures of reconciliation proved unavailing, because the Jacobins of Marseille, learning that Paoli was Girondist in sentiment, stopped the commission, and forbade their proceeding to Corsica. Meantime, Captain Bonaparte's French regiment had already been some five months in active service. If his passion had been only for military glory, that was to be found nowhere so certainly as in its ranks, where he should have been. But his passion for political renown was clearly far stronger. Where could it be so easily gratified as in Corsica under the present conditions? The personality of the young adventurer had for a long time been curiously double, but while he had successfully retained the position of a French officer in France, his identity as a Corsican patriot had been nearly obliterated in Corsica by his constant quarrels and repeated failures. Having become a friend radical, he had been forced into a certain antagonism to Paoli and had thereby jeopardized both his fortunes and his career as far as they were dependent on Corsican support. But with Paoli under the ban of the convention, and suspected of connivance with English schemes, there might be a revulsion of feeling and a chance to make French influence paramount once more in the island under the leadership of the Bonapartes and their friends. For the moment Napoleon preserved the outward semblance of the Corsican patriot, but he seems to have been weary at heart of the thankless role and entirely ready to exchange it for another. Whatever may have been his plan or the principles of his conduct, it appears as if the decisive step now to be taken had no relation to either plan or principles, but that it was forced upon him by a chance development of events which he could not have foreseen and which he was utterly unable to control. It is unknown whether Solicetti or he made the first advances in coming to an understanding for mutual support, or when that understanding was reached, but it existed as early as January, 1793, a fact conclusively shown by a letter of the former dated early in that month. It was April 5th when Solicetti reached Corsica, the news of Paoli's denunciation by the convention arrived, as has been said, on the 17th. Seeing how nicely adjusted the scales of local politics were, the deputy was eager to secure favor from Paris, and wrote on the 16th an account of how warmly his commission had been received. Next day the blow of Paoli's condemnation fell, and it became plain that compromise was no longer possible. When even the Bonapartes were supporting Paoli, the reconciliation of the island with France was clearly impracticable. Solicetti did not hesitate, butters between Paoli and Corsica with no career on the one side, and their possibilities of a great career under France on the other, quickly chose the latter. The same considerations weighed with Bonaparte, he followed his patron, and as a reward was appointed by the French Commission Inspector General of Artillery for Corsica. Solicetti had granted what Paoli would not, Bonaparte was free to strike his blow for Corsican leadership. With swift and decisive measures the last scene in his Corsican adventures was arranged. Several great guns which had been saved from a warship wrecked in the harbour were lying on the shore amounted. The inspector general hypocritically declared that they were a temptation to insurgents and a menace to the public peace, they should be stored in the citadel. His plan was to seize the moment when the heavy pieces were passing the drawbridge, and at the head of his followers to take possession of the stronghold he had so long coveted, and so often failed to capture. If he could hold it for the convention, a career in Corsica would beat last assured. But again he was doomed to disappointment. The former garrison had been composed of French soldiers. On the failure of the Sardinian expedition most of these had been landed at Toulon, where they still were. The men in the citadel of Ajaxio were therefore in the main islanders, although some French infantry and the French gunners were still the, the new commander was a paolist who refused to be hoodwinked, and would not act without an authorization from his general-in-chief. The value of the seizure depended on its promptness. In order to secure a sufficient number of faithful followers, 
Bonaparte started on foot for Bastia to consult the commission. Learning that he was already a suspect at court and in danger of arrest, he turned on his steps only to be confronted at Bocognano by a band of Proldi's followers. Two shepherds from his own estate found a place of concealment for him in a house belonging to their friends, and he passed a day in hiding, escaping after nightfall to Usani, whence he returned to Ajaxio in safety. 33. Thwarted in one notion, Bonaparte then proposed to the followers he already had to alternatives, to erect a barricade behind which the guns could be mounted and strained on the citadel, or, easier still, to carry one off the pieces to some spot before the main entrance and then batter in the gate. Neither scheme was considered feasible, and it was determined to secure by bribes, if possible, the cooperation of a portion of the garrison. The attempt failed through the integrity of a single man, and is interesting only as having been Napoleon's first lesson in an art which was thenceforward an unfailing resource. Rumors of these proceedings soon reached the friends of Paoli, and Bonaparte was summoned to report immediately at Corti. Such was the intensity of popular bitterness against him in Ajaxio for his desertion of Paoli that after a series of narrow escapes from arrest he was compelled to flee in disguise and by water to Bastia, which he reached on May 10, 1793. Thwarted in their efforts to seize Napoleon, the hostile party vented its rage on the rest of the family, hunting the mother and children from their town house, which was pillaged and burned, first to Malai, then through jungle and over hilltops to the lonely tower of Capitello near the sea. Footnote 33, both these men were generously remembered in the secret codicils of Napoleon's will. A desire for revenge on his Corsican persecutors would now give an additional stimulus to Bonaparte, and still another device to secure a passionately desired citadel of Ajaxio was proposed by him to the commissioners of the convention, and adopted by them. The remnant so far Swiss regiment stationed nearby were to be marched into the city, as if for embarkment, several French war vessels from the harbour of St. Florent, including one frigate, with troops, munitions, and artillery on board, were to appear unexpectedly before the city, land through men and guns, and then, with the help of the Switzers and suck off the citizens as espoused the French cause, were to overawe the tone and seize the citadel. Corsican affairs had now reached a crisis, for this was a virtual declaration of war. Paoli so understood it, and measures of mutual defiance were at once taken by both sides. The French commissioners formally deposed the officials who sympathized with Paoli, they, in turn, took steps to increase the garrison of Ajaxio, and to strengthen the popular sentiment in their favor. On receipt of the news that he had been summoned to Paris and that hostile commissioners had been sent to take his place, Paoli had immediately forwarded, by the hands of two friendly representatives, the temperate letter in which he had declared his loyalty to France. In it, he had offered to resign and leave Corsica. His messengers rested and temporarily detained, but in the end they reached Paris, and were kindly received. On May 29th they appeared on the floor of the convention, and won their cause. On June 5th the former decree was revoked, and two days later a new and friendly commission of two members started for Corsica. But at Marseille they fell into the hands of the Jacobin mob, and were arrested. Ignorant of these favorable events, and the untoward circumstances by which their effect was thwarted, the disheartened statesman had written and forwarded on May 14 a second letter, of the same tenor as the first. This measure likewise had failed of effect, for the messenger had been stopped at Bastia, now the focus of Solicity's influence, and the letter had never reached its destination. It was probably in this interval that Paoli finally adopted, as a last spread resort, the hitherto hazy idea of putting the island under English protection, in order to maintain himself in the mission to which he felt that Providence had called him. The actual departure of Napoleon's expedition from Street Florent gave the final impulse. Fate haven't so inflamed the passions of the Conservative Party in Ajaxia that the Bonaparte family could no longer think of returning within a reasonable time to their home. Some desperate resolution must be taken, 
though it should involve leaving their small estates to be ravaged, their slender resources to be destroyed, and abandoning their partisans to prescription and imprisonment. They finally found a temporary asylum with a relative in Calvi. The attacking flotilla had been detained nearly a week by a storm, and reached Ajaxio on May 29, in the very height of these turmoils. It was too late for any possibility of success. The few French troops on shore were recowed, and dared not show themselves when a party landed from the ships. On the contrary, Napoleon and his volunteers were received with a fire of musketry, and, after spending two anxious days in an outlying tower which they had seized and held, were glad to re-embark and sail away. Their leader, after still another narrow escape from Sussur, rejoined his family at Calvi. The Jacobin Commission held a meeting, and determined to send Solicetti to justify their course at Paris. He carried with him a wordy paper written by Bonaparte in his swarst style and spelling, setting forth the military and political situation in Corsica, and containing a bitter tirade against Paoli, which remains to lend some color to the charge that the writer had been, since his leader's return from exile, a spy and an informer, influenced by no high principle of patriotism, but only by a base ambition to supplant the aged president, and then to adopt whichever plan would best further his own interest, ready either to establish a virtual autonomy in his fatherland, or to deliver it entirely into the hands of France. 34, footnote 34, for this paper, see Napoleon in Coup, 2, 462. Jung, Bonaparte son temps, 2. 266 and 498. There appear to have been an official portion intended to be filed, and a free, carelessly written running commentary on men and things. The passage quoted is taken from the latter. In this painful document Bonaparte sets forth in fiery phrase the early enthusiasm of Republicans for the return of Paoli, and their disillusionment when he surrounded himself with venal men like Post Sodi Borgo with relatives like his nephew Leonetti, with his vile creatures in general. The misfortunes of the Sardinian expedition, their dies graceful disorders of the island, the failure of the commissioners to secure Ajaxio, are all alike attributed to Paoli. Can perfidy like this invade the human heart? Dot. What fatal ambition of masters a grey beard of sixty-eight? Dot. On his face are goodness and it gentleness, in his heart hate and vengeance, he has an oily sensibility in high size, and gall in his soul, but neither character nor strength. These are the sentiments proper to a radical of the times, and they found acceptance among the leaders of that class in Paris. More moderate men did what they could to avert the impending breach. But in vain. Corsica was far, communication slow, and the misunderstanding which occurred was consequently unavoidable. It was not until July 1st that Paoli received news of the pacificatory decrees passed by the convention more than a month before, and then it was too late, groping in the dark, and unable to get news, he had formed his judgment from what was going on in Corsica, and had therefore committed himself to a change of policy. To him, as to most thinking men, the entire structure of France, social, financial, and political, seemed rotten. Civil war had broken out in Vendée, in Brittany the wildest excess passed unpunished. The great cities of Marseille, Toulon, and Lyons were in a state of anarchy, the revolutionary tribunal had been established in Paris, the Committee of Public Safety had usurped the supreme power, the France to which he had entrusted the fortunes of Corsica was no more. Already an agent was in communication with the English diplomats in Italy, on July 10 Solicetti arrived in Paris semicolon on the 17th Paoli was declared a traitor and an outlaw, and his friends were indicted for trial. But the English fleet was already in the Mediterranean, and although the British protectorate over Corsica was not established until the following year, in the interval the French and their few remaining sympathizers on the island were able at best to hold only the three towns of Bastia, Street Florent and Galvi. After the last fiasco before the citadel of Ajaxio, the situation of Bonaparte was momentarily desperate. 
Lucian says in his memoir Stat. Shortly before his brother had spoken longingly of India, of the English Empire as destined to spread with every year, and of the area which its expansion opened to good officers of artillery, how scarce among the British scarce enough everywhere, he thought. If I ever choose that career, said he, I hope you will hear of me. In a few years I shall return then Sir Rich Nabob, and bring fine ores for our three sisters. But the scheme was deferred and then abandoned. Sir Lissetti had arranged for his own return to Paris, where he would be safe. Napoleon felt that flight was the only resort for him and his. Accordingly, on June 11, three days earlier than his patron, he and Joseph, accompanied by Fesch, embarked with their mother and the rest of the family to join Lucien, who had remained at Toulon, where they arrived on the 13th. The Jacobins of that city had received Lucien, as a sympathetic Corsican, with honor. Doubtless his family, homeless and destitute for their devotion to the Republic, would find encouragement and help until some favorable turn in affairs should restore their country to France, and reinstate them not only in their old possessions, but in such new dignities as would fitly reward their long and painful devotion. Such, at least, appears to have been Napoleon's general idea. He was provided with a legal certificate that his family was one of importance and the richest in the department. The convention had promised compensation to those who had suffered losses. As had been hoped, on their arrival, the Bonapartes were treated with every mark of distinction, and ample provision was made for their comfort. By act of the convention, women and old men in such circumstances received 75 livres a month, infants 45 livres. Lads received simply a present of 25 livres. With their preliminary payment of 150 livres, which they promptly received, the Bonapartes were better off than they had been at home. Lucien had appropriated Napoleon's certificate of birth in order to appear older than he was, and, having now developed into a fluent demagogue, was soon earning a small salary in the commissary department of the army. Fesch also found a comfortable berth in the Sum department. Joseph calmly displayed Napoleon's commission in the National Guard as his own, and received a higher place with a better salary. The sovereignty of the convention was everywhere acknowledged, their revolutionary courts were established far and wide, and their allegations, clothed with dictatorial power, were acknowledged in every camp of the land as supreme superior even to the commanders in chief. It was not exactly a time for further military irregularities, and Napoleon, armed with a certificate from Solicetti that his presence in Corsica for the past six months had been necessary, betook himself to the army headquarters at Nice, where a detachment of his regiment was now stationed. When he arrived, no awkward questions were asked by authorities. The town had but recently been captured, men were needed to hold it and the Corsican refugee was promptly appointed captain off the shore battery. To casual observers he appeared perfectly content in this subordinate position. He still cherished the hope, it seems, that he might find some opportunity to lead a successful expedition against the little citadel of Ajaxio. Such a scheme, at all events, occupied him intermittently for nearly two years or until it was punished forever by visions of a European control far transcending the limits of his island home. Not that the outcast Bonaparte was any longer exclusively a Corsican. It is impossible to conceive of a lot more pitiful or a fate more obdurate than his so far had been. There was little hereditary morality in his nature, and none had been inculcated by training, he had nothing of what is called vital piety, nor even sincere superstition. A butt and an outcast at a French school under the old regime, he had imbibed a bitter hatred for the land indelibly associated with such haughty privileges for the rich and such contemptuous disdain for the poor. He had not even the consolation of having received an education. His nature revolted at the religious formalism of priestcraft, his mind turned in disgust from the scholastic husks of its superficial knowledge. What he had learned had came from inborn capacity from desultory reading, and from thunshattered imaginings of his garden at Brienne, his cave at Ajaxio, or his barrack chambers. What more plausible than that he should first turn to the land of his birth with some hope of happiness, usefulness, 
or even glory. What more mortifying than the revelation that in manhood he was too French for Corsica, as in boyhood he had been too Corsican for France. The story of his sojourns and adventures in Corsica has no fascination, it is neither heroic nor satanic, but belongs to the dull and mediocre realism which makes up so much of commonplace life. It is difficult to find even a thread of continuity in it, there may be any as to purpose, there is none as to either conduct or theory. There is the passionate admiration of a southern nature for a hero ace represented by the ideal Paoli. There is the equally southern quality of quick but transient hatred. The love of dramatic effect is shown at every turn, in the puff of its style of his writings, in the mock dignity of an edict issued from the grotto at Malai, in the empty honours of a lieutenant colonel without a real command, in the paltry style of an artillery inspector with no artillery but a few dismantled guns. But the most prominent characteristic of the young man was his shiftiness in both the good and bad senses of the word. He would perish with mortification rather than fail in devising some expedient to meet every emergency, he felt no hesitation in changing his point of view as experience destroyed an ideal or an unforeseen chance ways to be seized and improved. Moreover, repeated failure did not dishearten him. Detesting garrison life, he neglected its duties, and endured punishment but he secured regular promotion, defeated again and again before the citadel of Ajaxio, each time he returned and is made to make a fresh trial under new auspices or in a new way. He was no spendthrift, but he had no scruples about money. He was proud in the headship of his family, and reckless as to how he should support them, or should secure a promotion. Solitary in his boyhood, he had become in his youth a companion and leader, but his true friendships were not with his social equals, whom he despised, but with the lowly, whom he understood. Finally, here was a citizen of the world, a man without a country, his birthright was gone, for Corsica repelled him, France he hated, for she had never adopted him. He was almost without a profession, for he had neglected that of a soldier, and had failed both as an author and as a politician. He was apparently, too, Without a single guiding principle, the world had been a harsh stepmother, at whose knee he had neither learnt the truth nor experienced kindness. He appears consistent in nothing but in making the best of events as they occurred. So far he was a man either much better nor much worse than the world into which he was born. He was quite as unscrupulous as those about him, but he was far greater than they in perspicacity, adroitness, adaptability and persistence. During the period before his expulsion from Corsica these qualities of leadership were scarcely recognizable, but they existed. As yet, to all outward appearance, the little captain of artillery was the same slim, ill-proportioned, and rather insignificant youth, but at twenty-three he had had the experience of a much greater age. Conscious of his powers, he had dreamed many daydreams and had acquired a habit of boastful conversation in the family circle, but, fully cognizant of the dangers incident to his place, and unsettled conditions about him, he was cautious and reserved in the outside world. Chapter 16. The Supper of Care. Revolutionary Madness, Uprising of the Girondists, Convention Forces Before Avignon, Bonaparte's First Success in Arms, Its Effect Upon His Career his political pamphlet, The Genius It Displays, accepted and published by authority, Seizure of Toulon by the Allies. Side note, 1793. It was a tempestuous time in Provence when on June 13 the Bonapartes arrived at Toulon. Their movements during the first few months cannot be determined, we only know that, after a very short residence there, the family fled to Marseille. 35 much, too, ice obscure in regard even to Napoleon. Soldier as he was. It seems as if this period of their history had been willfully confused to conceal how intimate were the connections of the entire family with the Jacobins. But the obscurity may also be due to the character of the times. Fleeing before the storms of Corsican revolution, they were caught in the whirlwind of French anarchy. The Girondists, 
after involving their country in a desperate foreign warfare, had shown Themselves incompetent to carry it on. In Paris, therefore, they had to give way for the Jacobins, who, by the exercise of a reckless despotism, were able to display an unparalleled energy in its prosecution. Against their tyranny, the moderate Republicans and the Royalists outside of Paris now made common cause, and civil war broke out in many places, including Vendée, the Rhone Valley, and the southeast of France. Montesquieu declares that honor is the distinguishing characteristic of aristocracy. The emigrant aristocrats had been thefted in France to throw honor and patriotism to the winds. Many of the class who remained went further, displaying in Vendée and elsewhere a satanic vindictiveness. This shameful policy colored the entire civil war, and the bitterness in attack and retaliation that was shown in Marseille, Lyon, Toulon, and elsewhere would have advised graced savages in a prehistoric age. Footnote 35 The Memoirs of Joseph and Lucian, supported by Kirsten and the anonymous local historian of Marseille, all unite in declaring that the Bonaparte family landed there. On the other hand, Louis, in the documents historiques sur la Holland, I, 34, asserts categorically in detail that they took up their abode in La Valette, a suburb of Toulon, where they had landed. The westward slopes of the Alps were occupied by a French army under the command of Kellerman, designated by the name of its situation semicolon. Farther south and east lay the army of Italy under Brunet. Both Thesmes were expected to draw their supplies from the fertile cow country behind them, and to cooperate against the troops of Savoy and Austria, which had occupied the passes of Lower Piedmont, and blocked the way into Lombardy. By this time the law for compulsory enlistment had been enacted, but the general excitement and topsy-turvy management incident to such rapid changes in government and society having caused the failure of the Sardinian expedition, had also prevented recruiting or equipment in either of these two divisions of the army. The outbreak of open hostilities in all the lands immediately to Thustwood momentarily paralyzed their operations, and when, shortly afterward, the Girondists overpowered the Jacobins in Marseille, the defection of that city made it difficult for the so-called regulars, the soldiers of the convention, even to obtain subsistence and hold territory they already occupied. The next move of the insurgent Girondists of Marseille was in their direction of Paris, and by the first week of July they had reached Avignon on their way to join forces with their equally successful friends at Lyon. With characteristic zeal, the convention had created an army to meet them. The new force was put under the command of Cartex, a civilian, but a man of energy. According to directions received from Paris, he quickly advanced to cut the enemy and to be occupying the strategic point of valence. This move was successful I made, Leon was left to fight its own battle, and by the middle of July the general of the convention was encamped before the walls of Avignon. Napoleon Bonaparte had hastened to Nice, where five companies of his regiment were stationed, and rejoining the French army never faltered Agan in his allegiance to the trickler. Jean Dutel, brother of the young man's former patron, was in the Savoy capital, high in command. He promptly set the young artillerist at the work of completing Thes or batteries. On July 3 and 8, respectively, the new captain made written reports to the Secretary for War at Paris, and to the Director of Artillery in the Arsenal of Toulon. Both these papers are succinct and well written. Almost immediately Bonaparte was entrusted with a mission, probably confidential, since its exact nature is unknown, and set out for Avignon. He reached his destination almost in the moment when Cartex began the investment of the city. It was about July 16 when he entered the Republican camp, having arrived by devious ways, and after narrow escapes from the enemy's hands. This time he was absent from his post on duty. Few works and guns at Nice being inadequate and almost worthless, he was probably sent to secure supplies from the stores of Avignon when it shall be conquered. Such were the straits of the needy Republican general that he immediately appointed his visitor to the command of a strong body of flying artillery. In the first attack on the town Cartex received a check. 
but the insurgents were raw volunteers and seem to have felt more and more dismayed by the menacing attitude of the surrounding population, on the 25th, in the very hour of victory, they began their retreat. 36. The road to Marseille was thus clearer, and the commander unwisely opened his lines to occupy the evacuated towns on his front. Cartx entered Avignon on the 26th, on the 27th he collected his force and departed, reaching Tarascon on the 28th, and on the 29th care. Bonaparte, whose battery had done excellent service, advanced for some distance with the main army, but was ordered back to protect the rear by reorganizing and reconstructing the artillery park which had been dismantled in the assault on Avignon. Footnote 36 these are the most probable reasons for the retreat. Several local chroniclers, Solia, Audrey, and Jaudu, writing all three about 1844, declare each and all that Bonaparte with his battery followed the right bank of the Rhone as far as the Rocha de Justice where he mounted his guns and opened fire on the walls of the city. His fire was so accurate that he destroyed one cannon and killed several gunners. The besieged garrison of Federalists were thrown into panic and decamped. Neither the contemporary authorities nor Napoleon himself ever mentioned any such remarkable circumstances. In fact, a passage of the Superdubcare attributes the retreat to the inability of any except veteran troops to withstand a siege. Finally, Bonaparte would surely have been promoted for such an exploit. Dom Martin, a comrade, was thus rewarded for a much smaller service. This first successful feat of arms made a profound impression on Bonaparte's mind, and led to the decision which settled his career. His spirits were still low, for he was suffering from a return of his old malarial trouble. Moreover, his family seems already to have been driven from Toulon by the uprising of the hostile party, in any case, they were now dependent on charity. The Corsican revolt against the convention was virtually successful, and it was said that in Thieland the name of Bonaparte was considered as little less execrable a than that of but a few ago. What must he do to get a decisive share and surging, rolling tumult about him? The visionary boy was transformed into the practical man. Frenchmen were fighting and winning glory everywhere, and among the men who were reaping laurels were some whom had known and even despised at Brian Sergeant Beechrew, for instance. Ideas which he had momentarily entertained comma enlistment in the Russian army, 37, service with England, a career in the Indies, the return of the nabob comma all such visions were set aside forever, and an application was sent for a transfer from the army of Italy to that of the Rhine. The suppression of the southern revolt would soon be accomplished, and inactivity ensue, but on the frontier of the north there was a warfare worthy of his powers, in which, if he could only attract the attention of the authorities, long service, rapid advancement, and lasting glory might all be secured. Footnote 37 the Archive Russ for 1866 states that in 1788 Napoleon Bonaparte applied for an engagement to Zaborowski. Potemkin's lieutenant, who was then with the Russian fleet in the Mediterranean. The statement may be true, and probably is, but there is no corroborative evidence to sustain it. But what must be the first step to secure notoriety here and now? How could that end be gained? The old instinct of authorship returned irresistibly, and in the long intervals of easy duty at Avignon, where, as is most probable, he remained to complete the task assigned to him, Bonaparte wrote The Supper of Care, his first literary work of real ability. As if by magic his style is utterly changed, being now concise, correct, and lucid. The reader would be tempted to think it had enjoyed a thorough revision from some capable hand. But this is improbable when we note that it is the permanent style of Thefutcher. Moreover, the opinions expressed are quite as thoroughly transformed, and display not only a clear political judgment, but an almost startling military insight. The setting of this notable repast is possibly, though by no means certainly, based on an actual experience, and is as follows, five wayfarers a native of Nîmes, a manufacturer from Montpellier, two merchants of Marseille, 
and a soldier from Avignon find themselves accidentally thrown together as stable companions at an inn of care, a little city round about which the civil war is raging. The conversation at supper turns on the events occurring in the neighborhood. The soldier explains the circumstances connected with the recent capture of Avignon, attributing the flight of the insurgents to the inability of an except veteran troops to endure the uncertainties of a siege. One of the travelers from Marseille thinks the success but temporary, and recapitulates the resources of the moderates. The soldier retorts in a long refutation of that opinion. As a politician he shows how the insurgents have placed themselves in a false position by adopting extreme measures and alienating republican sympathy, being cautious and diplomatic in not censuring their persons nor their principles, on the other side there is a marked effort to emphasize the professional attitude, as a military man he explains the strategic weakness of the position, and the futility of their operations, uttering many sententious phrases, self-conceit is the worst adviser. Good for an eight pound cannon are as effective for field work as pieces of larger caliber, and are in many respects preferable to them. It is an axiom of military science that the army which remains behind its entrenchments is beaten, experience and theory agree on this point. The conclusion of the conversation is a triumphant demonstration that the cause of the insurgents is already lost, an argument convicting them of really desiring not moderation but a counter-revolution and throne interest, and of displaying a willingness to imitate the Vendians, and call in foreign aid if necessary. In one remarkable passage the soldier grants that the Girondists may have been outlawed, imprisoned, and calumniated by the mountain in its own selfish interest, but adds that the former were lost without a civil war by means of which they could lay down the law to their enemies. It was for them your war was really useful. Had they merited their early reputation, they would have thrown down their arms before their constitution and sacrificed their own interests to the public welfare. It is easier to cite Decius than to imitate him. Today they have shown themselves guilty of the worst possible crimes, have, by their behavior, justified their prescription. The blood they have caused to flow has effaced the true services they had rendered. The Montpellier manufacturer is of opinion that, whether this be true or no, the convention now represents the nation, and to refuse obedience to it is rebellion and counter-revolution. History knows no plainer statement than this of the de facto, de jure principle, the conviction that might makes right. At last, then, the leader had shown himself in seizing the salient elements of a complicated situation, and the man of affairs had found a style in which to express his clear-cut ideas. When the tide turns it rises without interruption. Bonaparte's pamphlet was scarcely written before its value was discerned, for at that moment arrived one of those legations now representing the sovereignty of the convention in every field of operations. This one was a most influential committee of three Escudia, Record, and the younger brother of Robespierre. Accompanying them was a commission charged to renew the commissary stores in Corsica for the few troops still holding out in that island. Solicetti was at its head, the other member was Gasparin. Bonaparte, we may infer, found easy access to the favor of his compatriot Solicetti, and the supper of care was heard by the plenipotentiaries with attention. Its merit was immediately recognized, as is said, both by Gasparin and by Theonge Robespierre. In a few days the pamphlet was published at the expense of the state. 38, of Bonaparte's life between July 29 and September 12, 1793, there are the most conflicting accounts. Some say he was at Marseille, others deny it. His brother Joseph thought he was occupied in collecting munitions and supplies for the army of Italy. His earliest biographer declares that travelled by way of Lyon and Aux on to Paris, returning by the some route to Avignon, and thence journeying to Olioules near Toulon. From the army headquarters before that city Solicetti wrote on September 26 that while Bonaparte was passing on his way to join the army of Italy, the authorities in charge of the siege changed his destination and put him in command of the heavy artillery to replace Don Martin, incapacitated for service by a wound. 
it has been hinted by both the suspicious and the credulous writers on the period that the young man was employed on some secret mission. This might be expected from those who attribute demonic qualities to the child of destiny from earliest infancy, but there is no slightest evidence to sustain the claim. Quite possibly the lad relapsed into the queer restless ways of earlier life. It is evident he was thwarted in his hope of transfer to the army of the Rhine. Unwilling as he waste to serve in Italy, he finally turned his lagging footsteps thither. Perhaps, as high authorities declare, it was at Marseille that his compatriot Servoni persuaded him to go as far at least as Toulon, though Solicetti and Bonaparte himself declared later that they met and arranged the matter at Nice. Footnote 38 The very first impression appears to have been a reprint from the Courier d'Avignon. It was a cheap pamphlet of 16 pages in the same type and on the paper as that used by the journal. The second impression was in 20 pages, printed by the public printer as a tract for the times, to be distributed throughout the near and remote neighborhood. In this interval, while Bonaparte remained, according to the best authority, within reach of Avignon, securing artillery supplies and writing a political pamphlet in support of the Jacobins, Cutx had, on August 25, 1793, taken Marseille. The capture was celebrated by one of the bloodiest orgies of that horrible year. The Girondists of Toulon saw in the fate of those at Marseille the lotter portion to themselves. If the high contracting powers now banded against France had shown a sincere desire to quell Jacobin bestiality, they could on the first formation of the coalition easily have seized Paris. Instead, Austria and Prussia had shown the most selfish apathy in that respect, bargaining with each other and with Russia for their respective shares of Poland, the booty they were about to seize. The intensity of the Jacobin movement did not rouse them until the majority of the French people, vaguely grasping the elements of permanent value in the revolution, and stung by foreign interference rallied around the only standard which was firmly upheld, comma, that of the convention, comma, and enabled that body within an incredibly short space of time to put forth tremendous energy. Then England, terrified into panic, drove Pitt to take effective measures, and displayed her resources in raising subsidies for her continental allies, in goading German powers to activity in scouring every sea with her fleets. One of these was cruising off the French coast in the Mediterranean, and it was easy for the Girondists of Toulon to induce its commander to seize not only their splendid arsenals, but the fleet in their harbour as well the only effective one, in fact, which at that time the French possessed. Without delay or hesitation, Hood, the English admiral, grasped the easy prize, and before long warships of the Spaniards, Neapolitans, and Sardinians were gathered to share in the defense of the town against the convention forces. Soon the Girondist fugitives from Marseille arrived, and were received with kindness. The place was provisioned. The gates were shut, and every preparation for desperate resistance was completed. The fate of the Republic was at stake. The crisis was acute. No wonder that, in view of his wonderful career, Napoleon long after, and his friends in accord, declared that in the hour appeared the man. There, said the inspired memorialist of St. Helena, history found him, never to leave him semicolon the began his immortality. Though this language is truer ideal than in sober reality, yet the emperor had a certain justification for his claim. Chapter 17. Toulon. The Jacobin power threatened, Bonaparte's fate, his appointment at Toulon, his ability as an artist, his name mentioned with distinction, his plan of operations, the fall of Toulon, Bonaparte a general of brigade, behavior of the Jacobin victors, a Corsican plot, horrors of the French Revolution, influence of Toulon on Bonaparte's career. 39, footnote 39, the authorities for this important epoch are, primarily, Jung, Bonaparte et son temps, Masson, Napoleon in coup, but above all, Duke La Junus de Napoleon, Volume 3, Toulon. The memoirs of Barras are utterly worthless, the references in last cases, Marmont, and elsewhere have value, but must be controlled. 
the archives of the War Department have been thoroughly examined by several investigators, the author among the number. The results have been printed in many volumes to which the above-mentioned authors refer, and many of the original papers are printed in whole or in part by them. Side note, 1793. Coupled as it was with other discouraging circumstances, the treason of Toulon struck a staggering blow at the convention. The siege of Lyon was still in progress, the Piedmontes were entering Savoy, or the department of Montana Blanc, as it had been designated after its recent capture by France. The great city of Bordeaux was ominously silent and inactive, the royalists of Vendée were temporarily victorious, there was unrest in Normandy, and further violence in Brittany, the towns of Mainz, Valenciennes, and Kund had been evacuated, and Dunkirk was besieged by the Duke of York. The loss of Toulon would put a climax to such disasters, destroy the credit of the Republic abroad and at home, perhaps bring back the Bourbons. Carnath had in the meantime come to the assistance of the Committee of Safety. Great as a military organizer and influential as a politician, he had already awakened the whole land to a still higher fervor, and had consolidated public sentiment in favor of his plans. In Dubois de Crans he had an able lieutenant. Fourteen armies were soon to move and fight, directed by a single mind. Discipline was about to be effectively strengthened because it was to be the discipline of the people by itself, the envoys of the convention were to go to and fro, successfully laboring for common action and common enthusiasm in the executive, in both the fighting services, and in the nation. But a sit none of these miracles had been wrought, and, with Toulon lost, they might be forever impossible. Such was the setting of the stage in the great National Theatre of France when Napoleon Bonaparte entered on the scene. The records of his boyhood and youth by his own hand afford the proof of what he was at twenty-four. It has required no searching analysis to discern Themen, nor trace the influences of his education. Except for short and unimportant periods, the story is complete and accurate. It is, moreover, absolutely unsophisticated. What does it show? A well-born Corsican child, of a family with some fortune, glad to use every resource of a disordered time for securing education and money, patriotic at heart but willing to profit from France, or indeed from Russia, England, the Orient, wherever material advantage was to be found. This boy was both idealist and realist each in the high degree corresponding to his great abilities. He shone neither as a scholar nor as an officer, being obdurate to all training comma but by independent exertions and desultory reading of a high class he formed an ideal of society in which the prevailed equality of station and purse, purity of life and manners, religion without clericalism, free speech and honorable administration of just laws. His native land untrammeled by French control would realize this ideal, he had fondly hoped, but the revolution emancipated it completely, entirely, and what occurred? A reversion to every vicious practice of medievalism, he himself being sucked into the vortex and degraded into a common adventurer. Disenchanted and bitter, he then turned to France. Abandoning his stubble role, his interest in Corsica was thenceforth sentimental his fine faculties when focused on the realities of a great world suddenly exhibits themselves in keen observation, fair conclusions, a more than academic interest, and a skill in the conduct of life hitherto obscured by unfavorable conditions. Already he had found play for Alice Powers both with gun and pen. He was not only eager but ready to deploy them in a higher service. The city of Toulon was now formally and nominally invested that is, according to the then accepted general rules for such operations, but with no regard to those peculiarities of its site which only masterminds could mark and use to the best advantage. The large double bays protected from the southwest by a broad peninsula joined to the mainland by a very narrow isthmus, and thus opens southeastward to the Mediterranean. The great fortified city then regarded as one of the strongest places in the world, lies far within on the eastern shore off the inner harbor. Excellent authorities considered it impregnable. It is protected on the landward side by an amphitheater of high hills, 
which leave to the right and left a narrow strip of rolling cow country between their lower slopes and the sea. On the east La Poipe commanded left wing of the besieging revolutionary force. The westward pass is commanded by Oliuls, which Kutx had selected for his headquarters. On August 29 his vanguard seized the place, but they were almost immediately attacked and driven out by the Illid armies, chiefly English troops brought in from Gibraltar. On September 7 the place was retaken. The two wings were in touch and to landward the communications of the town were completely cut off. In the salt only a single French officer fell seriously wounded, but that one was a captain of artillery. Salicetti and his colleagues had received from the Minister of War a charge to look out for the citizen Bonaparte who wanted service on the Rhine. This and their own attachment determined them in the pregnant step they now took. Thess till unattached captain of artillery, Napoleon Bonaparte, was appointed to the vacant place. As far as history is concerned, this is a very important fact. It is really a matter of slight import whether Servoni or Salicetti gave the impulse. At the same time his mother received a grant of money, and while favours were going, there were enough needy Bonapartes to receive them. Salicetti and Gasparin, being the legates of the convention, were all powerful. The latter took a great fancy to Salicetti's friend and there was no opposition when the former exercised his power. Fesh and Lucian were both provided with places being made storekeepers in the commissary department. Barras, who was the recruiting officer of the convention at Toulon, claims to have been the first to recognize Bonaparte ability. He declares that the young Corsican was daily at his table, and that it was he himself who irregularly but efficiently secured the appointment of his new friend to active duty. But he also asserts what no to be untrue, that Bonaparte was still lieutenant when they first met and that he created him captain. It is likely, in view of the subsequent intimacy at Paris, that they were also intimate at Toulon, the rest of Barras's story is a fabrication. But although the investment of Toulon was complete, it was weak. On September 18 the total force of the assailants was 10,000 men. From time to time reinforcements came in and the very Ushis and battalions exhibited on occasion great gallantry and courage. But the munitions and arms were never sufficient, and under civilian officers both regulars and recruits were impatient of severed discipline. The artillery in particular was scarcely more than nominal. There were a few field pieces, two large and efficient guns, and two mortars. By a mistake of the War Department the General Officer detailed to organize the artillery did not receive his orders in time and remained on his station in the Eastern Pyrenees until after the place fell.